You did? My hairdresser didn't get over to England. She travels with me everywhere. Now she's pregnant, and she went down with complications. So he's found me this great hairdresser. Actually, she's the police officer's wife. She is? Who? Tracy Curry. Chief Inspector Steve Curry's wife? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. I didn't realize his wife was a hairdresser. Oh, she's a genius. I'm, I'm glad to hear Sussex Police are turning out to be a, a full-service agency, he said. Just keep me alive and look after my kid. That's all the service I need. She indicated an armchair opposite the sofa, and he sat down. Well, we have some good news on that front, Grace said. I imagine you've heard. The voice of James Cagney said, We sure did. Her security chief, Andrew Gully, strode into the room, dressed as before in a dapper suit. Detective Superintendent Grace, it's so good to see you again. He sat in the chair next to him. Another young female assistant materialized out of the ether and asked Grace how he took his coffee. Gully raised both his hands in the air, as if holding up an imaginary football, then lowered them still with the ball to his lap. The thing is, Detective Superintendent, they may have caught this guy, but I don't want us relaxing our guard on Guy and Rowan. You have a lot of crazy people in your city, right? We have our fair share, Grace admitted, but no more than anywhere else in this country. Brighton's a, a pretty safe place. I read you normally have around fifteen to twenty homicides a year, but you've already had sixteen, and we're only halfway through this year, so your homicide race doubled. Gaia, who sat herself down attentively on the edge of the sofa, was staring at Grace. He could see beneath her beauty the crease lines of fear. Oh, it's a statistical blip he replied cheerfully, and instantly knew he'd said the wrong thing. "'Yeah, right,' Gully said, his Cagney accent even more pronounced now. "'So tell me, how did those people lying in body bags in your mortuary feel about being a, a statistical blip, Detective Superintendent Grace?' Grace was momentarily distracted by the arrival of his coffee, and waving away the offer of sugar, said, well, "'If it's any comfort, most of the murders were low-life criminals, on criminals or domestics.' Gully scratched behind his left ear. "'I've been reading a lot of history in your city. "'In the 1930s, Brighton was known as the crime capital of the UK "'and a murder capital of Europe. "'You know, it doesn't seem like much has changed.' "'Grace was starting to feel annoyed with the man, but he kept his patience. "'I'll talk to the chief constable and pass on your concerns.' Yeah, "'I'll be grateful,' Gully said. "'In the meantime,' I'd appreciate it if you maintained the current level of officers. I can't make promises, but I'll do all I can. Thank you, Gaia said. She was smiling at him sweetly, and with an almost mesmerizing concentration, staring into his eyes. Was he imagining it, he wondered, or was he getting the come on from her? Mom, I'm like so bored. Rowan walked across the room barefoot in baggy jeans and an orange T-shirt, a Nintendo console hanging from his fingertips. She patted the side of the sofa, and he sat down grumpily beside her. He's not too impressed with the weather, are you, sweetie? He peered at his Nintendo screen. Was that the new one? Roy Grace asked. The 3DS? The boy studied the screen and gave him a reluctant nod. He wants to go on the beach, but nothing doing with this weather. She pointed to the window at the pelting rain. There was a sudden change in her expression. Do you have kids, Detective Superintendent? No, I don't. I, uh, just a goldfish. She laughed. I figured it would be nice for Ron to meet some kids his age. Do you know anyone who has some who, who might be willing to play with him, hang out with him a little? His eyes widened. Actually, I do, yes. Oh, I would so appreciate that. She kissed her son's cheek, but he barely noticed he was so focused on his console. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Han? Someone to play with? He shrugged. Whatever. I could make a quick call. Uh, Rowan's six, right? Just had his sixth birthday party three weeks ago. Well, this person's got two kids. I think they're about six and nine. Perfect. He dialed Glenn Branson's number. Yo, old-timer, what's up? I have someone who wants to speak to you. Who's that? I'll put her on. He handed Guy the phone and said, His name's Glenn. 
Hi, Glenn, she said in her huskiest voice. Grace smiled. He was trying to imagine his mate's face at the other end of the line. Chapter 66 What do you mean you don't have any? The man hunched over the counter in a white coat was a kind of miserable jerk who should not have been there at all. He should have quit or retired long before he'd decided he hated doing this job so much he wasn't ever going to be pleasant or helpful to anyone who came in here. With his frayed grey hair and his thick, round, bottle-lens glasses, he looked like a Nazi geneticist who'd had a career change. He spoke like one, too. We don't have any. You're a fucking pharmacist. All pharmacists sell thermometers. The man shrugged and said nothing. Drayton Wheeler glared at him. You know where there's another pharmacist? He nodded. I do. Where? Why should I tell you? I don't like you. I don't like your attitude. Fuck you. Fuck you too. For an instant, Wheeler was tempted to punch his smug, evil face. But there were all kinds of potential repercussions from that. Not smart. He mustn't get sidetracked. Had to keep focus. 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 He walked out of the shop in a rage and collided with a woman pushing a shopping trolley. Stupid old woman! He shouted at her. Watch where you're going! Then he stormed off up the street, everything a blur, his rage playing havoc with his eyes. He was tired. He was grungy. He was hungry. He needed food. He needed a bath. But most of all, he needed a thermometer. Chapter 67 As he walked through the Grand Hotel shortly before midday, threading his way along the corridors towards the car park, Roy Grace's phone rang. It was Glenn Branson for the second time. The first had been to thank him for putting him on the line to Gaia. He had seemed totally blown away. Darren Spicer, right? the detective sergeant said. Glenn was a movie buff, and half his references in life involved movie titles. In his current star-struck mood, Grace's first reaction was to wonder what film he was referring to. Darren Spicer? Then he realised. Remember him, chief? Oh, he's about the most forgettable person I've ever remembered. Yes, I do. He refrained from adding he'd seen him arriving at Tommy Finch's wake a couple of days ago. Well, what about him? Then he had to wait for a moment as an ambulance screamed past before he could hear Glenn's voice. He just bailed me. He wants to speak to you. Darren Spicer was one of the local villains who was also an occasional informer for Sussex Police. A career burglar with form that stretched back to his early teens, he was a true recidivist, or what they colloquially called a revolving door prisoner. He was a man who'd spent more of his working life behind bars than free. Earlier in the year, in a stroke of luck, in Grace's view totally undeserved, Spicer collected a £50,000 reward put up by local millionaire philanthropist Rudy Birchmore for information leading to the arrest of the man who'd attempted to rape his wife. It was his biggest financial result to date in a long second career of acting as a police informant, both from inside jail and out. "'What did he want?' Grace asked. "'He wouldn't say. Just tell me it's urgent and you'd want to know.' "'What reward is he after this time?' I don't know. He sounded anxious and gave me a number. Grace jotted it down on his pad, then entered the car park, stopped and dialed it. It was answered almost instantly with a furtive, Yeah? Darren Spicer? Suppose who's calling him? Fuck quit, Grace thought. He gave his name. Got something for you? What's it about and what do you want? I want a monkey. A monkey was five hundred pounds. Well, that's big money. Well, this is big information. Want to tell me? We need to meet. Well, what's it about generally? That movie style you're protecting. Gaia? Mow the crown and anchor in Shoreham. That's a bit upmarket for you, isn't it? Well, I'm a rich man these days, Detective Superintendent. I'll be here for another thirty minutes. Shoreham Harbour was a major port at the western extremity of Brighton. A village that had long since grown into an annex to the city was spread along it. The Crown and Anchor pub, with its outside terrace overlooking the harbour, had one of Shoreham by Sea's most attractive and best value restaurants. They had eaten there many times in the past with Sandy, and more recently with Cleo. Whatever else he might think about Spicer's sad and generally scuzzy lifestyle, 
there was no denying the villain was well connected, and his information tended to be reliable. True, five hundred pounds was a lot, but the police had funds set aside for payments like this. Thanks to new levels of public accountability, all police officers, unless attending an emergency, had to comply with public parking regulations, which was why he wasted ten minutes of his day driving around the narrow streets of the old village port of Shoreham in the pelting rain trying to find a parking space. Spicer was seated on a bar stool, nursing an almost empty straight glass of stout. A tall, gangly man in his early forties, who, thanks to his many years spent in prison, looked upwards of sixty, he wore a yellow polo shirt, baggy jeans, and brand new trainers. His head was shaven to a brown fuzz, his face was grizzled with dead eyes. Get you another Guinness, Gray said by way of introduction, as he slid onto the stool next to him. It was still early, and the bar was almost empty. Thought it wasn't coming, Spicer said without even looking at him. I need a fag. Bring my pint out on the terrace. He climbed down from his stool and ambled across the bar. Grace watched him. He had the posture of a bent crane. A few minutes later, Roy Grace pushed his way through the glass patio door and out on the wooden decking overlooking the Arda, the river which fed the harbour. It was low tide and mostly mud flats, with a narrow stream of water flowing through the middle. Dozens of gulls were foraging in the mud. Across the far side was the permanent moored community of houseboats, which had been here ever since he could remember. Spicer was sitting beneath a large umbrella, rain falling all around him, holding a roll-up between his forefinger and thumb. Grace handed him his pint of Guinness, and set down his own glass containing Diet Coke, and pulled up a chair. "'Good weather for ducks?' he said. The smell of Spicer's cigarette was tantalising, but he had made a resolve many years ago never to smoke in the daytime, and only one or two occasionally in the evening. Spicer took a long drag and inhaled deeply. I ain't greed, it's a monkey. That's a lot of money. I think you'll find it a bargain. He drained his glass, then lifted the one Grace had bought him. And if I don't? Spicer shrugged. No skin off my nose. I'll just do the burglary, and I'll net a lot more than a monkey, yeah? What burglary are you talking about? He drank deeply from his new pint. I've been offered good money to burgle Guy's hotel suite. Grace's whole body clenched tight. He felt a shiver ripple through him. Suddenly five hundred pounds did seem a bargain. Tell me more. Will we have a deal. I'll get the money to you in the next couple of days. So, first thing, why didn't you take the job? Don't do burglary no more, Detective Superintendent. The police may be a rich man. Don't need to do no burglary. So what are you into now? Drugs? I guess a wedge like fifty grand could make you a bit of a player. Spicer shrugged evasively. I ain't here to talk about yourself. Grace raised his hands. Don't worry, I'm clean, no recorder. So? Tell me who's offered you this job. Even though the terrace was deserted, Spicer still looked cautiously around, before leaning across the table and in a very low voice said, Amos Smallbone. Grace stared back at him. Amos Smallbone? Seriously? Spicer nodded. Why you? I used to work at the Grand after I come out of prison, down in the maintenance department. Know me way around the place with me eyes shut. I know how to get into any room there. Smallbone had heard that. That's why he come to me. I don't suppose you'd like to go on the record with this. You having a laugh? If you made a statement, I could get his license revoked. He'd be back inside for a good long stretch. Oh, no, I'm not that smart, Spicer said. But I'm still alive. If I go public and cross up Smallbone, I'll have to watch me back for the rest of my life. No, thanks. He looked worriedly at Grace. This is not, you know. Grace shook his head. It stays with me. No one will ever know we had this conversation. So, tell me more. I didn't think burglary was Smallbones' game. It ain't. He just wanted to fuck you over, embarrass you. Then Spicer gave a wry smile. I don't think he likes you very much. That's a shame. My mantelpiece will look very bare this Christmas without my usual card from him. Chapter 68 
No, I don't need help, thank you. Do I look that fucking frail? The doorman at the Grand Hotel was taken aback, but outwardly kept his composure. Very good, sir, just trying to be helpful. Well, when I want your help, I'll tell you. Drayton Wheeler walked on through the lobby, perspiring heavily, struggling from the weight of the seal-brown box under his left arm and his two heavily laden carrier bags. He passed a couple of photographers and the same oddball group of people occupying a bay of sofas, several of them holding CD booklets and record sleeves, who seemed to be camped out here, sad fans of that super-bitch cow actress. How wrong was she for the part, his part, the one he had written? He pressed the button and waited for the lift. His anger was all over the place, he knew. He'd shouted at two different pharmacists, the idiot on the checkout desk in the Waitrose supermarket, the cretin in Dockrell's hardware store, and the total asshole in Halford's. He got out of the sixth floor, walked down the corridor, then struggled to get his keycard out. He pushed it in, then removed it. The light flashed red. Shit! He shouted. He rammed it in, then pulled it out again, the weight of the package under his left arm killing him. He put it in again, the right way round this time, and the light flashed green. He half kicked, half pushed open the door, and stepped into the small room, staggered over towards the twin beds, and dumped his packages down on one with relief. He needed a shower, something to eat, but first he needed to check everything, to make sure the fuckwits hadn't sold him the wrong stuff. He hung the Do Not Disturb sign outside the door, turned the security lock, then ripped open the first package, took out the car battery, and set it down on top of the Sussex Life magazine that lay on the small round table. Then he dipped into one of the carrier bags and pulled out a heavy metal tyre bar, and then six thermometers which he placed next to the battery. Then he removed the bottle of hydrochloric acid, labelled as paint stripper, which he'd bought from Dockrell's. He placed that on the table on top of another magazine, Absolute Brighton. Then he added a bottle of chlorine. He opened the last carrier bag, which was from Mother Care. He stood back for a moment, clasped his hands together, and smiled. The great thing about dying, he thought, was that you no longer had to be worried about anything. A quotation was spinning around in his head, and he tried to remember who said it. To dream of death is good for those in fear, for the dead have no more fears. That was right. Oh, yes. Do you know that quotation, Larry Brooker, Maxime Brody, Gaia Lafayette? Know who you're dealing with? A man who has no more fears, a man who has the chemical components to make mercuric chloride, and who knows how to make it. He was a successful industrial chemist, long before he became a screwed screenwriter. He remembered all this stuff from a long time ago. Mercuric chloride is not a salt, but a linear triatomic molecule, hence its tendency to sublime. Did you know that, Larry Brooker, Maxime Brody, Bitch Queen, Guy Lafayette? You will soon. His phone rang. He answered it aggressively, not in any mood to be disturbed. An irritatingly cheery young woman said, Jerry Baxter? He remembered the voice. Uh-huh. You didn't turn up for your costume fitting today. Just wanted to check if you were still interested in being an extra on The King's Lover. He held his temper. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I had an important meeting. Oh, no problem, Jerry. We're shooting crowd scenes outside the pavilion on Monday morning, weather permitting. If you're still interested, could you come tomorrow? He said nothing for some moments, thinking hard. Then he said, Perfect. Chapter 69 Cleo found a parking space two streets away from her home shortly after 5 p.m. on Friday evening. The rain had stopped and the sky was brightening. As she climbed out of her little Audi, she felt leadenly tired, but happy. So incredibly happy, and with a weekend to look forward to ahead. As if responding to her mood, the baby kicked inside her. You happy too, Bump? She lifted her handbag off the passenger seat, locked the car and started walking home, totally unaware of the two pairs of eyes watching her from behind the windscreen of the rented Volkswagen that had been following her from the vaultery. Warum starrst du die dicke Frau an? the boy asked. In German she replied, She's not fat, my love. She's carrying a baby. In German he asked, Whose baby? She did not reply. With hatred in her eyes she watched the woman. 
Who's baby mamma? For some moments she said nothing, feeling deep turmoil inside her. Wait here, she said. I'll be right back. She left the car and walked up the street for some yards past the Audi. Trying to appear nonchalant, and not to draw any attention to herself, she turned around until she could see the front of Cleo's car. There was a pattern of dust on the bonnet, and several spatterings of seagull droppings, one lying on the duct tape repair to the roof. But the wording she'd carved was still there, clearly visible. Copper's tart. Your baby is next. Chapter 70 Anna paced around her Gaia museum, her Gaia shrine, a martini glass in her hand. She was drinking, deliberately drinking, a cocktail that was so not Gaia. It was a Manhattan. Two parts bourbon, one part red martini, Angostura bitters, and a maraschino cherry on its stalk in a martini glass. She was drinking it to spite Gaia. She was drinking it to get drunk. It was her third Manhattan of the evening, Friday evening. She didn't have to go to work tomorrow, so she could get totally smashed. She had never been so humiliated in her life as she had been on Wednesday. Her face was still burning. She could hear the sight and laughter of all the other fans on the sofas. Standing in front of a life-size cardboard cutout of her idol, she stared into those blue eyes. What went wrong? Hey, tell me. I'm your number one fan, and you turned away from me. Tell me why. Hey, tell me. You found someone else? Someone who's more into you than me? Not possible. No way. You've made my life worth living, don't you know that? Don't you care? You're the only person who's ever loved me. In her left hand she held a knife. A kukri. The knife one of her father's ancestors had taken from a dead soldier way back during the Gurkha Wars. Gurkhas were brave people. They did not care about dying. If a man says he is not afraid of dying, he is either lying or is a Gurkha. What do you think about that, Gaia? Are you lying or a Gurkha? Or just a parvenu from Whitehawk in Brighton who thinks you're too big to bother to acknowledge your fans? She strutted very slowly down the steep wooden stairs, went through into the kitchen and filled her glass with the remainder of the drink that was in the silver cocktail shaker. Then she went back upstairs to her shrine. Cheers, Gaia, she said. So tell me, did it feel good cutting me dead yesterday, hey? Tell me about it. Who put you on your platform? Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about me? You stared at me so often. I watched you, watching me on Top Gear and on so many other shows. So what do you think gave you the right to treat me like, like scum? Shit! Like, like trash! Tell me, I'm really interested. Your number one fan needs to know. I do, really. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me. Chapter 71 for the Friday evening briefing, Glen Branson chose a seat that gave him a clear view of Bella. He noticed that, as usual, she and Norman Potting sat well apart, so that eye contact between them was difficult. Experienced detectives, he thought, they clearly planned this between them. So just how long had their relationship been going on? It wasn't that long ago that Potting had married for the fourth time, suckered by a Thai girl who'd been bleeding him dry of money. He watched her pop a Malteser into her mouth. She wasn't in any sense beautiful, but there was something about her that he found very attractive. Warmth and a vulnerability that made him want to scoop her up into his arms. Just a short while ago, he thought he might be able to offer her something better than the life of drudgery she had looking after her ailing mother. Now it was a different challenge altogether. Potting was so not right for her. He looked at him, at the smug grin on his face. Come on, Bella, how on earth could you fancy him? Glenn? Hello, Glenn? With a start, he realised Roy Grace was speaking to him, and he had no idea what about. Sorry, Chief, I was um, somewhere else. Well, welcome back from Planet Zog. There was some sniggering in the room. Long day, Potting queried. His words were like a knife twisting inside him. I asked you about the DNA results on the four limbs. 
Grace said, glancing briefly down at his notes. You said you were expecting them back from the lab today. Branson nodded. Ah, uh, yep, I have the results. He opened a plastic folder. I can read you out the full lab report if you want, Chief. Grace shook his head. To most police officers, himself included, DNA reports were a mysterious arcane art. He had always been rubbish at science at school. In fact, he had been rubbish at most things at school, except for rugby and running. Just summarise for now, Glenn. OK. So, all four limbs are from the same body, and it's a million to one certainty that they belong to the torso of unknown Beric male, he said. Good work, Grace said. Right, so we have another piece of our jigsaw in place. All we're missing now is his head. Could be we're looking for a man who lost his head to a woman, Potting said, and guffawed. You should know. Bella rounded on Potting. Potting blushed and looked down. To everyone else present, her remark was a barb about his marital failures. Only Glenn knew the truth behind it. Not very helpful, actually, Norman, Grace said. Sorry, boss. He looked around with a sheepish grin, but no one responded. Roy Grace stared at Potting. He was a fine detective, but sometimes he could be so damned irritating with his bad jokes, and on this inquiry he seemed to be worse than ever. The issue we have is the timing difference between the torso and the limbs, Glenn said, pushing his mess of thoughts to the back of his mind and fully focused again now. We know that the torso was deposited many months ago and is in a highly advanced state of decomposition. The limbs are relatively fresh. Which would indicate that Darren Wallace's opinion that they'd been frozen is probably correct, said the crime scene manager, David Green. Is that not something the pathologist can determine? Bellamoy asked. Green shook his head. Oh, not easily. Freezing will cause cell damage. But it's going to take a while to establish that. So what does this tell us? Grace said, addressing the entire team. Why was the torso dumped months ago and the limbs only in the past couple of days? Someone playing games with us, Chief? suggested Nick Nickel. Yes, Roy Grace said. That's a possibility. But let's supply our old friend Brother Ockham's razor. William of Ockham was a 14th century friar and logician. He believed that the simplest answer was usually the right one. You're suggesting a link between Crime Watch and the limbs, boss? said Guy Batchelor. I think we're dealing with someone either very cunning or very nervous, Grace replied. It's possible that he left the torso and the soup fabric in the chicken farm as one clue for us. Then the limbs and the piece of soup fabric at the trout lake as another clue, in which case at some point we'll find another piece of fabric and the head. Or, as I think more likely, Crime Watch spooked the perpetrator into getting rid of some and possibly all of the rest of the evidence. Lorna Steamer continuing to search for the head. Or maybe that's the one trophy he can't bear to part with, Potting said. Grace nodded. Yeah, that's possible. He looked at his notes. For the moment, we have no option but to work with what we have. Right, the suit fabric. He looked up at Glenn Branson. What's the situation with that? D.S. Bachelor's been onto this, boss. Bachelor nodded. I've got the outside inquiry team going through the list that Dormay supplied us. All men's clothing stores and tailors within our three counties' parameter who bought sufficient quantities of this cloth to make suits from, including Savile style. I gave a list of 82 people who bought one of the suits or had one made to Annalise Veneer at midday today. He turned to the indexer. What do you have for us, Annalise? There is something interesting, she said, flushing a little as if not used to being in the limelight. There's a men's clothing store in Gardner Street, Brighton, called Luigi, which sold a suit in this material to a man called Miles Royce two years ago. It wasn't bespoke, but the proprietor, Luigi, remembers making a number of tailoring alterations to make a better fit. Miles Royce is on our Miss Purse list. DCS Potting is following up. Grace turned to Potting. Have you progressed this? Yes, Chief. Luigi had an address for his customer in Ash Grove, Haywards Heath, which I went to this afternoon pleasant detached house in a decent neighbourhood. Um, there was no answer, and the place looked in a state of neglect. I come from a farming background, and I, I know a little about grass. In my view, the lawn had been cut this year. The garden's overgrown with weeds. I found one helpful neighbour at home, an elderly lady opposite, who told me he lived alone. She has been looking after his cat for several months. Apparently, he had some investments, some kind of family trust that he lived on, 
and he'd told her he was going off to do a bit of travelling for a few weeks, and never returned. Potting paused and shuffled through the mess of papers in front of him. Now, here's the interesting thing. Well, maybe not that interesting. Grace stared at him, waiting patiently, wishing he could get to the point. But that wasn't Norman Potting's style, and never would be. "'I got the name and phone number of his mother from this lady,' Potting said. "'So I went round to see her in a care home in Burgess Hill. "'She told me her son used to call her at seven every Sunday evening without fail. "'She hasn't heard from him since January. "'She's very distressed, and apparently they were extremely close. "'Did she report him as a misper? Bellamoy said. "'In April. "'Why did she wait so long?' Nick Nickel asked. She told me he was often travelling, Norman Potting replied. She said he was a, a very big fan of Gaia, obsessed by her. He had a small trust fund and made a bit of money apparently dabbling in the property market, and that enabled him to travel the world following her. Grace frowned. A wealthy, grown man travelling the world for Gaia, what was all that about? I'm told she's a, a huge gay icon, Potting replied. Is, uh, was... "'Miles Royce gay?' Branson interjected. "'The neighbour said she saw a few young men turn up at his house, "'but never any ladies,' Potting said. "'Grace thought hard. "'Something didn't quite add up. "'A Gaia fan butchered. "'Gaia in town. "'A recent murder attempt on her in Los Angeles. "'Coincidences?' "'He didn't like coincidences much. "'They were too convenient. "'Easy to explain something away as coincidence.' much harder to drill down beneath the surface to see what was really there. "'Has his mother got anything we might get his DNA from, Norman?' he asked. Potting shook his head. "'No. But I got the neighbour to let me into his house. I removed one of his suits. He fits our size profile exactly, and I brought back a hairbrush and toothbrush. I've already had them sent to the lab.' Oh, "'Well done,' Grace said. Then he lapsed into thought. "'Gaia!' Was there a connection? Why should there be? He'd been a detective for too long to dismiss anything. A Gaia fan had possibly been murdered. Gaia was in town. But if he had been murdered, that had been long before anyone knew she was coming to town. He continued thinking for some moments. Deposition sites tended to be ditches besides quiet roads or woodlands alongside them. He turned to Glen Branson. "'We need to get a list of all the members of the Trout Fishing Club "'and have them interviewed. "'See if any of them saw anything, "'or react suspiciously to being interviewed. "'It's a pretty remote place. "'I'm not sure any member of the general public "'would find it by accident. "'Whoever used this as a deposition site "'must have had prior knowledge of it. "'We should also work on a list of anyone "'who might have had a reason to visit it, "'like maintenance workers clearing the weeds "'or working on repairs.' "'I'm there, boss,' Deb Branson interjected "'and looked at the indexer. Annalise is already liaising with the tribe club secretary. He's being very helpful, Annalise Veneer said. He's given me the full membership list, and he's working on a wider list of names of all people the club has dealings with who might have reason to visit it, or at least know its location, such as people from the Environment Agency who handle fishing licenses, their fencing contractor, the company they use for weed control, their driveway maintenance people, their printers and their solicitors. I hope to have the full list by tomorrow. Grace thanked her. Then he turned to another of the detectives on his team, John Exton. Anything to report from the National Footwear Reference Collection, John? Yes, boss, Exton said. Glenn liked the young man, because he was always brimming with enthusiasm. I've found an exact match, Exton continued. It's good news, and, um, not such good news. Grace frowned. This wasn't the time or place to start talking in riddles. And what do you mean? He said a tad snappily. Well, the good news, boss, is that the print is from a Wellington boot, rather than a trainer. Many prisons issued prisoners with trainers when they left, if they had no other shoes. Partly as a result of that, there were more trainer footprints at crime scenes than any other kind of footwear. The vast numbers of stockists and quantity of trainer manufacturers made it hard to trace the source. The footprint is from a Hunter Wellington boot, Exton went on. The style is one of the original range. I'm afraid the bad news is that this brand is one of the most popular manufactured in this country. There are 64 stockists in Sussex, Kent and Surrey. And, of course, you can get them online. 
Roy Grace absorbed the information, thinking hard. How many of these were self-service stores like garden centres? What was the possibility of the staff remembering who bought these boots? In every murder inquiry, he had to balance the costs of deployment of officers against the probabilities of achieving any result. Sixty-four stockists would consume a lot of the outside inquiry team manpower if he wanted to get a result quickly. How many a day could any individual cover? In his experience, having to wait for staff they needed to interview to come back from breaks and the like was time-consuming. Six retail outlets a day would be good going. It would take two officers a good week to cover every shop and store. D.C. Reeves put her hand in the air. Sir, Hunter's a very expensive brand. I know because I recently went shopping for some wellies. Do you think there's some significance in this, that it tallies with the expensive soup material from the victim? What I mean by this is it tells us the perpetrator might be financially well off. Grace nodded. Yeah, good point, Emma. He made a note. Then he instructed John Exton to proceed and have all stockists interviewed, although in his heart he knew there was a slim likelihood of a result from that effort. At least it would cover his backside, but he wrote it up in his policy book, should his investigation get questioned at a later date. He turned to the forensic podiatrist, Hayden Kelly. Anything to add at this stage, Hayden? Kenny shook his head. OK. I don't think we're going to achieve a lot more overnight. The next meeting will be at 6.30pm tomorrow, Grace said. Glenn and I will be holding a press conference at 11 o'clock, so if there are any significant developments that come in before then, let me know. As he stood up, Emma Reeves asked, Any chance at Guy's autograph, Chief? Grace smiled. Chapter 72 Cleo lay in bed, her laptop propped in front of her on the duvet, logged into Mumsnet. Her coursework papers for the Open University degree she was taking in philosophy spread all around her. She was leadenly tired, but it was only 7.30pm, far too early to go to sleep. Laura Marling, one of her current favourite folk singers, was playing on her iPod. The baby was going wild tonight. It felt like it was dancing inside her. She lifted the duvet, hitched up her nightdress, and watched, fascinated, as her belly looked like it was dancing too, its shape shifting from round to square, with little pointy bits sticking out. She wished Roy was here to see this. He'd promised to be home soon. She hoped the baby would still be active when he got here. You're going to be amazing, Bump. You know that. You're going to be the most loved baby in the whole world. Bump danced even more wildly, as if in acknowledgement. She left Mumsnet and logged on to Amazon to look up prices of car seats. With the birth of the baby imminent, she was focused on all the stuff she needed to get. She had a list compiled by her best friend Millie, who had two daughters, and another list compiled by her sister Charlie, an interior designer who'd insisted on decorating the baby's room herself. Cot, crib linens, mattress pad, waterproof mattress pads, blankets, baby wipes, nappies, changing pad, nappy bag, nappy rash cream, the list just went on and on. Everyone had told her that her life would change, but only now was it really starting to dawn on her how right they were. She went on through the list. Six bottles and sterilising equipment, bottle brush, bottle warmer, infant formula milk, nipple cream, breast pads, nursing bras, a breast pump in case Roy had to feed the baby when she wasn't there. And just how often would Roy be there? That was one of her biggest concerns. She knew just how wedded to his work he was. In her job at the mortuary, there was a constant stream of sudden deaths, which police officers had to attend. Whenever the name Roy Grace came up, she heard nothing but positive comments. He seemed universally liked and respected. He was a good man, she knew that, just one of the countless reasons why she loved him. But there was one shadow to their relationship. He was a great copper, but would that mean he'd be a great father? Would he be there for their child's first nativity play, or would he be tied up on a murder investigation? And on parents' evening, sports day? When they talked about it, he always dismissed her concerns, reminding her that his father had been a police officer, yet had always managed to find the time to attend the things that had mattered. But he had not been a homicide SIO, who didn't know what was going to happen in thirty minutes' time, let alone thirty days. 
Roy constantly assured her that their life together was more important than his work. But was that true? And did she even want that to be true? Would she really want a murder inquiry to suffer because Roy was more interested in spending time playing with his child? One of Cleo's friends was married to a high flyer, and she hardly saw him, particularly after the second baby was born. He'd arrive home after both infants were asleep, eat dinner, and then crash out in the spare room so he wasn't woken by the baby's constant demands for food. Did the baby actually know yet she had a father? Another worry that she had right now was the vandalization of her car. Roy had told her he knew who'd done it, and that he'd ensured it would never happen again, but there was always going to be the danger of retribution against any police officer by an aggrieved criminal. That was something she knew she'd have to live with, and be a little bit vigilant all of the time. But she had another, even deeper worry. Roy's missing wife, Sandy. Cleo found it hard to get him to talk about her, and yet she felt the woman's presence all around her. During the early days of their relationship, Roy had invited her back to his house. They'd made love in his bedroom, and she'd stayed the night, but had barely slept a wink. She'd fully expected the door to fly open at any moment, and this attractive woman to appear, staring at them contemptuously. Sure, Roy had assured her that his relationship with Sandy was long dead, and that's how she regarded it. But there was always the nagging doubt in her mind. What if? If? It gave her some comfort that Roy was having his wife declared legally dead, ten years on, but that would not stop her reappearing if she were still alive. And how would Roy react then? He claimed that it was over, and nothing would change that. But what Cleo wondered if she'd been abducted by some crazy guy. How would Roy react if Sandy appeared now, escaped from some deranged kidnapper? Surely he'd be morally obliged to take her back, regardless of what he said. Cleo was not a person who would normally wish anyone dead, but sometimes she fervently wished that Sandy's body would turn up. So at least Roy would have closure— and they could move on with their lives free and clear of any shadows. Chapter 73 She sat in the shadows on the shaded side of the street, where she had been parked for over two hours, but at least darkness was falling, finally. It was 9.30 p.m. Once she used to love these long summer days, but today the daylight was just a major nuisance. The interior of the small rental car reeked of cheeseburger and greasy fries. Through the windscreen, she had a clear view of the entrance to the gated townhouse development where Cleo Morrie lived. On the radio, the sound turned low, the Rolling Stones were singing under the boardwalk. The song took her back, to one of their many disagreements about so many things. She preferred the version sung by the Drifters. They'd argued over who wrote it. She claimed it was Kenny Young and Arthur Rennick, who were part of that group but Roy insisted it was the Rolling Stones. Mama, mir ist langweilig, said her son, in the passenger seat beside her. He had red all around his mouth and was busily dipping a cluster of French fries into the mess of ketchup at the bottom of the carton. Mein Schatz, wir sind jetzt in England. Ich sprich mal English, she said. He shrugged. Ja? Okay. I'm bored. Then he yawned. She stroked his forehead affectionately. Sehr gut. He turned his head and looked at her quizzically. You said people speak English here. Now you speak German yourself, huh? He picked up the huge carton of coke and sucked noisily through the straw. Sometimes, when the boy made her really irritated, she'd think, or they never say to him, I left Roy for you. I must have been crazy. But that was the truth, or at least part of the truth. She'd left Roy Grace because she'd found out she was pregnant with their child, the child they'd both wanted so badly, the child they'd been trying to have for almost eight years. It was so ironical. She'd found out she was pregnant, finally, just days after she'd made the decision that she did not want to spend the rest of her life married to Roy Grace, married to Sussex CID, subordinate to Sussex CID. She knew that the moment Roy found out she was pregnant, she'd be stuck. For a long time, for a life sentence. Even if they parted, she'd have to share the child with him forever. 
As a result of a windfall inheritance from an aunt, which she didn't tell Roy about, she was independently well off. She could afford to leave, and she did. She didn't say a word to her parents, whom she despised. Didn't tell anyone. Instead, she went into hiding with the only people who'd ever given her a feeling of self-worth. The only people who, she felt, regarded her as someone in her own right, and not someone defined by who had given birth to her or who had married her. For the first time in her life, she'd been her own person, not her parents' daughter, Miss Sandy Bulkwell, not her husband's wife, Mrs. Roy Grace. She had her new name, which she'd borrowed from her maternal German grandmother, her new identity, her whole new life ahead of her. Sandy Lohmann. Sandy Lohmann was a woman who had cleared everything from her head. The husband who constantly let her down because he had to go to a crime scene. The father who let her down because he could never tell the truth about a damned thing in life. The mother who had never had an opinion of her own. The Scientologists operated the clear, under their universal banner, the bridge to total freedom. They had helped her to clear the past out of her mind and look at the world through fresh eyes, and they had helped her to look after the baby. It was while living in their headquarters near East Grinstead in Sussex that she had met Hans Jürgen Waldinger. He had subsequently persuaded her to move with her infant son to Munich, where he introduced her to the organization he had helped to establish, called the International Association of Free Spirits. The organization offered similar mental regeneration to the Scientologists, but in what she felt was a less aggressive and costly process. She had found Waldinger very attractive, and still did, but living with him had not worked out. She rapidly ended up arguing and rowing with him just as much as she had done with Roy. In the end she'd moved into an apartment of her own. So what the hell was she doing back here? A damned advertisement in a Munich newspaper she'd just happened by chance to see a month ago, that was why. Sandra, Sandy, Christina, Grace, wife of Roy Jack Grace of Hove, City of Brighton and Hove, East Sussex, England, missing, presumed dead for ten years, last seen in Hove, Sussex. She is five feet seven inches tall, 1.70 metres, slim build, and had shoulder-length fair hair when last seen. Unless anyone can provide evidence that she is still alive, to Messrs. Edwards and Edwards, LLP, at the address beneath, a declaration will be sought that she is legally dead. Of course, at some point, Roy was going to move on with his life. What did she expect? But all the same, it hurt, like hell. She couldn't help it. It was his damn fault she'd had to leave in the first place. Now it seemed he was trying to dismiss his past with a single wave of his hand. Having herself declared dead could only be for one reason. So he could be free to marry again. Marry his pregnant bitch. She pulled the particulars of the house out of the glove locker, the house where they had once been so happy, their home. It was on the market now, and it might never come back on the market again for the rest of their lives, because it was the kind of house people lived in for years, the kind of family home where people could grow old together. The two of them could have grown old there together. That had been the plan, she and Roy. What would that have been like? What kind of an old couple would they have made? How long do we have to stay here? Bruno asked suddenly in German. She looked at him. The son Roy had always wanted, and was about to reply, but then stiffened. A man was striding down the street towards them, dressed in a dark suit and carrying a bulky attaché case. It had been ten years since she had last seen him, but in this fading light it could have been just twenty-four hours. His trim figure was just the same, and his face had barely aged. Only his hair was different, cropped short and gelled. It suited him. He looked happy, and that sent a deep twinge of sadness spiralling through her. She knew there was no chance he would recognise her in the falling darkness, wearing large sunglasses, a baseball cap pulled low over her forehead, and with her hair dyed black, but even so, she tilted her face down. A thousand thoughts were going through her mind. Was the woman carrying a boy or a girl? How happy was he with her? How long had they been seeing each other? Did they argue all the time? What do I do next? She waited some moments, then took a cautious peep, just in time to see him tapping the entry panel keypad. Then he pushed the wrought iron gate open and entered. 
Moments later, it swung shut behind him with a clang. Swung shut on her, locking her out of his new life. She kept looking until he walked out of sight. Then she twisted the key in the ignition so hard that for a moment she thought she'd snapped it. The engine fired. She checked her mirrors, then accelerated up the road, squealing the tyres, sending coke spurting over her protesting son. Chapter 74 Goddamn lucky it ain't raining, Drayton Wheeler said. He turned as if for confirmation to the awkward-looking woman standing behind him in the long line of people stretched back from the main entrance to Brighton Racecourse. The building had been commandeered by the film production as the assembly point for the extras. She looked up from the copy of the Argus she was reading, staring for some moments at the rather odd man in front of her in the queue to register as film extras. Yeah, very lucky. You're fucking telling me! He was definitely a weirdo, she thought, tall and gangly with a grey pageboy fringe poking out beneath a wash-faded baseball cap. He was all twitchy, his face screwing up in frown lines, as if filled with pent-up anger, and had a sickly sallow complexion. There were fifty people in front of them, all shapes and sizes, waiting to sign on and be fitted for costumes. They'd been standing for over an hour in the blustery wind, high up on Race Hill. White rail posts marked the oval race track, and there were fine views across the city and south, over the marina and the English Channel. Suddenly, from the front of the queue, a cheery woman's voice called out, "'Our family Hazeldean here. Paul Hazeldean, Charlotte Hazeldean, Isabel Hazeldean, and Jessica Hazeldean, with their dog Benson. If you are, could you make yourself known to us, please? Come forward to the front of the queue.' Wheeler looked at his watch. "'Going to be another hour at least.' He looked at the woman who was about his age. She had an angular face, with blonde hair styled like Gaia's, from a photograph that was in a large spread about the shooting of the movie in today's edition of the local paper. His movie. His script they'd stolen. He could do with sex. She wasn't attractive, but she looked like she was single, and she wasn't a paper bag job. No wedding band. Great legs. He was a legs man. Maybe she was up for sex. Maybe, if he played it right, he could get her back to his room for a screw afterwards. He could focus on her legs and not on her face. His apparatus still functioned, one of the side effects of the happy pills he was on to help him forget that he was dying. She looked lonely. He was lonely. Done this before? he asked, trying to break the ice. Actually, she said, that's none of your business. She lifted her newspaper to block him out of sight, and continued reading the spread on Gaia and on the filming which was starting on Monday. Bitch, she was thinking. Oh, you bitch, Gaia. I'm going to think about giving you one more chance, understand, one more chance. And that's only because we love each other. She could tell from the contrite expression Gaia had that she was trying to send her a signal, an apology. It's almost too late, but I might give you one more chance. I haven't decided. She lowered the paper. Actually, I'm only doing this because I'm a personal friend of Gaia. No shit, he said. She smiled back proudly. She's wonderful, isn't she? You think so? She can do no wrong. You think so? Jesus. Well, from what I've read about this film, the script is crap, but she'll make it something special. Crap? Lady... D did you say the script is crap? Whoever wrote it has no idea at all about the truth between George and Maria. But that's Hollywood, right? I don't like your tone. Well, fuck you. Well, fuck you too, he said, glaring at her. He wanted to tell her he wrote it, that his version of events was correct, regardless of what abomination those assholes of Brooker Brody had made it into. Instead, he turned away, fighting to bring his anger back under control. They stood in silence for the next ninety minutes. Finally, it was his turn to sign on. He gave his name as Jerry Baxter. He was given a copy of the production shooting schedule and the Monday call sheet, and was then sent through to the upstairs room for male costume fitting. As he left, the fresh-faced young woman behind the desk smiled up at the next in line. "'Your name, please?' "'Anna Galicia, she said. "'Do you have any acting experience?' the woman asked her. "'Actually,' I'm a personal friend of Gaia. 
Really? Yes, really. Oh, well, you should have asked her to contact us. Save you queuing. Oh, I'd hate to bother her while she's rehearsing. She likes to get into the, into the zone before acting. Oh, I've heard that. Yes, she does, it's true. Anna Galicia signed the release form and entered the details requested from her. She was given the production schedule, a call sheet for Monday, and was then directed through to the female costume room. It was full of fat women, slim women, young women, middle-aged women, squeezing into ridiculous costumes and ornate wigs. They were there for the money, the sixty-five pounds a day. They were there for vanity, for fun. None of them was there for the same reason as herself. None of the others was there because Gaia had personally asked them to be there, like she'd asked her, to make amends for her behaviour at the Grand. She'd been stressed out with jet lag. She was deeply sorry for her behaviour. Anna was big-hearted. She knew how to forgive. She'd forgiven her. Chapter 75 After his costume fitting, Drayton Wheeler took the extra's courtesy bus down to the centre of Brighton, then walked along to the Royal Pavilion, checking that one part of his purchase from Mothercare was safely in his pocket. He paid his entrance fee and went in. It was half-past one. Over four hours before the place closed to the public. More than sufficient time with luck. He made his way straight to the banqueting room, and was pleased to see it was packed with people, all slowly moving around the edge of the room, restricted by the ropes on their brass posts, which kept them well away from the banqueting table. He was even more pleased to see there was only one security guard in here at the moment. He stopped only a short distance along, pretending to admire a handsome mahogany side-table laden with silverware. A couple with two bored children shuffled past, followed by a group of Japanese tourists who stopped right in front of him. On the far side of the room, the security guard was momentarily occupied, preventing someone from taking a photograph. Now was perfect. No one noticed him slip his hand beneath the side-table and press something small and hard against the underside, holding it until he was certain the glue had taken. It took only a few seconds, during which the Japanese tourists had, very obligingly, not moved either. Then he shuffled on forward, going with the flow. Mission accomplished. Chapter 76 "'The bitch won't let me,' Glen Branson said, storming into Roy Grace's office shortly before 8 a.m. on Monday. Can you believe it? The chance of a lifetime, something they could tell their children about one day, and their grandchildren. Grace looked up from the notes his MSA had prepared for this morning's briefing. Won't let you what? Take Sammy and Remy to meet Gaia's kid, right? You're joking. I'm so not joking. I am seething. She said no. I asked them both when I took them out on Saturday afternoon, and they were thrilled to bits. I told you they're both massive Gaia fans. So I told her they wanted to go when I took them back. So she can't stop you, just take them. She says Gaia is a symbol of sex and bad language, and she's not having her corrupting them. That's ridiculous, her little boy is six years old. Well, you want to phone Harry and tell her? Well, I will if you like, Grace said with false bravado. Not many things scared him in life, but Glenn Branson's wife did. I spoke to my solicitor over the weekend... She advised me not to force the issue, that Arry could use it against me. How? I don't know. He sat down in front of Grace, looking dejected. How was your weekend? For a change, Grace had had a peaceful weekend. Just two short briefings on Operation Icon, and the rest of the time he'd spent with Cleo. They'd gone shopping on Saturday, and bought stuff for the baby's room. Had a takeaway curry on Sunday, watched a couple of movies, and in between read some of the papers. One of Cleo's extravagances, which he liked, was that she had virtually every English Sunday paper, from lowbrow to highbrow, delivered every week. It was a fine day, and she'd insisted they go out for fresh air to their favourite place, the Undercliff Walk at Rottingdean, and she'd managed the entire length of it. It really seemed the problems with a sudden bleed that she'd had a few weeks ago were a thing of the past. Just a few more weeks to go before she was due. She'd stop work at the end of this week, most of the rest of Sunday he'd spent on the sofa with her as she worked on her philosophy studies, and he'd gone through all the trial papers on the Carl Venner case, which opened at the Old Bailey this morning. He reached out and took his friend's massive black hand. 
It was hard as a rock, like gripping a piece of ebony. All the same, he squeezed it. Don't let it get you down, matey. Okay? Glenn squeezed back. Grace said nothing. He could see the big, tough guy he loved so much was close to tears. Chapter 77 the time is 8.30 a.m., Monday, June the 13th. This is the 17th briefing of Operation Icon, Roy Grace said to his team in the conference room. Does anyone have any progress to report since our briefing of yesterday morning? Annalise Veneer raised her hand. Yes, Chief, I've been going through the list of members of the West Sussex Piscatorial Society supplied to me by their secretary and the list of all people who had any involvement with this club. I've found someone with a link to Stonery Farm. You have? Grace said. Well done. Tell us. I don't know if it's of any significance, but Stonery Farm and the West Sussex Piscatorial Society use the same firm of Brighton accountants, Feline Bradley Hamilton. There's one name in particular that's common to both, which is an auditor employed by this firm, a man by the name of Eric Whiteley. He's carried out the annual audit for both the farm and the club for several years. Grace wrote the name down. I'm not familiar with how auditors work, he said. Would he have been to the premises of both? Well, he goes to the office at Stony Farm each year. The Piscatorial Society secretary was unable to tell me whether Whiteley has ever actually been to the lake that the Piscatorial Society own, but he is their principal contact. How many employees are there of these accountants? Feline Bradley Hamilton, Grace asked. Fourteen, sir, Annalise Veneer replied. There are four partners, the rest are employees. So anyone from this firm would have access to information about Stony Farm and the Piscatorial Society, presumably? Grace quizzed. Presumably, sir, yes, she replied. Grace felt excited. At last he had something concrete to work on now, and his instincts were telling him that while the perpetrator was not necessarily part of this accountancy firm, there was the possibility of a lead coming from here. So we can't be sure Eric Whiteley would be the only one in the firm who knows where the lake is. No, sir, but certainly he's the only one who visits Stonery Farm on a regular basis. And that's the only match you have, the only person common to both? Yes, it is, sir. Is the club secretary able to tell you anything about this, Eric Whiteley? Not much, sir. Says he's a quiet, unassuming man who just turns up at the secretary's house every year, by appointment, to get the paperwork signed off. He doesn't talk much, apparently. OK. First things first, we should interview everyone in the firm who's been there more than six months. I want two trained interviewers. He looked at the faces around him. Glenn raised a hand. Boss, I'd like to suggest Bella and I do the interview. Big if, but if this Eric Whiteley or anyone else at the accountancy firm should turn out to be the perp, he might react and be thrown a bit by having seen us on Crime Watch. Grace nodded assent. Both detectives were trained cognitive suspect interviewers. He doesn't sound a very likely candidate, but the link between the two places is interesting. He looked down at his notes, then at Norman Potting. Miles Royce, Norman. You're expecting DNA results back from the lab later today? I am indeed, boss. Let me know as soon as you hear. I will indeed. Glenn Branson stared at Potting, still trying to figure out what on earth Bellamoy could see in the man. Twenty years her senior, charmless, and, despite his recent makeover, not in any way physically appealing. At least not in his view. Although, to be fair, he had been married four times— so presumably he had something that was not immediately apparent. David Green, the crime scene manager, reported on the progress that Sockos and the specialist search unit were making, looking for the missing head in the area around the West Sussex Piscatorial Society. Or rather, the lack of progress. This morning he'd instructed them to widen the search parameters. That was not good news, Grace thought. Although from experience he knew that there was always the possibility that the head, if buried on dry land, could have been carried off by a fox or a badger. Perps often spent hours digging deep graves for their victims, but these tended to preserve the bodies quite well. It was shallow graves that caused much bigger problems for murder investigation teams, because all kinds of animals would carry the remains away for food and nests, dispersing them over a wide area. He drew a circle on his pad around the name Eric Whiteley. So far their only suspect. He looked forward to the interview report. After the meeting ended, he headed back to his office and phoned Victoria Summers, the mother of his goddaughter, wondering if Jay might like to play with Gaia's son. 
She was a few years older than Rowan Lafayette, but from the tone of her mother's voice that did not matter remotely. She sounded thrilled to bits. One very small problem sorted, and brownie points for himself all round. Chapter 78 He felt ridiculous. He had a pretty good idea that he looked ridiculous too, and he was perspiring heavily. He was in goddamn agony. The waist of the jacket was far too tight for him. The crutch of the cream pantaloons was crushing his balls, and the boots the idiot wardrobe woman had crammed his feet into were at least two sizes too small and crippling his toes. His wig felt like he was wearing a straw bird's nest. He should be spending his last days on a sun lounge or on a yacht in the Caribbean, drinking mojitos, surrounded by nubile young women. This was so wrong. The story of his fucking life, screwed all the time. The goddamn movie business, goddamn television, screwed by each of his agents, and now this final insult. Brooker Brody Productions stealing his story, the best damn thing he'd written in his life. And instead of basking in glory, he was sweating in tights and an itchy wig. You're going to be sorry, so sorry, all of you, all fucking yes. That bitch who'd been rude to him on Saturday was going to be sorry too. He was looking around for her, but hadn't seen her so far. He had plans for her. That was the great thing about dying. You no longer had to give a shit. But first he had to focus. The task ahead. He had a copy of the production schedule. It gave him every day shooting on location in Brighton, inside and outside the pavilion, depending on the weather. Outside during the daytime, weather permitting, inside but it was closed to the public. Tomorrow, after it was closed, they were starting shooting the scene in the banqueting room, when George the Fourth ended his relationship with Maria Fitzherbert, telling her she was history. The king would tell her, while they were sitting beneath the chandelier, that he was always scared of. Hollywood stars Judd Halpin and Gaia seated beneath that chandelier. How great would it be to have it crash down on both of them? He could imagine the headlines around the world the next day. Two legends dead. How are you going to feel about that, Larry Brooker? Maxime Brody, bet you'll be sorry you ripped off my treatment, won't you? All your dreams shattered like the crystals of the chandelier. See, I'm pretty poetic, really. Know what I'm saying? The bus, packed full of costumed extras, moved off, pulling out through the gates of Brighton Racecourse and onto the road. It turned left, down the hill, heading towards the sea, and then the pavilion. Drayton Wheeler clutched the small rucksack tightly. It contained his change of clothes, drinking water, food, torch, a glass San Pellegrino bottle filled with a mercuric chloride acid cocktail he had very carefully mixed, and a towel from the hotel bathroom. When he focused on the task ahead and forgot all about his outfit, he felt a lot better. Oh, yes. He felt extremely happy. Chapter 79 the bloody woman was pestering him again. Angela McNeil was managing to find an excuse to come into Eric Whiteley's office almost every lunchtime now, on some pretext or other. He tried ignoring her, but she wasn't the kind of person who would even notice she was being ignored. Today she was holding a clutch of bound annual accounts for Stonery Farm, which had been returned by a Sussex police financial investigator called Emily Curtis, wanting to replace them in their correct filing cabinet. There was no urgency on this, Eric knew— she could have done it at any time, but she chose his lunch hour, deliberately. Angela McNeil stood over him, looking down at the tuna mayo sandwich, twixt by her apple and bottle of sparkling water. May, you're a real creature of habit, aren't you, Eric Whiteley? He concentrated on reading the Argus newspaper open in front of him. They conveniently printed the entire production shooting schedule so that the public could know where to go and watch. The production was still appealing for more extras for some crowd scenes. They'd asked him to turn up this morning, but of course he couldn't, not today, not during a weekday, except in his holidays. But the next days off he had booked were not until September. You always have exactly the same lunch. He wasn't sure whether it was a question or just a comment. Either way, he didn't care, and it was none of her business. He didn't like her voice. It was a charmless, flat monotone. He didn't care for the way she smelled, either. She wore a scent that smelled like toilet air freshener. He hated the way she stood over him, watching him feed like he was some creature in a zoo. He could imagine her being the kind of woman a husband would want to murder. That's what I like, 
he mumbled without looking up at her, and realized he had now reread the same sentence three times. It's important to vary your diet, you know, Eric. There's a lot of mercury in fish. Too much fish is bad for you. Well, I'm a bit of a fishy character. Oh, you've got a wicked sense of humour, haven't you? I can tell. He wished he'd kept his mouth shut. Then he silently prayed that if he were ever in his life unfortunate enough to get stuck in a lift with someone, it wouldn't be her. His phone rang. Saved by the bell, he thought, picking it up. It was the receptionist. Her voice sounded strange. Oh, Eric, um, there's a gentleman and a lady who'd like to speak to you in the conference room. Really? Well, what about? We don't have any appointments today. In fact, he very rarely had appointments. He mostly worked alone, crunching numbers. It was other people in this firm who regularly dealt with the clients. The only meetings he ever had were the occasional ones with inspectors from the HM Revenue and Customs probing into the finances of clients, and when he was auditing. They're, they're, they're police officers, detectives. They're interviewing everyone in the firm. Ah. Oh. He frowned. Shall I come down? Right away, if you could, please. Yes. Good, right. He stood up and put on his jacket. I'm sorry, he said to Angela McNeil. I, um, my appointment's here. I have to go to the conference room. Aren't you going to finish your lunch first? I'll have it afterwards. Would you like me to put your sandwich in the fridge? You shouldn't leave it out. You could get salmonella. Well, a bit of salmonella would go rather nicely with tuna, he said, and escaped from the room, leaving Angela to laugh at his joke. As he walked along the corridor, he wondered what this could be about. Had they found the bicycle he had stolen two years ago? Somehow he didn't think they'd be interviewing everyone in the firm about that. He entered the small conference room with its eight-seater table with a breezy smile but feeling nervous. A tall black man in a flashy suit and even flashier tie stood there. Next to him was a rather plain-looking woman in her mid-thirties, with tangled brown hair wearing a white blouse, black trousers and utilitarian black shoes. "'Good afternoon,' he said. He could feel beads of sweat popping on his brow. Police always had that effect on him. He noticed the male officer peering down at his feet for a moment. Eric Whiteley. The man produced a Warren card. I am active Detective Inspector Branson, and this is my colleague, Detective Sergeant Moy. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Eric studied his Warren card for some moments, because he felt he should, to look like he was taking this meeting seriously. Then he said expansively, Please, have a seat. Can I offer you any refreshments? Thank you, the acting D.I. said. We've already been looked after. Good, Eric said. Well, that's good, isn't it? He noticed a quick exchange of glances between the two officers. The two detectives sat on one side of the table, with their backs to the window with its view out across the pavilion grounds, and he sat opposite them. Immediately he realised he was in a bad position— because the strong afternoon light from the brilliant blue sky was directly behind them, making it hard to see their faces clearly. He felt intimidated, like sitting in front of two school bullies. Um, I don't suppose you've come about my bicycle? Both of them looked at him strangely. Bicycle? the woman asked. I had it stolen from outside, a long time ago now. The bastards cut through the padlock. No, I'm sorry. Branson said. That would be local uniform or CID. We're from the major crime branch. Oh. Eric nodded approvingly. The detective was staring very hard at his face, eyeball to eyeball, which made Eric feel even more uncomfortable. As if at any moment he was about to say, Ubu, useless, boring, ugly. Instead, he said, Mr. Whiteley, we're making inquiries regarding the murder of an as yet unidentified body, the torso of which was found at Stonery Farm. Eric interrupted. Yes, Bellamoy said. Correct, Branson confirmed. There were also body parts, which belonged to this same body recovered from the West Sussex Piscatorial Society Trout Lake near Henfield. Eric nodded. Yes, yes, I thought you'd be getting round to me eventually. He gave a nervous laugh, but neither detective smiled. How long have you worked here, Mr. Whiteley? Glenn Branson asked. 
He thought for a moment. But feline Bradley Hamilton, um, twenty-two years. Well, it'll be twenty-three in November. And what exactly is your role here? I do company audits, mostly. The detective was still eyeballing him, without blinking. Would I be correct in saying you carried out the audits this year on Stonery Farm, and on the West Sussex Piscatorial Society? Something fishy about the West Sussex Piscatorial Society, is there, detective? He giggled nervously at his joke. Neither of them smiled, which made him even more nervous. Nothing fishy at all, Mr. Whiteley, he replied levelly. Could you tell us how long you've been auditing these two? Whiteley thought for some moments. Well, some years. He looked down. He was feeling increasingly intimidated. Yes, um, ten years at least. I can check if you'd like. With Stonery Farm I could tell you exactly. He giggled again and was met with stony glares. We're investigating a murder, Mr. Whiteley. Glen Branson said. I'm afraid we don't quite share your humour on this. Have you ever been to the premises of Stonery Farm, Mr. Whiteley? Every year I do some of the accounts work on site. And you've been to the West Sussex Piscatorial Society, Trout Lake? Only once, just to familiarise myself with the location. It's the club's main asset, but I carry out the audit work for the club here. It's very straightforward. Does anyone else from this firm accompany you when you audit Stonery Farm? He shook his head. No. No, I get on very well with Mr. Winter, the owner. It's a, a job for one person, really. His armpits were damp. He was sweating profusely now, and still could not see their faces clearly. He wanted to get back to his office, to his solitude, and his lunch and his newspaper. This murder's a terrible thing, he went on. I mean, there could be a bad impact on Stony Farm's business. I mean, would you want to eat free-range eggs from hens that have been feeding in an area where there was a corpse? I'm not sure I would. Or eat fish that have been feeding where human body parts were found? The woman detective asked. Whiteley nodded. That's very creepy, if you ask me. He giggled again, then looked at the two faces glaring at him, at the two bullies, two unsmiling bullies. I'm very careful what I put in my mouth, what I eat. My body is my temple. Kramer versus Kramer, Branson said. Pardon me? Dustin Hoffman said that in the movie. Oh, oh, right. There was a brief silence, which Eric Whiteley found increasingly awkward. The two detectives stared at him as if he were a book they were reading. Clearing his throat, he said, Um, so, how do you feel that I can, you know, assist in your inquiries? He grinned again from nerves. Well, Glen Branson said, it might help if you stopped finding this so funny, Mr. Whiteley. Sorry. Eric ran his fingers across his lips. Zipped. There was a long silence again. He felt the two detectives just simply staring at him, as if their eyes were full of unasked questions. He squirmed in his chair. He was hungry. He wished he'd eaten his sandwich now, and the Twix, but at the same time his stomach was feeling unsettled. He glanced at his watch. His lunch hour was running out, ten minutes left. Got a bus to catch? Glen Branson asked. Or a train? I'm sorry, I'm not with you. You keep looking at your watch. Yes, well, I am a bit worried about salmonella. You see, you need to be careful with sandwiches in this heat. Once more he clocked the two detectives exchanging a glance. Like some secret code. Like school bullies. Branson looked directly at him again, staring into his eyes. Does the name Miles Royce mean anything to you? He didn't like the bullying stare from the detective, and looked down at the table. Miles Royce, no? No, I don't think so, why? You don't think so? Glen Branson asked. You don't think so, or are you certain? The detective's manner was making him agitated. He was feeling flushed again, his face getting hot. He wanted to be out of this room and back in the sanctuary of his own office. How certain can any of us be of anything in life? Eric replied, eyes still fixed on the table. I don't want to give you a wrong answer. This firm deals with lots of clients, and each of them in turn employs lots of people. The name doesn't mean anything to me today, but I can't guarantee I've never met someone of that name. 
I wouldn't want to be accused of misleading you. I'm not exactly clear, Glenn said, speaking very slowly and firmly. Are you saying you've never met someone by the name of Miles Royce? Miles Terence Royce? Eric closed his eyes for some moments. He was shaking. Then he glared defiantly back at Branson. I will not be bullied. Do I make myself clear? Chapter 80 As Drayton Wheeler clambered down the steps of the coach into the blazing June sunshine, he was perspiring heavily, and his wig had become even itchier. A young man wearing a yellow tabard over a T-shirt and ripped jeans was bellowing through a megaphone. All extras proceed to the assembly area opposite the front entrance of the pavilion. The street was lined with production trucks, and there were heavy-duty cables trailing everywhere. A camera mounted on a dolly sat on a long length of track on the pavilion lawn. There were gantries of lights high up off the ground. Harris-looking grips and gaffers were working feverishly. The director of photography was standing near the camera, taking light measurements and issuing instructions to his crew. To the left... On the tarmac area in front of the dome was a cluster of large motorhomes with slide-outs, and it was easy to spot Gaia's, which was the size of a house, and Judd Halpin's, only marginally smaller, parked alongside it, power cables and water hoses trailing from each. A huge crowd of onlookers was gathered behind a tape cordon manned by several security guards. Gathered to watch the filming of scenes he had suggested, and which Brooker Brody Productions had stolen. Oh, they were going to be sorry. The young man, the third, fourth, or fifth assistant director, continued to bellow instructions. Drayton scowled. He shuffled along in the line of extras in their equally hot and uncomfortable costumes. A hawk-eyed young woman came running up to him, her hair in a messy ponytail, a headset with earpiece and microphone clipped to her head. "'Sorry,' she said, holding out her hand. "'You can't have that rucksack with you.' "'I'm a diabetic,' he snapped back. "'It has my medication.' Well, I'll look after it for you. If you need anything in it, just let me know. I'll be around. She reached for the bag, and he gripped it tightly. I'm not letting this out of my sight, young lady, OK? Uh, it's not OK. People in 1810 do not carry rucksacks. Wheeler pointed at the building. Yeah? Well, let me tell you something. You see that building? Or, or the pavilion? Uh-huh. You're telling me rucksacks didn't exist in 1810? That's right. Yeah, well, let me tell you something else. This goddamn fucking royal pavilion didn't exist in 1810 either. Well, she said, smiling, unfazed, this is a movie. You have to cut a little slack here and there and take some license with exact dates. Gripping his rucksack tightly in his fist, he said, Yeah, yeah, right, well, that's what I'm doing too. I'm cutting a little slack, so fuck off. They glared at each other for some moments. Okay, she said. I'll be right back. He watched her hurry off. Then he hastily pushed his way past the long line of costumed extras in front of him and reached the front entrance of the pavilion. A security guard stepped into his path. Sorry, sir, ticket holders only. I have to use the toilet, Drayton Wheeler said. The guard pointed to his left, towards the catering truck and the cluster of motorhomes. The toilet facilities for extras are over there, sir. He pointed to the rucksack. The A.D. told me I could put my rucksack inside. I, I, I'm a diabetic, you see. She said I, I could store it in the back room where the wheelchairs are. I need to take a shot. The guard frowned. Then, conspiratorially, he said, OK, be quick. Wheeler thanked him and hurried inside. The corridor was deserted. He stopped by the closed, ochre-painted half-gate at the top of the stone staircase that led down into the basement of the building and looked around. No one in sight. He slipped the bolt as he had done previously, closed the gate behind him, then descended the steps and hurried along the underground brick-floored corridor. He stopped outside the decrepit green door, with the yellow and black Danger High Voltage sign, and yanked it open. He stepped inside, into the familiar fusty smell, and pulled the door shut behind him. Then he flicked on his torch. He checked out the wall of fuses and electrical switchgear, and the pipework, that looked like it was lagged in asbestos. A pair of bright red eyes shone back. A rat the size of a small cat. Then with a scratching, scurrying sound it was gone. Fuck you! 
He shone the torch around, checking every crevice, listening to the humming sound and the rhythmic click-tick-click-tick of the electrics. It felt even warmer in here than before. He shone the torch around again, warily. He hated rats. He hated spiders. He hated enclosed spaces. In six months' time, his body would be in an enclosed space, a coffin. He smiled. The last laugh. Oh, yes, he'd have that all right. He'd left instructions in his will for his ashes to be flushed down the toilet of Brooker Brody Productions offices on the Universal Studio lot. As he pulled off his horrible wig and wriggled out of the rest of his clothes, he just hoped there was an afterlife so that he could get to witness it. Particularly to see the face of that bitch, his not-quite-ex-wife, when she heard about those instructions. He opened his rucksack and started to take out his normal clothes and provisions. OK, so this wasn't the greatest place to spend the next twenty-four hours, and they didn't do room service. But compared to the coffin awaiting him in six months' time, this was a suite at the Ritz-Carlton. Chapter 81 the time is 6.30pm, Monday the 13th of June. This is the 18th briefing of Operation Icon, Roy Grace said to his team. We've made some good progress since this morning. He turned to Potting. Norman. Potting had a smug smile on his face that made him look like a gross Buddha, Glen Branson thought, staring at the old war horse, still unable to believe this man was now unknowingly his love rival. We have a report back from the lab, Potting said smugly in his rural burr. The DNA from the airbrush and toothbrush I took from the home of Miles Royce matches the DNA from the torso recovered from Story Farm and the limbs recovered from the West Sussex Piscatorial Society. No question. It's the same person. The atmosphere in the room changed perceptibly. Good work, Norman, Grace said. OK, we need to do our background on the victim. Norman, as you've already met the mother, you should take a family liaison officer with you and break the news. See what further information you can find out from her about his friends and associates. Get the mother's permission to search his house. In particular, let's see if he left a computer or mobile phone, and hopefully both. If his mobile phone isn't there, ask his mother for his number, and we can still get most of what we need from his service provider. We can get cell site analysis done on his movements, and we can see who he talked to. He paused and made a note. If he owned a car, let's get its movement history over the past 18 months off the ANPR network. Also see what photographs he has in his house of other people, who his friends were and who he admired. I'll get the high-tech crime unit to hunt on social networking sites, see if he tweeted, had a Facebook page, LinkedIn, any of those. We need to know everything about him, who he engaged with, where he went to socialise, what hobbies or kinky perversions he was into, what clubs he was a member of. In particular, I want to know more about his Geyer obsession and any fan clubs he'd joined. OK, Norman, that's your action. Yes, Chief. Glenn looked at Potting, then at Bella. She looked so sad today, yet he knew how he could make her happy, if he could get that prat Potting out of the way. Was he being ridiculous? His own life was a total mess, and maybe it was totally wrong to start thinking about messing with someone else's. Glenn? Uh, right, boss, me and Bella interviewed all 14 staff members of the chartered accountancy firm Feline Bradley Hamilton today. This is the only company we've found that has links with both Stonery Farm and the West Sussex Piscatorial Society. The firm's made a specialist accountancy practice in farming and outdoors pursuits, and it's created its own software package for farmers. During this process, we encountered one person we're not happy about and we feel should be looked into further. He glanced at his notes. His name is Eric Whiteley. Well, tell me your reasons, Grace said. Well, I used your right eye, left eye technique that you taught me. Grace nodded. Human brains were divided into left and right hemispheres. One contained long-term memory storage, and in the other the creative processes took place. When asked a question, people's eyes almost invariably moved to the hemisphere they were using. In some people the memory storage was in the right hemisphere, and in some the left. The creative hemisphere would be the opposite one. When people were telling the truth, their eyes would swing towards the memory hemisphere. When they lied, towards the creative one, to construct. Branson had learned from Roy Grace to tell which, by tracking their eyes in response to a simple control question, such as the one he'd asked Eric Whiteley earlier, about how long he'd worked for the firm. 
to which there would have been no need for him to have lied. And? Roy Grace asked. It's my view he was lying to us. Grace turned to Bella. What did you think? I agree, sir. White is an oddball. I wasn't at all happy with how he responded to our questions. Grace made a note on his pad. Eric Whiteley. Person of interest? Did you get his home address? Yes, Bella said, with difficulty. Grace raised his eyebrows. Oh? He kept trying to tell us we were invading his privacy, Branson said. I think you two should go to his house and talk to him again there. Sounds like we need to either bring him in or eliminate him from our inquiries. The problem, he knew, with not having a time or date of Royce's death, is that all the team were working in a vacuum. When there was a clearly established time of death, alibis were often a fast and efficient way to eliminate people like Whiteley, or incriminate them. He turned to his homes, home office large major inquiry system, and intelligence researchers. I want you to check the serials going back two years and see if any of Whiteley's neighbours have ever complained about him. See if he's been involved in any incidents. We need more information on him. Then he said to Bella, I think you should have a word with Whiteley's senior partner and find out what kind of employee he is. I have a call into him already, sir. Good. Then he turned to D.C. Exton. The Hunter Wellington boots, anything to report from the stockists? He pointed up at the trio of whiteboards. One board showed a photograph of Stonery Farm, circled in blue marker ink, and a photograph of the West Sussex Piscatorial Society Trout Lake, also circled in blue, with a line connecting them. A second showed photographs of a hunter boot, and three photographs of the actual size prints found around the edge of the trout lake. The third board had photographs of the torso and limbs of Miles Royce, and now, just added today, his face. I've obtained a list of online retailers, Exton said. We've been working through these, compiling a list of names of customers they've supplied in our parameter area of Sussex, Surrey and Kent in the past two years. But the problem, as we know, with many stockists, like garden centres and outdoor wear shops, is many don't keep customer records. We're getting as much as we can through credit card records, but that's slow and incomplete. I've been feeding names as they come through to the indexer. He looked at Annelise Veneer. Nothing so far, she said. I've names from 16 stockists of people who made recent purchases, but no hits, and that includes Eric Whiteley. Grace had worked with her on several murder inquiries and knew just how thorough she was. If she said no hits, she meant it. He looked at his notes. Hayden, how are you doing on gait analysis? I've completed my computer modelling. I won't bore you with the technical data, but analysis of these prints show our perp has a very unusual gait. I'm confident I could pick him out in a crowd. I could spend a few days in the CCTV control room at John Street, if you like. Brighton and Hove have one of the most comprehensive CCTV networks of any city. This was helped by the fact that the English Channel bordered the south, giving a relatively narrow arc to the east, north and west. But the problem, as Grace saw it, was which crowd? Hayden Kelly was on an expensive daily rate. He couldn't just sit him down in front of a bank of television monitors and have him observe real-time footage in the hope of spotting the perp, when there were no guarantees that Miles Royce's killer was even in the city. He looked up at the dead man's photograph. Royce was fifty-two, his mother had told Potting. He looked a little younger in Grace's view. The unfortunate man had not been blessed with great looks. He had a rather weak, flaccid face with bulging eyes, as if he had a thyroid problem, protruding lips, a squat nose and a shapeless mop of dark brown hair with the unnatural flat tones of a bad dye job. A trustafarian, modest inherited wealth, never had to do a day's work in his life, just dabbled in property from time to time. From the expression he wore in his photograph, he sure as hell did not look happy, Grace thought. So how did you end up like this? Your torso covered in quicklime and immersed in chicken shit, your limbs in a trout lake, and your head missing. You know what, Chief? Norman Potting said, as if reading his mind. If we could just find his head, maybe he could tell us who did it. There was tittering in the room. Roy Grace did his best to keep a straight face, but after some moments he allowed himself a grin. In all the murder inquiries he'd attended, and more recently had run, he could not remember a single one where there had been less information about the victim or the suspected perpetrator. In two hours' time, he had to attend a press conference with Glenn. If they put over their messages correctly, 
It could lead to a crucial witness either phoning the police directly or the Crime Stoppers line anonymously. The enormity of his responsibility never escaped him. Miles Royce was his mother's only child. He was her life. For over thirty years after leaving home, he went to see her every week, and phoned her every Sunday evening at seven, without fail. Now he hadn't phoned for almost six months, and he wouldn't be phoning ever again. What had he done to deserve ending up dead, and with such appalling lack of dignity? Who had done this to him, and why? Was the motive sexual? Jealousy? Robbery? Homophobia? A random psychotic attack? Revenge? An argument that turned into a fight? He looked at his team. Which of you are Gaia fans? Several hands shot up. He looked at Emma Reeves, who seemed the keenest. Am I right that Gaia includes a bit of s and in her work here? Yeah? Uh, yes, Chief, but only in a fun way in one of her acts, and on one of her album covers. Are we missing something very obvious here? Did she ever write a song about dismemberment, or have some sick art about it that someone might have copied? I know everything she's done, sir, Emma Reeves said. That makes me a bit sad, doesn't it? Grace smiled. Not at all. But there's nothing I can think of in her work that would send some sicko off to dismember someone. After the briefing ended, Grace returned to his office and made a new entry in his policy book. Homophobic murder? Blackmail of a gay lover? Criminal involvement? Witness something? Drug steal at a gay cruising site? His phone rang. He looked down at the display and did not recognize the number. He stepped out into the corridor as he answered it. The voice of the caller was low and furtive. Detective Superintendent Grace? Grace didn't need to ask who was calling. He recognized the voice of the recidivist and informer, Darren Spicer. Yeah, how can I help you? Got some information for you. You can have this for free. That's very generous. Yeah, thought you'd like to know. That deal I was offered, what we discussed. Uh-huh. Your friend's just come back to me and doubled it for me to do that job. Chapter 82 Drayton Wheeler lay curled up on the floor, listening to Mozart's Figaro Overture on his iPod earphones. It was Mozart's music which had sustained him through all the shit in his life. Mozart lifted him to the heavens, when the time finally came, he didn't want some fucking priest holding his hand. He wanted to be alone, listening to this. He looked at his watch, munching on the cheese sandwich he'd selected from his rations. Midnight. It would be safe to move into position now. He'd figured out the security guard's rotor in here during the small hours. He finished eating, switched off the iPod and drank some water. He removed the iron tire lever from his rucksack and scooped everything else back into it apart from the torch then stood up and hauled it onto his shoulders, shaking the cramp from his legs. Then he relieved himself in a corner. When he'd finished, he slowly and cautiously pushed open the heavy door and stepped out, looking in both directions. Just darkness. No one there. Holding the tire lever in his right hand and the torch switched on in his left, he made his way along the passage, passing old pipework, a modern red fire hose reel, and three rickety old antique chairs with broken wicker seats. He felt nervous. So close now. He had to succeed. Had to. He switched the torch off, held his breath, then, knowing there'd be security guards prowling around above him, inched his way up the steps in the darkness until he reached the half-gate. Footsteps. Shit! He crouched, heart pounding, pulse tugging at the base of his wrist, as if it were a small creature trying to get out. He gripped the tire lever tightly. Rubber-soled shoes clumping along, the sound of jangling keys. Then, whistling, the Harry Lime theme. The whistle of someone who was nervous, whistling badly, missing several of the notes. Was the guard nervous of this place at night? Just don't come down here. To his relief, the footsteps faded into the distance and were gone. But he stayed crouched for several more seconds, listening. A walk of twenty feet, not covered by any sensor, would take him to the door which opened onto the stairs up to the long deserted apartment beneath the dome. He slipped the bolt, 
pulled open the gate and stepped out into the hallway, holding his breath, listening intently. Total silence. He pulled the gate shut and slid the bolt back into place, flicked on the torch for an instant to get his bearings, and then off again. He walked on tiptoe, passing a sign which pointed to toilets, pulled open the door, stepped inside and pulled it shut behind him. Then, switching on the torch and guided by the beam, he climbed up the long, steep, spiral staircase with the rickety banisters, pausing for breath halfway up. Shadows jumped around him. This place was probably full of ghosts. So what? He'd be one soon, too. The dead had never bothered him. Ghosts weren't scumbags like some of the living. He reached the top and entered the old abandoned apartment beneath the dome. A door lay against a wall. There were dust sheets over uneven angular shapes, horrible mottled wallpaper, dusty oval lead-lighted windows with views out across the street lights, shadows and orange permaglow of the city at night, and the vast black expanse of the sea. A mouse, or a rat, scampered away, feet scratching on the bare boards. The air smelt dusty and dank. He felt tired. The coffee in his flask had long gone cold. He'd have liked to lie down on the floor and sleep, but he didn't dare. It'd be dawn in a few hours. He needed to get into place under the cover of darkness. He stepped carefully across the circular room, passing the trap door secured by two bolts, with the wording on it, Danger! Steep drop below! Do not stand on door! Accompanied by the image in purple of a falling man. He kept the beam of his torch low, just in case anyone was looking up in this direction, and walked through a doorway into what had once been another bedroom, with everything in here also shrouded in dust sheets. In front of him was a wall covered in graffiti. One in swirly writing said, J. Cook, 1920. There was a drawing of an owl, another drawing of a shield, another read, R. B., 1906. To the left was a small door, barely bigger than a hatch, he knelt, slid the bolts, and pushed it open. The cool, blustery night air with its fresh, salty tang engulfed him, and he breathed it in greedily, gulping it into his lungs, a relief from the stale air inside. He removed his rucksack and pushed it through, then eased himself out, hauled himself to his feet, and carefully pushed the door shut. He was standing on a narrow steel platform with a handrail, with the wind tugging at him. A long way below, Directly in front of him was the dark area of the pavilion grounds, and the shadows of the motorhomes of the stars and the production trucks. In the glow of the street lighting, and through the swaying branches of the trees, he could see the Theatre Royal and the restaurant shops and offices of New Road, and beyond, the dark uneven rooftops of sleeping Brighton. Around him, up here on the roof, were turrets, minarets, chimney stacks, and chimney pots, and a network of walkways and metal-rung ladders fixed to walls. There was enough ambient light here to see where he was going without using his torch. He set off, walking along a steel platform between two pitched slate roofs, with skylights along one side, carefully gripping the handrail. He'd memorized the plans, but even so, now he was up here, he found it hard to get his bearings. There was a faint traffic hum below him. Then the distant Doppler wail of a siren stopped him for an instant, in panic. But it ripped on past, and faded. The dome above the banqueting room, which was his target, lay directly ahead of him. One more walkway, then he scaled a short metal ladder and hauled himself up onto another walkway. His tiredness was evaporating, and he was starting to feel really good. Invincible. Yea, though I walk alone through the shadow of the valley of death, I shall fear no evil, for I am the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. Oh, yes! No one messes with Drayton Wheeler. No one messes with the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. One more ladder. His rucksack swung right, pulling him over, but he hung on grimly. Three limbs on a ladder at all times. That was the rule you had to remember. One hand, two legs, two hands, one leg. He climbed onto the narrow platform, and the dome curved up towards the sky majestically, steep as a mountain right in front of him now. He switched on his torch for a few seconds, saw the tiny inspection hatch door, and switched it off again. He opened it again, pushed his rucksack through in front of him, then he crawled forwards, and through it, 
onto the first two steps of a wooden staircase into pitch darkness. Switching on the torch again, he pulled the door shut behind him. His whole body was pounding. He was shorting out with excitement. Oh, yes, baby. Oh, yes. He could safely keep the torch on now. He crawled forward, up several more steps, then onto a wooden platform. The interior of the dome mirrored the exterior like a second skin. The exterior was rendered in carved stone, but the interior frame was constructed from wooden slats like a concave ladder. There was no point in climbing it now. He knew from his previous recce because it got progressively steeper. He'd be more comfortable staying here on this platform. If the production stuck to its schedule tomorrow, after the Royal Pavilion closed to the public, Brooker Brody Productions would start filming one of the key scenes in the movie. His movie. King George IV and Mrs. Fitzherbert sitting at the banqueting table, directly beneath the massive chandelier that His Majesty was so nervous of. The fixings supporting the chandelier were directly above him. A two-minute climb. From the top he could look down through a tiny crack at the top of the chandelier and almost the whole of the room. With luck, if he got his timings right, Guy Lafayette and Judd Halpin would be pulped. That would put an end to the ridiculous travesty that Brooker Brody Productions had written into the script about Maria Fitzherbert committing suicide after being dumped by the king. Much better for her to die like this. Chapter 83 At 1.30 a.m., Roy Grace, snuggled up against Cleo, was woken by a solid kick in his ribs. Oh, he said, for an instant thinking it was Cleo giving him a dig with her elbow, which she did on the rare occasions when he snored. But she seemed to be sound asleep. Then he felt another kick. It was the baby. Then another kick. Without moving, Cleo murmured, I think Bump's practising for the London Marathon. He hasn't stopped. Grace felt another sudden movement, but gentler this time. He said quietly, Hey, Bump, do you mind? I need some sleep. We all need to get some sleep, OK? Not sure I can remember what sleep is any more, Cleo said. I've got terrible heartburn, and I've been to the loo four times. I didn't hear you. Oh, you were well away. I was. Didn't feel like it. I don't feel like I've slept a wink either. He kissed her on the cheek. I'm wired, she said. I'm so wide awake I could do some studying. Don't. Try to rest. I can't take sleeping pills. I can't have a drink. God, you're so lucky you're a man. Then she felt the baby move again, and she smiled. She placed Roy's hand on her abdomen. It's amazing, isn't it? That's a mini ass in there. I definitely think it's a boy. Everyone's telling me I look like I'm carrying a boy. You'd prefer a boy, wouldn't you? All I want is for you and our child to be healthy. I'll love it just as much whether it's a boy or a girl. She slipped out of bed and padded to the loo. He lay there, his mind a tangle of thoughts suddenly. The enormity of what it meant to bring a child into the world. And tragic Miles Royce, an example of what could happen to a child. He closed his eyes and concentrated on the case. With every major inquiry, he always fretted that he might be overlooking something vital and obvious. What was he overlooking here? I found several baby car seats on the internet, Cleo said, returning from the loo. Car seats? We need one. Oh, of course. Yet another thing to add to the never-ending list of stuff they had to have, and never-ending cost. Do you think we should get a new one? or buy one on eBay. Be a fraction of the cost. He squeezed her hand. What are we talking about in potential savings? Hundred and fifty pounds, maybe? Well, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. Back in his days in uniform, he'd attended some terrible car crashes. One he'd never forgotten, where a baby strapped into a car seat that had sheared from its mountings in a head-on collision, smashed into the back of his mother's head, breaking her neck and killing her instantly, and then hitting the front windscreen. "'Let me ask you a question, darling,' he said. "'If you were going to jump out of an aeroplane wearing a parachute, would you rather know that the parachute you had on your back had been bought because it was the cheapest available on the market, or because it was the best?' She squeezed his hand. 
are the best, of course. So, there's your answer. We're talking about our baby's life. It wouldn't be much of a bargain if it turned out to have stress fractures from involvement in a previous accident. Being a detective makes you so suspicious, doesn't it? I was born suspicious, he said. Maybe I have my dad to thank. That's my view. He lapsed back into his own troubled thoughts. Amos Smallbone's intention to rob Gaia. Well, good luck, sunshine. No one was going to get past the goons guarding her suite. He'd notified Chief Superintendent Barrington, and the number of officers guarding her had been increased as an extra precaution. Then his brain switched back to Miles Royce. At least now they had a name. But one thing was going around and around in his mind. Royce had been a Gaia fan. Gaia was now here in Brighton. Someone had tried to kill her in Los Angeles. She'd been sent death threats through an anonymous email account. The LAPD had the suspect in custody. They were convinced they had the perp. Was he reading too much into Royce being a Gaia fan? Every major crime inquiry was a hugely complex puzzle, thousands of pieces to be fitted painstakingly together. Except, when the puzzle was complete, there were never happy, smiling faces. Just the grim satisfaction of knowing they'd achieved justice for the victim, and possibly some closure for the family. Provided, of course, he got a conviction. There was a documentary on the box tonight about Gaia. Cleo murmured suddenly. There was? Did you watch it? Not really my thing, but I recorded it, in case it was helpful for you. Thanks, he said. I'll watch it tomorrow. You're an angel. I know, she said. Never forget that, Detective Superintendent. He kissed her, then slowly fell into troubled sleep. Chapter 84 At one forty-five a.m., Anna Galicia walked along New Road Brighton, across the street from the Theatre Royal, wearing a bomber jacket and jeans, and a baseball cap pulled on tight against the blustery wind. She stopped by a low wall, screened by some shrubs, watching the activity in the Royal Pavilion grounds wind down for the night. Two police officers strode along the pavement, and she turned her face away from them. There was a tantalising smell of frying bacon coming from the catering truck that still appeared to be open. A short while ago, Burning with hatred, she'd watch Gaia leave her swanky trailer and step up into the back of a black Range Rover. The car had swept out of the grounds in a presidential-style convoy of identical vehicles. "'You don't care about the environment, really, do you, Gaia?' Anna thought, her anger tinged with sadness. "'Your whole persona, your act, and even your bloody name, is all a lie, isn't it?' Do you really need five Range Rovers just to transport you less than half a mile from the set to your hotel and back? Do you? You're such a hypocrite. Someone has to teach you a lesson. Then Judd Halpin, Gaia's co-star playing King George IV, emerged from his trailer. He was looking the worse for wear from drink, or drugs in all probability, and had to be helped down the step by two minions and guided into the back of a Jaguar. A security guard, standing outside the main entrance, lit a cigarette. She watched it glow bright red for an instant. Several other vehicles also left, carrying away, presumably, some of the supporting cast and senior crew. A number of unit members were still working, switching off lights on stands and humping equipment around. She stepped forward and walked nonchalantly across the pavilion lawns, being careful not to trip over any cables. No one appeared to take any notice of her. Good. She made her way over to the cluster of trucks and motorhomes, heading as discreetly as she could towards Gaia's trailer, which was parked close to the gatehouse building on Church Street. Just in case anyone had noticed her, she meandered as nonchalantly as she could towards the archway, as if she were just ordinary Joe taking a late-night stroll before bed. But just as she reached the shadows on the far side of Gaia's trailer, she ducked down, pulled her iPhone out of her handbag, then switched on the Torch app. She couldn't believe her luck. Legend had it that King George had had a secret underground passage built, connecting the Royal Pavilion with Maria Fitzherbert's house in the old Steiner, so that he and his mistress could have their trysts in secret. But this was not true. She knew from her research. There was a secret passage, but it was built by the King for a very different reason. It was because, an immensely vain man, 
he was embarrassed by how gross he'd become, weighing twenty stone, and did not want the public to see him. He could walk to the stables out of sight and enter his coach in privacy. All the public would see of him would be his face at the window. The stable block had been rebuilt by Queen Victoria and moved several feet to the north. The original exit from the secret passage was now a sealed trapdoor, overgrown with grass. Gaia's trader was parked, she could see from the slight marking on the grass, backed up almost on top of it. Deliberately? To make it up to her? It had to be a signal. How good was that? Then she walked stealthily around the vehicle. Rental mobile homes like this must have some kind of discreet advertising on them, she figured. Then she found it, on the front right, a square metal plate. A.D. Motorhomes Limited. Beneath was a website address, an email address and a phone number. She wrote down the company's number and the registration plate of the vehicle. Chapter 85 At the Tuesday morning briefing of Operation Icon, Bella Moy reported on her conversation with Stephen Feline, the senior partner of the accountancy firm where Eric Whiteley worked. Feline said that Whiteley was a bit of an oddball, who kept to himself, but an exemplary employee, hard-working and totally trustworthy. "'He's an oddball, all right,' Glenn Branson said. "'We went to his house after the briefing last night. He was obviously in. We saw someone moving behind the curtains, but no one answered his door. We rang the bell several times. Then we dialed his home number. Someone answered, sounded like him, and we told him we were outside. He hung up without saying anything. We rang back, and we could hear it ringing, and we saw curtains twitch upstairs, but it went to answer phone each time we tried ringing again. "'The behaviour of someone who has something to hide,' Grace said. "'With his reluctance to see us, me and Bella decided it'd be better to talk to his neighbours, see what we could find out about him before we tried him again.' "'And?' They confirmed he's one of those people who keeps himself to himself. A couple of them said they'd never seen him. One said she'd seen him several times go off to work on his bicycle and come home at night, and he's nodded at her a few times, but that's all. One said she's seen a tarty-looking woman come to the house a couple of times. Yeah, sounds like a cool girl, Grace said. He lives alone. Glenn Branson nodded. He looked down at his notebook, open on the first page of the interview with Whiteley. Well, the thing was, boss, we were focused on his work connection with Stony Farm and the Angling Club. That was a hard enough struggle. We didn't get much into his private life, but, yeah, definitely single. So none of the neighbours ever talked to Eric Whiteley? All the immediate neighbours we talked to are elderly. A couple of them are pretty infirm. All pleasant enough, but no one seems to know or care too much about anyone else. It's sort of a weird little enclave where he is. Grace made a note. This man is not making me feel all woman fuzzy. I want to know more about him. Why would he hide from you, unless he had something to conceal? He looked at Glenn, then pointedly at Bella. Any thoughts? I don't know, sir, she said. This is a murder inquiry, Bella. Don't know is not an answer I want to hear. Go back to his office in the morning and get in his face. Is that clear? Yes, sir, she said and blushed under his uncharacteristically withering glare. Grace turned to the indexer. Annalise, anything on your check on the serials about Eric Whiteley? I have one thing, sir. Almost two years ago exactly, he reported a bicycle theft from outside his office. There were a couple of sniggers, one from a recent addition to the team, D.C. Graham Bulldog, and the other from Guy Batchelor. Grace glared at them both. I'm sorry, he said. I don't find having a bicycle stolen funny. It may not be the kind of major crime we deal with in this branch, but if you have a bike you love that gets nicked, it's pretty distressing, OK? Both detectives nodded apologetically. It sounds like Whiteley was pretty difficult then. I spoke to DC Liz Spence at John Street, who was dealing with bicycle crime at the time. He was pretty aggressive towards Sir Everett, didn't feel the police were doing enough, that they should have made it their major priority. She was sufficiently concerned back then about his level of aggression to put background checks on him. And? Grace said. She shook her head. Nothing came up. If you want my opinion, sir, Bellamoy said abruptly, he's just a harmless shadow. Grace looked at her for some moments. You may be right, Bella, but you have to remember something. Criminals escalate. 
The sicko who starts off as a seemingly harmless flasher can turn into a serial rapist twenty years later. Yes, sir, I understand, she said. I didn't mean to be frivolous. Grace saw his blackberry was flashing red at him. New emails. He tapped to check them as he asked, Norman, anything back yet from the high-tech crime unit on Miles Royce's computer? No, chief, not so far. He glanced through the emails. The second was from the chief superintendent of Brighton Police, Graham Barrington. Roy, call me urgently after your briefing. Chapter 86 Drayton Wheeler looked at his watch. 9.03 a.m. Time was passing slowly. Ordinarily, with just six months or so left of it, he might have been grateful. But not up here, lying on this hard wooden floor inside the dome that supported the chandelier, surrounded by mouse droppings and goddamn seagulls screeching outside. The battery on his fucking Kindle was running out. In his calculations he hadn't figured that would happen, but he'd left the thing switched onto wireless, which ate up the battery life. Great! He had about nine hours to kill, and an hour of reading time left. So much for his ambition to finish war and peace before he died. He laughed. His own private joke. With six months to live, he had to be choosy about what he read. Did it matter what he had and hadn't read in his life? In six months' time, would anyone care that Drayton Wheeler had not read War and Peace? Nor anything by Dostoevsky, nor Proust. He hadn't read much Hardy, either. Just one Scott Fitzgerald, two Hemingways, all people you were supposed to read to make you a more rounded human being. And the more rounded you were, the easier it was for some bastard to stick a pin in you and deflate you. Well, he sure as hell would not be fretting about it in his grave. Fade to black, good riddance. At least today's Times had downloaded. He could cheer himself up for the last of the Kindle's battery life by reading all the shit that was going on in the world. Palestine, Libya, Iraq, Iran, North Korea. Hey, you know what? Sort yourself out, world. You're going to have to learn to get by without me. Dying. With every single one of his damned ambitions unfulfilled, thanks to people like Larry Brooker and Maxim Brody, who had screwed him. Everyone had screwed him. Life itself had screwed him. He was a genius. He knew that. He always had the ideas first, and some other bastard always got there before him, or stole them. He'd had the idea of writing about a child wizard. Fucking J.K. Rowling got hers out first. He'd had the idea about a young teenage girl falling in love with a vampire. Some Mormon called Stephanie Meyer wrote her books ahead of him. Now the king's lover. This time he knew no one was there ahead of him. He had the surefire formula, and it had been stolen from under his feet. Sue me. Oh, sure, Larry fucking Brooker, I could sue you. If I had a million bucks in the bank and ten years to live, I could wipe your ass for you with legal paperwork. He munched angrily through his breakfast of a stale Marks and Spencer's egg and bacon sandwich and an overripe apple washed down by cold coffee. Breakfast of Champions. He had that book on his Kindle, written by one of his favourite authors, Kurt Vonnegut. Vonnegut was a cynic, too. The book was all about a great visionary writer called Kilgore Trout, who found one of his science fiction novels being used as toilet paper in a motel lavatory. That was pretty much how Wheeler felt about his own career. He was a genius, constantly pissed on from a great height. Well, smug little baldy Larry Brooker and fat toad Maxine Brody, you're about to get pissed on from a great height back. Hope you're looking forward to shooting the banqueting scene tonight. I'm looking forward to it a lot. Chapter 87 The opening day of the Carl Venner trial at the Old Bailey had gone as well as could be expected. Roy Grace's case officer, Mike Gorringe, who was attending for the whole duration, had reported. The hearing was set to run for three weeks, and Grace would not be needed until the middle of next week at the earliest, which suited him well. He had plenty of other issues to deal with here in Sussex at the moment. The most pressing one, as he sat at his desk, staring at his computer screen, was the email Chief Superintendent Graham Barrington had just forwarded him. It had been sent to Guy's published email address last night, read by an assistant who vetted all of her fan mail and immediately forwarded to her head of security, Andrew Gully. I still cannot believe how you cut me dead. 
I thought your whole point in coming to England was to see me. I know you love me, really. You're going to be sorry you did that. Very sorry. You made me look a fool. You made people laugh at me. I'm going to give you the chance to apologize. You're soon going to be telling the whole world how much you love me. I will kill you if you don't. He rang Graham Barrington's direct line. It was answered instantly. What do you think, Roy? Even though Barrington had been a police officer for nearly thirty years, his voice was still full of an infectious, boyish enthusiasm, and Grace loved that because it was how he felt too, most days at any rate. Well, I guess we need to assess whether this is a harmless nutter or a serious threat. In the first instance, are we certain this isn't from the perp in Los Angeles, Graham? Well, the chief superintendent replied, it's in a similar vein, but... I spoke to our contact there, Detective Myman. I just woke him up. It's 1 a.m. local time, and he assures me that the man they have in custody has no internet access. I forwarded it to the high tech crime unit to see if they can find the source for us. What's your view, Roy? Has anyone spoken to Gaia about this? Not yet. She's still asleep, I understand. Someone needs to talk to her as soon as she's up. Maybe you should. I,、uh, I think she's quite sweet on you, Roy. Probably a good reason why I shouldn't then. Then, being serious again, he said, We need to find if she has any idea who this could be. Has she had a confrontation with any of her fans since she's been here? I've asked Gully that question. There was a middle aged woman in the Grand Hotel who tried to push past her security guards and then made a complaint to us about their brutality. Oh? How was it followed up? Uniform attended. They took a statement from her and then interviewed a couple of the security guards later. Seems the woman lied about being a journalist to try to get into Gaia's suite, then chased after her. We're not taking her complaint any further. Grace wondered why no one had thought to notify him about this incident. Then he looked at the email again. One possibility going through his mind was whether this could be Amos Smallbone winding them up. He read the words and did not think so. There was something sad about them a desperation, a wounded lover. A stalker deluded that Gaia was in love with him, or her. I think we need to know more about this woman at the Grand Graham. Can you get someone from your CID team to go and talk to her? I'll get Jason Tingley on it right away. What do we know about Gaia's current love life? She has a lover in Los Angeles, a fitness instructor. Detective Myman said he was interviewed after her system was killed and cleared. Sounds like their relationship is fine. I'd like to get this email analysed by a psychologist, Grace said. There may be some subtext we're not aware of. Good idea. Meantime, I'm going to step up her protection. Definitely, Grace said. Do we know her movements today? They're filming a big interior scene at the pavilion tonight. She's free during the day. She's promised to take her son on the pier and to the beach. I'll make sure we don't let either of them out of our sight. I think my young goddaughter is going to join them, Grace said. We'll have a ring of steel around them, Roy. Grace thanked him and hung up. Emails were tumbling into his inbox faster than he could read them. A whole bunch of stuff about the police rugby team he was running and had to deal with on top of everything else. And in twenty minutes' time, he had to drive over to Sussex Police HQ at Malling House to brief his boss, ACC Peter Rigg, on Operation Icon. Guy would be fine for now in Graham Barrington's hands. He hoped. Chapter 88 The phone was answered on the second ring. AD Motorhomes, putting on an American accent because she thought it might sound more convincing, Anna Galicia said, I'm calling from Brooker Brody Productions. We've mislaid the key to the motorhome our star Guy is using and need another one urgently. Oh dear, the woman said, we'll have to get a spare courier to you. You're in St. Albans, Hertfordshire, right? Yes. We have someone in that area picking up some props. I'll direct them to come to you for the key. They'll be there in about two hours? Yes, okay, fine. It'll be waiting in reception. Anna thanked her and hung up. Chapter 89 They began setting up for the big scene an hour before the pavilion closed for the day. A call had been put out for extras, but Drayton Wheeler had not responded. From his position right at the top of the wooden slats that formed a concave staircase up the inside of the dome, 
he could look straight down through a gap beside the metal shaft that supported the chandelier into the banqueting room. And he could listen, thanks to the baby monitoring system he'd bought in mother care. The radio microphone was underneath the mahogany table down in the banqueting room. The speaker was switched on beside him. He could hear everything perfectly, except for the occasional irritating whine of feedback. It was 4.30 p.m., nearing the end of the day that had felt like it would never end. He sat perched up there, watching stupid tourists shuffling around the exterior of the room. A plush rope prevented them from getting near to the actual banqueting table itself. He wasn't bored any more now. It was remarkable how simple the fixings of the chandelier were. A crossbeam of four metal poles attached to wooden struts, each secured by a large bolt. In the centre of the crossbeam was welded a single thick aluminium shaft, three feet long, to which one and a quarter tons of chandelier, with its fifteen thousand lustres, was attached. He tied the hotel towel tightly around the shaft. Then he grinned. Ready to rock and roll. Down below he could see doubles for Geyer and George Halpin being seated at the banqueting table for the director of photography to light them. Etiquette had it that the king and his paramour were seated first. The rest of the guests would file to the table. Timing was going to be the big issue. If he got really lucky, it might not be just Geyer and Judd Halpin that the chandelier landed on. It could be another ten people, either side of them and opposite. Some big names in the supporting cast. Hugh Bonneville from Downton Abbey was playing Lord Alvinley, and Joseph Fiennes was playing the king's friend Beau Brummel. Emily Watson was cast as the Countess of Jersey, who had for some years usurped Maria Fitzherbert, and was about to usurp her again in this ludicrous, totally historically inaccurate scene. None of them should have taken these roles. They were all conspiring to alter history. No one had any right to do that. For sure, they did not deserve to do that and live. If luck really went his way, he might get all of them. From his rucksack, he very carefully retrieved the San Pellegrino screw-top bottle. Its contents looked like water, but if you were to drink it, death would be agonizing and not instantaneous. It contained mercuric chloride acid, a substance powerful enough, from the experiments he'd already carried out, and his calculations that had followed, to eat through an aluminium shaft six inches in diameter in twenty-five to thirty minutes. He could see Larry Brooker's bald dome. He was pacing around shouting at people so loudly Drayton had to turn down the volume on the baby monitor. Crew were scurrying everywhere, frenetically busy. A dozen extras were seated around the banqueting table, which was laid out for a feast, doubling for the cast as the director of photography and his underlings were making final lighting adjustments. The sound boom was being manoeuvred into place, all getting set for the big scene. Gaia would be in her trailer, having her makeup and hair done, and reading through her lines once more, no doubt. His lines. Judd Halpern would be in his trailer, staring at his lines and doing several lines of a different kind. Coke, washed down with bourbon, if pass form was anything to go by. Larry Brooker was saying something to a young man who looked like he might be the first assistant director, who was nodding vigorously. Do you realize why you are all here? It's because of a screenplay called The King's Lover that you're making. If I hadn't written it, none of you would have a job on this production. Are you grateful to me? You don't even know who I am, do you? But you will soon. Chapter 90 the time is 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, June the 14th. This is the 20th briefing of Operation Icon, Roy Grace said to his team. We have some developments. He looked at Potting. Norman, can you tell us about your search of Miles Royce's house? I took DC Nickel with me, as well as Pulsar Lorna Denson Wilkins and crime scene photographer James Gartrell to record our search. Royce's mother wasn't exaggerating when she said her son was a big Gaia fan. The place is so full of her stuff, you can hardly move in there. I've never seen anything like it. Almost every room's crammed with cardboard cutouts of her dresses, records, souvenir programmes, piles and piles of press cuttings on the floor, and some of them pasted on the walls. In my view, he wasn't just a fan, he was a total obsessive. Just to be clear, I'm talking about an oddball. 
You can't open the door fully to some of the rooms. There's so much stuff piled in there. If we need it, Lorna can bring in more of her team tomorrow to catalogue everything. People like this bother me, Grace said. Obsessives are fanatics and unpredictable. The one thing that really worries me right now is that we have a Gaia obsessive dead and Gaia is in town. It might be a total coincidence, but this has to be an important line of inquiry for us to find out which other Gaia fans Royce associated with. He looked down at his notes, then continued. Right, from the high-tech crime unit's examination of Royce's computer so far, he would appear to have been one of a small group of obsessive Gaia fans who exchanged information and constantly bid against each other for everything that came up for auction. And it seems that he had one particular acrimonious rivalry with a character called Anna Galicia, which is where this gets interesting for us. He looked down at his notes. This rivalry developed into an email slanging match with this woman, a real nasty, bitchy exchange over some item of guys they'd both been bidding for that she wore in one of her shows. The high-tech crime unit still working through the email trail, but meantime I asked Annalisa Veneer to run a name check on Anna Galicia, and she got a hit. He nodded at her. Yes, last Wednesday evening... Annelise Veneer said. Uniform attended a grade three call at the Grand Hotel. It was a woman complaining she'd be assaulted by two of Gaia Lafayette's security guards. She gave her name as Anna Galicia. Following the information of the link between her and Royce from the high-tech crime unit, two uniformed officers were sent to her address to interview her. But it doesn't exist. She gave a false address. Then Branson frowned. Well, why would she have done that if she was making a genuine complaint? Exactly, Roy Grace said. By all accounts, she was pretty angry. So why give a false address? He looked around at his team. Any ideas? Doesn't make sense to me, Graham Bulldog said. Nor me, Guy Bachelor said. If you're making a complaint, you're making a complaint. If you have something to hide, you don't make a complaint in the first place. I mean, do you? He shrugged. I'm not at all happy about this person. Grace said. We need to find her quickly. Very quickly. Chapter 91 How can I make my multi-million dollar movie with a goddamn lead actor who's off his goddamn face for fuck's sake? Larry Brooker yelled at the top of his voice across the floor of the banqueting room at the hapless third assistant director, Adrian Gonzalez. You want to tell me? Gonzalez raised his hands in a gesture of despair. His role was to deliver Gaia Judd Halpin and the other principal actors to the set and escort them back to their trailers when they weren't required. He was an earnest, fresh-faced twenty-eight-year-old, with a shock of short, unruly ginger hair, dressed in a blue T-shirt emblazoned in white with the words The King's Lover, tatty cargo shorts and trainers. He wore a headset with an earpiece and microphone, had a mobile phone and a pager clipped to his belt, and was clutching a call sheet. He shrugged helplessly at Brooker. There was a pathetic ego thing going on between the two stars, who had taken an instant dislike to each other from day one. Halpin had already kept Gaia waiting twice, so now she refused to come out of her trailer for any scene she was doing with him until it was confirmed to her that he was on set and ready. The director, camera team, and the rest of the crew watched Larry Brooker's latest tantrum. The bald, tan producer and a black Versace shirt open halfway down his chest, displaying his gold medallion, black chinos and Cuban heel boots, strode over towards Gonzalez like a pocket dictator and gripped him by the front of his T-shirt. What the fuck's going on? Thirty minutes we've been waiting for this goddamn asshole. We have a schedule to keep to. We've got two busloads of extras sitting out there. Still gripping Gonzalez's shirt, he turned to the line producer, Barnaby Katz, a short, tubby man in his early forties, with a barren dome rising from a sparse tundra of fuzzy hair, who looked close to a nervous breakdown. He was dressed in a shapeless lumberjack shirt, baggy jeans and old desert boots. "'What the fuck are you doing standing there with your thumb up your ass?' he shouted at him. Then he released Gonzales, who stood still for a moment, as if unsure what to do next. "'I'll go and have a word with him,' Kat said. Brooker tapped his chest. "'No!' I'm going, okay? 
he stormed out of the banqueting room, left the building and strode across the grounds towards the trailers. Along the street, beyond the pavilion lawns and the cordon manned by the security guards and the row of trucks, was a large crowd of people waiting to catch glimpses of the stars, mostly waiting for Gaia, he guessed. Judd goddamn Halpen. Jesus, how he hated actors. Judd Halpen didn't do public transport, his agent had informed them which meant they had to put in the budget 150,000 bucks to fly the jerk, his assistant and some girl he was currently screwing over to London in a goddamn private jet. Then, because he was apparently a method actor, he demanded that there was unpasteurized milk on the plane, as King George would have drunk, so he could get himself into character. Fuckwit. He strode up to Judd Halpin's motorhome and banged on the door. Without waiting for an answer, he pulled it open and stormed up the steps. Inside was a fog of cannabis smoke that took him back to his student days. Through it he could see Halpin, seated at his dressing table, staring bleary-eyed into the mirror that was lit all the way round with bare light bulbs. Today's script pages, lime green, lay fanned out in front of him, with markings all over them, like a corrected school essay. A bottle of bourbon sat on the desk, alongside a plastic ballpoint pen with a nib and ink tube removed. Halpin was dressed in bulbous white pantaloons, a velvet gold-braided jacket with a high collar, and a cream neck ruff secured with an ornately jewelled brooch. His wavy black wig sat on the dresser in front of him. A female makeup artist was working on his face, while a joint burned in the ashtray. Standing in front of them, as if trying to block his path, was Halpin's effete personal assistant, and behind him, slumped over a table, with a cocktail glass in front of her, and a grey goose vodka bottle next to it was a scantily clad girl of barely legal age. By the relatively tender age of forty-two, Judd Halpin had already blown his career twice. The first time was after being the child star of a global hit US television series, Pasadena Heights, when he'd become so impossibly arrogant no one would work with him. Then, having recovered from that in his early twenties, helped by his almost absurdly handsome looks, which had been compared to those of silent screen star Rudolf Valentino, and his unquestionable acting talent, his career had been reborn with two successful movies. Then it hit the skids, after a series of drug convictions ending in a four-year spell in jail, when once again he'd become a Hollywood pariah. Now, according to his agent, he was clean, over it, remorseful about his past, anxious to make a fresh start, and had just made a movie with George Clooney that was a slam dunk to totally relaunch his career. Which was how Brooker Brody Productions had secured an actor with alias history for only a couple of hundred thousand dollars above scale. "'Judd,' Brooker said more civilly than he felt. "'Like, we're all waiting for you.' "'Ready when you are, C.B.' Halpin said, staring back with dilated pupils at his own handsome, if borderline, flaccid reflection in the mirror. He reached for the joint, but before his fingers touched it, Brooker snatched it and crushed it out in the ashtray, stubbing it, snapping it, then stubbing it again for good measure. "'Hey, man!' Judd Halpin protested. "'You have a problem?' Halpin glared at him. "'Yeah, I have a problem!' Yeah, well, I have a problem, too. My name isn't C.B., it's L.B., Larry Brooker. It was a joke, Halpin said. C.B., Cecil B. DeMille, right? Ready when you are, C.B. He frowned. You don't know it? If I wanted jokes, I'd have hired a goddamn comedian. Brooker pulled out his handkerchief and folded the broken joint into it. I have a problem, too. I suggest you take a look at your contract, the clauses on how you can be fired. Taking drugs is one of the first. The actor shook his head. I'm just smoking a cigarette, man. I like to roll my own. Yeah? And you know what? I'm the fucking Pope. The two men glared at each other, Halpin having a hard time focusing. Brooker tried hard to contain his rage. He had a movie to make and bring in on a tight budget, and it was getting harder every day as the schedule slipped. You want to tell me your problem? Sure, Halpin slurred. He picked up the pages, scrunching them. This is not what I signed up to. What do you mean? I took this role because I kind of like the idea of King George the Fourth. 
He was an innovative dude. He had a great and tragic love affair with Maria Fitzherbert. Halpin lapsed into silence. Brooker waited patiently, and then, as a prompt, he said, Uh-huh. I was assured the script was historically accurate. It is, Brooker said. George screwed Maria for several years, then dumped her. What's your problem? He was 28. I'm 42. So why'd you take the part? Because I was told Bill Nicholson was doing a rewrite. That's why I agreed to this. He's quality, man. He pointed at the script pages. He didn't write this, surely. Brooker shrugged. Oh, he had a bit of a problem at the last minute. Yeah, you mean you didn't want to pay his fees, right? The star pulled open a drawer, lifted out a pack of cigarettes, pulled one out and lit it. The comedian who wrote these pages doesn't seem aware that this pavilion wasn't even built at the time this scene was supposed to happen. Well, that's another problem. You want to know my problem? Larry Brooker said. Halpin shrugged at himself in the mirror. Then he watched himself draw on his cigarette. No, he replied, finally, curling his lips, attempting and failing to blow a smoke ring. My problem, Brooker said coolly, is actors. You ask an actor to walk down the street, and he turns round and he says, Why exactly am I walking down this street? You know what I tell him? Halpin stared at him, clearly struggling to hold focus. No. What do you tell him? I tell him, The reason you are walking down the street is because I'm fucking paying you to walk down this street. Judd Halpin gave him an uneasy smile. So listen to me good, Mr. Big Shot Actor. You are trying to rebuild your busted career. That's fine by me. For the rest of this production, when you are called, you're going to come out of this trailer like a goddamn greyhound out of its gate. Walk straight on set and give the performance of your life. You know what'll happen if you don't? Halpin looked at him a tad sheepishly. He said nothing. You'll be history. There won't be a production company in the world that's going to want to work with you by the time I finish telling them about you. I promise you. You reading me loud and clear? Well, I am, but the script's still not right. Then you'd better use your acting genius to turn it into something magical. Well, you think I can? Halpin said, his demeanor changing. Sure you can, kiddo. You're the world's greatest living actor. That's why I goddamn hired you. Halpin stiffened and preened. Oh, you, re you really think so? I don't think so, jo I know so. He gave him a winning smile. Cool, he said. Well, that's rock and roll. He reached for his wig. On set in ten minutes, okay? Brooker said. I'm there. You're goddamn terrific, you know that. Halpin smiled and attempted a shrug of modesty, but he wasn't very good at modesty. Brooker closed the door behind him and headed back to the set. You total asshole, he was thinking. Chapter 92 That's so much better, Gaia said sitting wrapped in her silk dressing gown as her hairdresser, Tracy Curry, standing on killer black heels, finished cropping her blonde hair. Gaia stared approvingly in the mirror at her new cut, which was even shorter than a few days ago. "'You'll find that a lot more comfortable under that wig,' the hairdresser said. "'Oh, you're a treasure!' She turned to her assistant, Martina Franklin. "'What do you think?' "'Yeah, it kind of suits you.' Eli Marsden, her makeup artist, nodded approvingly. It looks terrific. Gaia turned to her little boy, who was seated at a table further along the motorhome, watching a video on his iPad. Rowan Han, you like Mama's new hairstyle? Uh huh, he said glumly. I'm bored. Can I go take a look around the palace? Sure, Han. Go take a wander. I'll be in soon. Ask one of the security guys to walk you over there. Rowan dressed in a baggy blue The King's Lover t-shirt, jeans and trainers, jumped down from the table and scampered out of the air-conditioned chill of the trailer, 
into the warm clouding over evening air. Deciding to ignore his mother and explore alone, he walked jauntily across the pavilion lawns and up to the front door. The security guard looked down at him. Your guy's son, right? Sloan? Uh, uh, Rowan, he corrected. Sorry, Rowan. The boy shrugged. It's okay. Mama said I could take a look around. He gestured. Go right ahead, Rowan. Turn right when you go inside, follow the corridor, and you'll get to the banqueting room where your mum's going to be filming. Okay. Chapter 93 Okay, everyone, clear the doubles, please. The cast are coming on set. The voice came out of the baby monitor, loud and clear for some moments, then distorted by a feedback squawk. Perched up at the top of the dome's wooden frame, watching and listening, Drayton Wheeler began trembling with nerves and excitement. Now! Now! Have to do it now! He was never going to know for sure exactly when the cast would all be assembled around the table. He was going to have to rely on a calculated judgment— and luck. But this moment now was, in his view, the best shot he was likely to get. He picked up the San Pellegrino bottle, his hand shaking so much he was scared of slopping some of the mercuric chloride acid on himself. Pointing it away, he unscrewed the metal cap, and it slipped from his fingers. He could hear it tumble all the way down the wooden slats, rat-a-tat-tatting. Then, as it struck something metallic, a loud ping. He held his breath, listened, Static came through the baby monitor. Then Larry Brooker's voice talking to the director. We gotta make some time up. We've lost two hours thanks to that asshole. We can work on, Larry. Keep everyone late, Jack Jordan said. He had a soft and precious voice that Drayton Wheeler found particularly irritating. Don't go there. Brooker was thinking about the budget and the overtime rates for some of the crew if they went over the maximum number of hours, Wheeler guessed. "'You'll just have to take some shortcuts,' Brooker commanded. "'Darling boy, this is not the scene to take shortcuts on.' Wheeler could hear the disdain in the director's voice, and thought, "'Don't have a fucking argument, not now!' Another voice said, "'I'll be ready to fill the table. "'I want to see if Jad's compass meant is enough to film before I bring everyone else in,' Jordan said. "'He's fine.' Brooker said. I just spoke to him. He's going to be a pussycat tonight. He's just leaving his trailer now, one of the assistant directors announced. Wheeler listened to the words. Then, very carefully, holding his breath, he tipped the entire contents of the San Pellegrino bottle onto the towel, which he'd wound around the single aluminium support shaft for the chandelier. Instantly, a wisp of smoke rose from the towel as it began to discolour into brown and grey blotches. Some of the acid ran further down the shaft. He continued to hold his breath, partly to avoid inhaling any of the fumes the acid released, and partly out of terror that it might drip down onto the table way below and get noticed. More curls of smoke were rising. He moved down several slats, until he was below the level of the acid, then checked his watch. 7.04 p.m. If his calculations were right, at around 7.35 p.m., the acid would have eaten through enough of the shaft for the chandelier to plunge. Through the monitor, he heard the conversation between Larry Brooker and Jack Jordan continuing. I'm telling you, darling boy, I cannot possibly shoot tonight if he's wrecked. He's fine, Jesus, I just spoke with him. You said that he was fine last night. He couldn't remember his lines for more than ten seconds. You know who this is going to reflect on. I don't work this way, Larry. I just can't connect with him. Do you understand? He'll be fine, good as gold. He was complaining to me yesterday that Gaia was chewing raw garlic before their kissing scene. I think I should go and talk to him offset before everyone else arrives. Shit, 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 Wheeler thought. Just get the jerk on set and everyone else. He watched Jordan walk out of the room. One of the assistant directors said into his microphone, Hold all cast. No. Wheeler urged silently. Bring them on, bring them on, get them into position. Suddenly, he saw a small boy with mussed-up brown hair wearing a T-shirt and jeans walk into the room, duck under the ropes and walk towards the table. Gaia's little brat he recognized from earlier. Fuck off, kid, 
Get out of here. Clear off, you little bastard. The boy wandered, curious around the table. He peered nosily at the hams, chickens, haunches of venison, suckling pig, silver flagons of ales and wines and bowls of fruits. Then he pulled up a chair at the table, sat down, and stared around him with a regal air, as if imagining himself back in time. Clear off, kid! He looked just like his own son. Suddenly there was a strange sound directly above him, a sharp hissing. He looked up, and to his shock, the entire interior of the dome above him had disappeared in a swirling mist of acrid smoke. He could feel it burning his lungs, parching his mouth. Sudden panic gripped him. There was a piercing, creaking sound. He looked down for an instant, and the chandelier was trembling. No! 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 His careful calculations had come out at thirty minutes. What had he got wrong? It was shaking even more now, and the creaking was getting worse. The damn boy was still sitting there, lifting a silver goblet, as if pretending to drink from it. He coughed, the acid fumes burning his eyes and searing his throat. Half-blinded, tears were streaming from his eyes. He coughed again, a long, deep, choking, hacking cough. Get lost, kid! Scram! His goddamn calculations were wrong. Had he screwed up on the acid strength? The calculations of the diameter of the aluminium? There was a terrible screech of stressed metal right below him. He looked down and to his horror could see the whole chandelier had moved several inches and was now off kilter. The shaft was about to snap. The whole chandelier, as he had planned, was about to fall. But on to Rowan Lafayette. No. Kid! he yelled. Get away! Get away! Get away! But no one could hear him from up here. The boy continued to play happily with his goblet. Of course he could not hear him from up here. There was another piercing metallic shriek. Through his observation hole, he could see the chandelier was swaying now. Any moment it would plunge down. No one had noticed. It was going to kill the kid, and that was never his intention. Oh, shit! 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 This was screwing up all his plans. He launched himself down the rest of the wooden slats, knocking over and then accidentally treading on and splintering the baby alarm speaker, squeezed back out through the narrow hatch, and then clambered down the ladder. He felt surprisingly energised and clear-headed. I am not killing a child! I am not killing a child! He sprinted along the steel walkway, ignoring the handrail this time, then clambered in through the hatch to the apartment beneath the big dome. He ran through the main room, past the dust sheets, over the trapdoor secured by the two bolts, then down the spiral staircase, keeping well clear of the rickety handrail. Then he burst out through the door at the bottom into the central hallway. Two security guards standing there looked at him in astonishment. As Wheeler ignored them and sprinted down the corridor towards the banqueting room, the guards ran after him. Hey! Hey, you! one shouted. Let me see your ID! Three grips, unwinding a cable drum, were blocking the entrance to the room. One guard caught up with Wheeler as he tried to barge past them and grabbed him by the shoulder. Hey! Drayton Wheeler turned and punched him in the nose so hard he busted, sending the guard reeling back, and at the same time agonizingly dislocating his own thumb. But he barely even noticed. He ran on into the banqueting room and looked up. The chandelier was swaying as if suspended by a solitary fraying piece of string. At any second it was going to come down. The stupid kid, in a world of his own, was now pretending to eat with a knife and fork. The rest of the crew in here were well clear of the table. Wheeler clambered over the rope. Hey! The other security guard shouted at him. Wheeler ignored him, ignored everything but the kid at the table and the looming swaying shadow above him. He threw himself across the room and grabbed the boy, yanking him clean out of his chair by his arm, his knife and fork clattering to the ground. Hey! Rowan shouted, furious and bewildered, moments before Drayton Wheeler, gripping him by the shoulder and buttocks, threw him with all the force he could muster across the polished wooden floor, sliding and spinning like a human curling stone. Rowan shrieked in protest as he crashed into a brass upright supporting the rope. Then... Before Drayton Wheeler had a chance to move, the chandelier dropped. He sensed fleetingly the shadow descending on him, enveloping him far too fast for him to cry out. 
The full force of the chandelier struck him on the head, smashing him to the floor a split second before it demolished an eight-foot-long portion of the centre of the table. The floor shook under the massive splintering crash, as if a bomb had gone off in the room. There was a jangling, reverberating boom. Hundreds of the fifteen thousand glass drops shattered, sending a glittering, shimmering display of coloured light into the air for an instant, like a firework. Lights in the grand room flickered. Goblets on the table crashed over, shattering, spilling their contents. Plates, chandeliers and terrines slid down into the tangled mess of chains, gilded metal framework and glass. Then there was a gentle, almost absurd tinkling sound, as if someone had just dropped one single glass. That was all, and nothing else. It was followed by a brief instant of absolute silence. No one moved. Then a male voice cried out in shock. Oh, shit! Oh, no! A female voice screamed. There's a man under there! Oh, my God, there's someone under there! There was another moment of stunned, awed silence. It was broken by a hideous, whooping, hysterical screaming from the film unit's continuity woman. Bug-eyed, she was standing, pointing at a dark red pool of blood, spreading out from under the mangled wreckage, where the centre of the table had been only moments ago. A single streak of stark white light flitted across the scene. Someone had taken a photograph. Chapter 94 Several of the film unit's lights had been beamed onto the fallen chandelier. Under their glare, two paramedics in green uniforms, Phil Davidson and Vicky Donahue, were picking their way through the shattered glass and twisted metal, trying to locate the victim's head, being careful not to put any additional weight on the wreckage that could crush the man further. There was blood everywhere beneath them, spreading slowly outwards, and a terrible stench like a bad drain. Both of them knew what that meant, that the man's stomach and bowels had been split open. They could glimpse the man's clothes in a few places. Repeatedly, Vicky Donahue asked, Sir, can you hear us? Help is on its way. Can you hear us, sir? There was no response. Outside she could hear a cacophony of sirens winding down. Hopefully the fire brigade had arrived with lifting gear. Then she saw flesh, a wrist. Carefully she eased her gloved hand in between the jagged leaves of glass palm fronds and held the wrist lightly. It was limp. "'Can you hear me, sir? Try to move your hand if you can't speak,' she urged. Then she curled her fingers around the wrist, feeling for the radial artery. "'I've got a pulse,' she announced after some moments in a low voice to her colleague. "'But it's weak. "'We've got to get this mess lifted off him. How weak?' She counted for a few seconds. Twenty-five. She counted again. We're going down twenty-four. He mouthed the question at her without actually saying the words. He didn't need to. They'd crewed together for long enough to be able to read each other's signals. Fubar Bundy? The words were an acronym for fucked up beyond all recovery, but unfortunately not dead yet. The gallows humour of the ambulance service that helped them cope with horrible situations like this. She nodded affirmative. Jason Tingley, with his boyish mop of hair brushed forward, white button-down shirt with black buttons and narrow black tie, every inch a 21st century mod, was at his desk in the CID department on the fourth floor of Brighton's John Street Police Station, nearing the end of his 12-hour shift as the on-call detective inspector. At the forefront of his mind was yesterday's disturbing development of the email death threat against Gaia. He yawned. It had been a busy day, starting at the beginning of his shift with a woman claiming she had been raped after having a row with her boyfriend and leaving a party at 6.45 a.m. Who the hell partied until 6.45 a.m. on a Monday night, or rather Tuesday morning, he wondered. Then at midday, the road policing unit had stopped a car in the city with its boot filled with bags of cannabis, and at 3pm there had been an armed robbery on a jewellery shop in the city centre. He was still dealing with the paperwork on that now, and was almost finished. He was hoping to be able to get home in time to see his two children before they went to bed, and enjoy a meal and a quiet evening in front of the television with his wife Nicky. Then his phone rang. "'Jason Tingley?' he answered. 
It was the Ops 1 controller, Andy Kill. Jason, there's been an incident at the Royal Pavilion just come in that I thought you, the Chief Superintendent, and Roy Grace might want to know about. Well, what's happened? He listened with great concern to the sketchy details that Kill had been given. It seemed a strange coincidence that a chandelier, which had been in situ for almost two centuries, should suddenly fall down this week of all weeks, unless the film crew had been meddling with it and had damaged something. Do we know anything about the person under the chandelier, Andy? He asked. Not at this stage, no. I'm going to take a look, he said. I'll keep Roy Grace and Graham Barrington informed. He ended the call, stood up and hooked his jacket off the back of his chair. By the time he'd reached the car park out the back and belted himself into one of the grey Ford Focus cars from the detective's pool, he'd notified the chief superintendent of Brighton and Hove, who was away for the day attending a course, but had not managed to get through to Roy Grace. Five minutes later, as he turned left and drove under the archway into the pavilion grounds, Dingley saw three fire engines, a fire service heavy rescue vehicle, an ambulance and a paramedic car outside the main entrance, as well as two police vehicles. He drove past the cluster of trailers, pulled up as close as he could to the main entrance, then hurried across, flashing his ID at two security guards. They told him to go inside and turn right. The last time he'd been in this building was years back, on a school history outing. It had the same smell of all museums and galleries, but he'd forgotten just how ornate and splendid it was. As he entered the banqueting room, a surreal vision lay in front of him. It was as if a pause button had been pressed, freeze-framing some people in the room, but not everyone, and the smell was quite different, a vile, sickening stench of drains. Members of the film crew, scruffily dressed and with shocked expressions, stood motionless, seemingly rooted to the spot. One woman in baggy jeans had turned away from the horror in the centre of the room and was sobbing in shock in the arms of a huge bearded man who was holding an aluminium foil lamp reflector behind her back. The fallen chandelier looked like a giant beached jewel-encrusted jellyfish, with tentacular chains sprawling all around, a metal shaft like a broken spear protruding several feet from the top of it. Two paramedics were in the middle of the wreckage, while one team of fire officers were manoeuvring cutting gear into place, and another two officers were working on placing a blue and yellow airbag attached by a line to a compressed air cylinder under one part of the wreckage. A third officer stood beside them, with a small stack of wooden blocks to place beneath as the wreckage rose. A young, uniformed woman police officer greeted Detective Inspector Tingley's arrival with relief, as if happy she could now delegate responsibility to someone more senior. The Detective Inspector stared up at the ceiling. He could see the dragon claws and the painted palm leaves, with a small, dark hole in the centre, where he presumed the shaft had been. Then he turned to the PC. "'What do we know so far?' Tingley asked her. "'Well, sir, I just got here a few minutes ago. "'What I've been able to ascertain so far is that "'there's one person, male, known to be under the chandelier.' "'Could there be others?' "'No, sir. I've spoken to several eyewitnesses "'who say there's just one person.' "'What do we know about how this happened?' "'Well, it's very sketchy. "'It seems that Guy's son was sitting at the table playing, "'and this man, who must have seen that the chandelier was about to come down,' "'dashed across the room and literally threw the boy clear. "'Is the boy all right?' "'Yes, sir. He's with his mother in a trailer.' "'Who is the man? One of the film crew? "'So far no one recognises him. "'A well, maintenance worker, perhaps. Could be, sir.' "'Tingley looked around. "'Right. Get some backup here fast. "'I'm treating this as a crime scene. "'I want the entire building cordoned off. "'Get everyone out, but take the names and addresses "'of everyone in the building, including the security guards, "'as they leave.' She nodded, looking around, taking it all in. "'Start with this room,' he said helpfully. "'Tape it off. No one leaves until you have their name and address.' "'Yes, sir.' She radioed for assistance, then hurried out. Tingley strode across the room towards the wreckage. As he did so, he caught the eye of the male paramedic, Phil Davidson, whom he'd met on several previous occasions. Davidson nodded grimly. It's like that scene in Only Fools and Horses when the chandelier came down. What do we know about who's under there? Tinkley asked, ignoring the comment about the TV sitcom. One male, according to witnesses. Aware of almost everyone in the room looking at him, Tingley went as close as he could to the edge of the chandelier. Fifteen, the female paramedic announced grimly. 
It looks like it's going to be a fatality, Davidson said quietly to the detective. Then, using gallows humour jargon, he added, A scoop and run at best, I'd say. An agitated American voice said, Excuse me, can I help you? Jason Tingley turned and found himself facing a short, lean man with a tanned bald dome, dressed in a black shirt with silver buttons, open almost to the navel, black jeans and Cuban heel boots. The detective flashed his warrant card in his face. Detective Inspector Tingley, Sussex CID. Can I help you? he said pointedly. Good to meet you, sir. I'm the producer of this movie, Larry Brooker. Tingley shook his hand. It felt like patting the head of a poisonous snake whose venom had been removed. I've just heard you've ordered the entire building to be cleared, Brooker said. Did I hear right? You did. Well, the thing is, officer, <laughs> we have a bit of a situation here, as you can see. The detective gave him a sideways look. I think you could say that, yes. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the young woman PC hurrying back into the room with a reel of blue and white police crime scene tape. Like, I have Geyer and Judd Halpern and Hugh Bonneville, Joseph Fiennes and Emily Watson all waiting in their trailers. We gotta get some footage in the can tonight because of our schedule. The D.I. looked at Brooker incredulously. Then he pointed at the chandelier and the emergency service workers. You're aware that there's a man underneath that? A human being? Sure, of course. Like, I'm as shocked as everyone else. So, what actually is your point, sir? My point is that we're already behind schedule. This is terrible, tragic, fucking English maintenance, right? I mean, where else in the world could this happen? He seemed oblivious to the detective inspector's stony glare. The thing is, we have to get some footage in the can tonight. Like, I'm just wondering how fast this mess could be cleared, so we could carry on. We can shoot around the chandelier, it's not a problem. Jason Tingley simply could not believe what he was hearing. Mr. Brooker, we have a possibly fatally injured person. This is now a crime scene. Crime scene? Well, it's, it's a goddamn accident, or well, a terrible accident. With respect, sir, at this point in time, I have no evidence to support it being an accident. Unless or until I do, this is a crime scene, my crime scene. I own this now, do you understand? I'm clearing everyone from it, and no one is going to be filming here tonight or any time soon. I apologise for inconveniencing you, but do you understand that? Brooker stared back at him and began stabbing at the air with his finger. Listen to me and listen good, Detective Inspector Tingles. Tingly. Yeah? Well, whatever. You better listen good, Detective. You better understand me. I have your Director of Tourism, Adam Bates, totally on board. This is the biggest goddamn motion picture your city's ever had shot here. I am not having my multi-million dollar production set back because of this building's shit maintenance. Jason Tingley, standing his ground, said... At this point, my priority is to ensure the safety of everyone in this building, Mr. Brooker. He pointed up at the other four smaller chandeliers. I'm going to have someone from health and safety here at any moment wanting a full check. One chandelier has come down. Do you really want to risk the lives of those stars by not having proper safety checks on the others? Brooker looked at his watch, a big, chunky digital thing that looked like it belonged on the instrument panel of a space shuttle. You know, with respect, officer, this is not your call. Fine. Speak to the chief constable, but until he directs me otherwise, this is my crime scene, and I have to warn you that if you attempt to obstruct me, I will arrest you. Brooker glowered at him. You know what you are? You're fucking unreal. You are too, Jason Tingley thought. Chapter 95 Roy Grace, almost home, was hunting for a parking space near Cleo's house when Jason Tingley phoned him to tell him what had happened. He listened intently, all his instincts telling him this was not coincidence, and he said he was on his way. It was only a few minutes' drive from here to the pavilion. Moments after the D.I. hung up, his phone rang again. As he answered, he heard the nasal James Cagney voice of Gaia's security adviser, Andrew Gully. Detective Superintendent Grace! 
Yes. How are you? Do you want to tell me what's going on, Detective Grace? I'm actually on my way to find out myself. I understand that Gaia's kid was almost killed just now. This is not an acceptable situation. Well, how is he? He's fine, but Gaia's pretty distressed. Well, if you want to meet me at the pavilion, I'm already there. Gully cut him short. I need to know what's going on. Is your goddamn building falling down? Or is there someone behind this? I have to make decisions regarding my client's security. Am I making myself clear? Meet me at the front entrance in five minutes. I'm there. Grace hung up and immediately phoned Cleo, warning her he didn't know what time he'd be home now. She told him she understood. Not something Sandy had said to him very often. Then his phone rang yet again. It was the chief constable. Roy, what information do you have about this incident at the pavilion? I'm on my way there now, sir. Well, I don't like the sound of it at all. No, sir. I can call you back and give you an update after I get there. Yeah, please do. A few minutes later, he drove into the pavilion grounds, which were ablaze with blue flashing lights. A large crowd of onlookers was gathered along the far side of the perimeter wall, camera flashes popping intermittently. Two PCSOs were busily cordoning off the entire Royal Pavilion building, and another was already in situ as a scene guard. A dozen bewildered-looking people, film crew, he supposed, were milling around on the lawn beneath the darkening sky which was threatening rain, some making phone calls, some smoking. A police van, laden with uniformed officers, siren wailing, turned into the archway as he got out of his car. Andrew Gully was standing beside the scene guard. As Grace approached, he said, This goddamn officious bastard won't let me through. I'm sorry, Grace said. Until we've established what happened, we're treating this whole building as a crime scene. I can't allow you in. My advice would be to get Guy and Rowan back to the safety of their hotel. Gully shook his head. The directors asked her to wait. They may shoot some exterior footage tonight. In that case, keep a very close eye on her. Put her security guards around her trailer. That's already in place. Grace signed the log, ducked under the tape, and hurried through the front of the building. A security guard directed him to the banqueting room, and Tingley greeted him as he entered. He observed several fire officers working around the edges of the huge fallen chandelier, and two paramedics on their stomachs in the middle of the debris. He heard the whine of hydraulic cutting gear. Three police officers seemed to be taking down details of the people in the room. What's the latest? he asked. The victims died, sir, Tingley said quietly. Shit. What information do we have about him? He looked up, then back at the D.I. Was he part of the film crew? Not from what I've been able to find out so far. Two of the security guards said he appeared from a part of the building not open to the public in panic. He punched one of the guards who tried to apprehend him in the corridor, ran into this room and pushed Guy's son clear seconds before the chandelier came down. What was the boy doing in here? Playing, while his mother was in makeup. He's safe and unhurt? Yes, he's back with his mother. This man, show me where he came from. Tingley pointed to the corridor Grace had just walked along. A voice from behind startled them. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I can't believe this! Both detectives turned to see a tall, elegant man in his fifties in a chalk-striped suit come into the room. He was looking ashen. This was King George's worst nightmare. I can't believe it. Then he looked at them both. I'm David Barry, the curator of this building. Grace and Tingley introduced themselves. Barry looked up at the ceiling. This isn't possible. I'm sorry, it's just not possible. Oh, God, oh my God. There's someone trapped underneath. What is the poor man's condition? The paramedics say he's died, I'm afraid. Tingley responded. This is terrible. Unbelievable. He looked at the two men. You have to understand. You must believe me when I tell you this is simply not possible. Jason Tingley pointed at the wreckage and said pragmatically, I'm finding that a little hard to accept at this moment, sir. Roy Grace found it a little hard to accept, too. The man had punched a security guard in the corridor and then run into this room, it was impossible to see the chandelier from the corridor, so what did the man know, whoever he was, and how? Was this chandelier checked regularly? 
Grace asked Barry. Does someone carry out safety checks on the fixings? The curator raised his arms, helplessly and bewildered. Well, I mean, every five years the entire thing is cleaned. All fifteen thousand lusters, it takes about two months. Could it be metal fatigue? Jason Tingley said. Well, we carry out safety checks regularly on everything, Barry said. Queen Victoria had the original shaft replaced with aluminium. We never had any reason to change it. You have to believe me, this just could not happen. It couldn't. Grace was trying to recall who it was who said, The moment the world ends, the last sound you will hear is the voice of an expert explaining why it could not happen. I'd like to have a good look around the building, he said. Can you take me up to the space above the ceiling? Yes, yes, of course. Can I help in any way here before we do that? There's nothing anyone could do here. We have to stop all work now until the coroner's officer arrives, Tingley said. Grace told Tingley to stay in the room, then followed the curator out of the banqueting room, along the corridor, past a sign to the toilets, and in through a door in the main hallway. "'We have a bit of a climb up a spiral staircase,' David Barry said. "'Can I ask you not to put your hand on the railings? They're very unstable. This is why we don't let the public in here.' He pulled out a torch. Grace followed him up a steep, winding spiral staircase that seemed never-ending. Halfway up, Grace stopped and touched the handrail. It felt extremely wobbly, with a long drop beyond it into darkness. He stepped away and moved as close to the wall as he could get, hugging it as he climbed. Heights had never been his strong point. Finally, both men puffing, they reached the top and entered what looked to Grace like a derelict bedroom, mostly covered in dust sheets over angular shapes. Even in the waning light of the June evening, he could see ancient mottled wallpaper, with graffiti scrawled over much of it, and oval leaded light windows overlooking the brightened skyline. David Barry decided they could see well enough without his torch. He spoke with a pleasant, cultured voice. This was where the King's senior household staff had their quarters back in Prinny's day. I don't know how much you know about the history of this palace, Detective Superintendent, but during the First World War it was used as a hospital for wounded Indian soldiers, hence the graffiti. It's been derelict since that time, largely because the stair rail is in such dangerous condition. Oh, and uh, please be careful where you tread. We have a lot of dry rot up here. To his unease, Roy Gray saw that he was standing on a large trapdoor, secured by two rusting bolts. It felt decidedly unsafe, and he quickly stepped aside and off it. That trapdoor opens downwards onto a forty-foot vertical drop to a storeroom above the kitchen scullery. There used to be a dumb waiter for hauling meals up to the residence here from the kitchen. He pointed upwards to reveal a primitive block and tackle fixed to the ceiling, with rope wound around it. Grace looked down at the floor again, at the large sign which read, Danger! Steep drop below! Do not stand on door! Suddenly he saw something glint on the floor beneath a dust sheet hanging over the bed, and knelt down. It was a chocolate wrapper, a crunchy bar. "'Do they have these in King George's day?' he asked. The curator smiled, looking sinister in the shadows. "'I'm afraid there, there have been a few unofficial visitors up here in more recent times. We've had a number of break-ins. It's almost impossible to maintain 100% security in a building of this size.' "'Of course.' Grace stared again at the chocolate bar wrapper as the curator walked across the room. Putting on a pair of gloves, Grace picked up the wrapper and sniffed it, expecting it to smell stale. But to his surprise, it seemed fresh, as if it had been opened very recently. Then he noticed a tiny smear of lipstick where the front of it was folded back. He put it down carefully where he'd found it, in order that it could be photographed by a soccer officer, and followed the curator out onto the roof ducking through a small door that was barely bigger than a serving hatch. The sky had turned ominously dark, as if it were about to rain. Barry strode ahead, along a narrow steel platform, with a sheer drop to the ground to his left, and Grace followed, gripping the handrail, trying not to look down. Ahead of him, and all around, was a spectacular view across the roofs of the pavilion, with its onion domes and minarets. Down below, he could hear sirens and see more blue flashing lights of vehicles pulling up. "'That's the dome of the banqueting room right ahead,' David Barry pointed. They scaled a short metal ladder, then went along another narrow walkway. Then they climbed a long, steep ladder, 
Roy Grace nervously clinging on tightly, as the curator above him clambered as confidently as a mountain goat. Grace hauled himself on his knees onto a narrow platform, with the dome curving majestically skywards above him, and now he really did not dare look down. Then his phone rang. He debated for a moment whether to answer it, then very carefully pulled it out of its cradle. "'Roy Grace?' he said. It was ACC Peter Rigg, and he sounded anxious. "'Roy,' he said, "'I don't know if you've heard, but I gather there's a bit of an incident at the Royal Pavilion.' "'Uh, yes, sir, I have. I think you'd better get there, PDQ.' Grace looked out across the city rooftops. "'I'm actually here, sir.' "'Oh, good. Excellent. Anything to report?' "'Yes, sir. I have a great view.' "'View?' He saw Barry was crawling through a tiny inspection hatch door. "'Can I call you back in a few minutes, sir?' "'Please. The Chief Constable's fretting.' "'Yes, I know, sir.' He ended the call and followed Barry through the hatch, having to ease himself in backwards into almost total darkness and the musty smell of old wood and something acrid and deeply unpleasant. "'This is the second skin of the building,' the curator said, shining his torch-beam around. "'Outside you have the visible bottle-shaped shell of the dome. This is the wooden framework supporting it.' Both men coughed. Grace's eyes were stinging. He could see wooden slats like a primitive ladder rising above him and getting increasingly narrow. The curator shone the beam upwards, illuminating a wooden crossbeam with a severed metal shaft suspended from it. It looked to Roy Grace the same diameter as the shaft sticking out of the top of the fallen chandelier. Wisps of smoke or steam were curling upwards from it. Grace frowned, then coughed again. Then he looked down, and through a small hole a large section of the banqueting room was visible beneath. He could see the two paramedics still on all fours in the wreckage of the chandelier. The curator swung the torch beam down, and something glinted in the light. It looked like a metal bottle cap. Then Roy Grace noticed a discarded San Bellegrino bottle. Near it were fragments of broken plastic. "'Bloody little outs!' the curator said, reaching for the bottle. Grace grabbed his hand. "'Don't touch it. It could be a crime exhibit, and it might contain acid.' "'Acid?' Grace guided the beam up the severed shaft again. "'What do you suppose that is?' Barry stared at him. "'I don't understand.' Then they both saw the rucksack wedged between two slats, a short distance above them. Grace took the torch and climbed up to it, then shone the beam inside. He saw an opened all-day breakfast pack of sandwiches, a can of Coke, a bottle of water, a Kindle, a battered leather wallet, and what looked like an iron tire lever. Tucking the torch under his chin, he again pulled a pair of protective gloves from his pocket and snapped them on. Then he took out the wallet and opened it. Slotted in one pocket, he saw a photograph of a small boy in a baseball cap and a plastic Grand Hotel room key jammed in another. He put the wallet into a plastic evidence bag and slipped it into his pocket. Then he coughed again, just grabbing the torch before it fell. He shone the beam back on the shaft. The end of it, with wisps of smoke still rising, had melted into a bulbous shape that reminded him of mercury in a thermometer. "'What do you know about chemistry?' he called down to the curator. "'Never my strong subject,' David Barry said, staring up at the end of the shaft. "'Well, that makes two of us,' Roy Grace said. "'But I can tell you one thing. Your chandelier didn't fall by accident.' "'I don't know if I'm happy to hear that or not.' Grace barely heard him. He was thinking about Gaia's son, Rowan, who had apparently been sitting beneath the chandelier seconds before it fell. Had the boy been the intended target? No, he didn't think so. His immediate hypothesis was that Gaia was the target. Something had gone wrong in the assailant's plans. Timing? The appearance of Rowan? Who was the man crushed beneath the chandelier? The perpetrator or a heroic innocent bystander? He did not think the latter. Innocence didn't play any part in what had just happened. Chapter 96 Roy Grace and a subdued David Barry strode quickly back into the banqueting room. 
The film crew had now been cleared away from the room, and two police officers stood by the doorways. A large number of fire brigade officers were standing by with their equipment, waiting for a decision that would be made by the coroner's officer and the home office pathologist, who would be called out, whether the body could be recovered to the mortuary or the first part of the post-mortem was to take place here. A crime scene photographer had arrived, as well as the coroner's officer, who was talking to D.I. Tingley. Grace hoped there were sufficient people from the mortuary on call so that Clear would not be dragged out here from her much-needed rest this evening. Jason Tingley turned to Grace. "'Chief, we can't get a home office pathologist until first thing in the morning. Najitka's going to be doing the post-mortem. I explained the situation, and she's given permission for the body to be recovered to the mortuary.' "'Good.' He looked up briefly. "'I think we're going to have a difficult balancing act with the film people. It looks to me that someone deliberately brought down this chandelier. I want the dome above it treated as a crime scene. Get Socko up there right away, and warn them there are some hazardous substances.' One of the police officers at the door came over to him. Sir, there's a gentleman who says he's the film's producer who's insisting on speaking to you. Grace walked across to the door and saw a short, bald man, expensively dressed in casual clothes, who was looking indignant. You the officer in charge around here? Larry Brooker said imperiously. I'm Detective Superintendent Grace. I'm in charge of major crime for Sussex. Larry Brooker, I'm the producer of this movie. He stabbed a finger towards Jason Tingley. I got a problem with that colleague of yours. I'm making a multi-million dollar movie, and he won't let me on my own set. I'm afraid that's correct, Grace said. No one is permitted in the building while we carry out our investigations. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave, too. I'm sorry, I can't let this happen, Brooker said. With respect, it's actually not your decision to make. Grace said. The producer glared at him. So just whose decision is it, for fuck's sake? Mine, Grace said. You have to get real, detective. Do you have any idea is a dead body under that chandelier real enough for you? Grace said, cutting him short, barely containing his anger now. So, like, what's the score? Did this creep really not care? Grace stared at the bald runt, highly tempted to say something that would really piss him off. The score is 3-2 to Manchester United, perhaps. The test match score in Bangalore? But he remembered the importance of this film to his beloved city. Mr. Brooker, I'm conscious of your situation, and I'll be as fast as I can. I'm going to bring in a team to work overnight. I'm afraid we do have to seal off the whole building. But subject to what the maintenance and health and safety people say, I'll try to give it back to you tomorrow afternoon. Would that be acceptable? What time tomorrow afternoon? Brooker growled. What time do you need it? We were planning to shoot after it closes to the public, 5.45 p.m. onwards. Chief, Tingley cautioned. Fine, Grace said, ignoring Tingley's protestation. You'll have it back for then. Are you able to do any filming outside or in a different location tonight? That was the plan. We have over 100 extras here. It's a very important scene. It's a key scene in the movie. But how can we even shoot outside with all these police vehicles here? We'll get them moved. If you tell us which area you want cleared outside, we'll make that happen. Then he turned to the D.I. My car's outside. Meet me there in five minutes. He hurried out of the building, looking around for Andrew Gully, but could see no sign of him. Then he crossed the lawns towards the little village of motorhomes and trailers. Four man-mountain security guards stood by the steps to Guy's motorhome, Grace showed his Warren card, then asked if any of them had seen Mr. Gully. He went over to the hotel to see about stepping up security there. One of them replied, talking in a voice that sounded like he had a mouthful of ice cubes. Grace knocked on the door. It was opened a few minutes later by a female assistant who he had seen before in Guy's suite in the Grand. She had ginger hair, cut in a fashionably skewed style, and wore a black T-shirt and black jeans over her deck plimsolls. Lorry, right? She smiled in recognition, but looked uneasy. Inspector Grace, what can I do for you? She said in a clipped American accent. I wanted to check that Rowan is okay. Aha, uh-huh, he's fine, thank you. Well, he's not injured. No, no, he's good. He's not even upset. I think he was more confused than anything. Thank you for asking. What's actually happened? 
Andrew Gully told us there's been some kind of accident with the chandelier, but we, we don't have any details. Yes, I'd just like to explain the situation. Is Gaia here? The assistant stepped back for a moment and called out. It's Inspector Grace! Moments later, she beckoned him to come on board. He climbed the steps and entered the cavernous interior of the vehicle, which smelt of a very appealing perfume, and the fainter smell of a recently smoked cigarette. A television was on, tuned to a cartoon channel, and Rowan sat at a table wearing his baseball cap, a computer game in front of him, staring at the cartoon with a rather bored expression, then turned his attention to his game. You okay? Grace asked him. He shrugged and pressed a toggle on his game. Then a woman he did not at first recognise appeared through a partition door, wrapped in a cream silk dressing gown, her blonde hair cropped short in a male cut. She looked tearful, but greeted him with a cheery and very sexy voice. Hey, Mr. Paul Newman eyes! He smiled at her. She looked different, but still strikingly beautiful. What's going on? Is the goddamn building falling down or something? He shook his head. I'm really sorry. We're doing our best to establish what happened. She strode up to him, put her arms around him, and hugged him hard. This is scary, she said. But we'll get to the bottom of it quickly, I promise you. Suddenly she gave him a quick, but not that quick, peck on the cheek, then stared into his eyes for some moments. Staring back into hers, he felt an electrifying frisson between them. I know you will. Thank you for everything you're doing while we're here in your city, Chief Inspector. Her breath smelled minty. He shrugged and blushed. I'm afraid with this incident in the banqueting room it's clearly not enough. Can I offer you a drink? He shook his head. Thank you, but I have to get on in a second. I just wanted to make sure Rowan was okay. It's too early to say whether there's any foul play, but um, we've closed down the pavilion in order to conduct our investigation, so... There won't be any filming in there tonight. You think someone might have done something to bring that chandelier down? I wouldn't want to alarm you, but it's a distinct possibility. They were targeting my son? Her eyes opened wide in fear. If what happened is connected to the email that was sent last night, and that's pure speculation at this stage, I'd say it was more likely they were targeting you and got their timings wrong but I wouldn't want to say anything that might cause you to worry unduly at this stage. She stared him in the eyes again. So long as you're around, Chief Inspector, I won't be worried. He thought for a moment she was going to kiss him again, and he took a step back, half turning away, trying, albeit rather unconvincingly, to retain a professional detachment. Thank you, he said. Thank you for being so understanding. De nada. She blew him a kiss. Chapter 97 Grace hurried back across the pavilion lawns towards his car with a spring in his step. Despite his worries, he felt he was walking on air. He'd never imagined the day might come when he was kissed by an icon. What are you smiling about, Chief? Jason Tingley greeted him, standing by his car. You look like you just won the lottery. Guy's kid's okay, thank God. I'm relieved, that's all. Are you sure that's all it is? What's that meant to mean? Grace grinned at him. Tingley was a sharp detective who missed nothing. The D.I. looked at his watch. That was a long five minutes. Get lucky in there, did you? It was a purely professional visit. Oh, yes. Ignoring the innuendo, Grace climbed into the car and pulled his seatbelt on. Tingley sat in the passenger seat. None of my business, of course, he said. There was a rap on Grace's window. He lowered it to talk to the tall woman with long fair hair who was holding a reporter's notepad. Detective Superintendent Grace, she queried. Sorry to bother you. I own a Spencer from the Argus. Shit, Grace thought, cursing silently. He should have known that Spinella would be replaced pretty smartly. Can I help you? Is there anything you could tell me about what's happening in the pavilion? I gather there's been a fatality. There'll be a press conference in the morning he said politely. It would appear at the moment that a maintenance worker has been fatally injured in an industrial accident. Are any of the cast of the film involved? Nope, I can assure you of that. I'm sorry we're in a hurry, but I will have more information for you tomorrow. Thank you. 
she said. As he drove off, Tingley commented, Well, at least she's better looking than Spinella. Yeah, and better mannered, Grace said, inserting his phone into the hands-free cradle, then calling the chief constable's number. Five minutes later, Grace pulled the car up on the driveway in front of the Grand Hotel, and they went inside and straight up to the front desk. Grace was aware that, strictly speaking, he shouldn't be doing this kind of legwork they were embarking on, and should have delegated it to a much lower rank, a DC or DS. But having been given overall responsibility for Guy's security, at this moment he wanted to be hands-on. Equally importantly, he genuinely loved real, old-fashioned detective work the slog to find clues and unravel tiny parts of the puzzle. If he let it, his work would keep him permanently desk-bound, and he never wanted that to happen. He showed his warrant card to a young woman on duty on reception, then handed her the plastic room key he'd retrieved from the wallet inside the rucksack in the pavilion's roof space. We need to identify someone who's been fatally injured in an accident, and we found this in what we believe are his belongings. Could you tell us who this room is registered to, please? She inserted the key into her computer, and moments later said, Room 608, Mr. Jerry Baxter. I have an address for him in New York. Tingley jotted it down. Can we see the room, please? Grace asked. I'll phone the duty manager. Actually, the general manager is here. I'll call him. Andrew Mosley had, it seemed to Grace, all the qualities required of a consummate hotelier. Smart appearance, a charming manner, an efficient air and impeccable manners. He took them up in the lift, along the corridor, then knocked dutifully on the door of room 608 and waited some moments. Then he knocked again. When he was satisfied no one was answering, he inserted the key and pushed the door open, calling out a cautious, Hello? before switching on the lights. The two detectives entered the small room, which was furnished with twin beds, an armchair, a round table on which sat a copy of Sussex Life magazine and Absolute Brighton, a side table, and a desk fixed to the wall littered with receipts. There was a window overlooking an internal courtyard, and another door ajar leading through to the bathroom. A suitcase lay open on the floor, and on the top of the clothes inside it lay a dark blue passport bearing a crest and the words United States of America. Grace pulled on a pair of gloves. Tingley followed suit. Then Grace picked up the passport and opened it, flicking rapidly through the pages until he came to the identification one. There was a typically poor quality photo booth image of a hostile looking man in his forties when it was taken, he calculated from the date of issue, with greying hair brushed forward in a page boy fringe. It gave his name as Drayton Robert Wheeler, and date of birth twenty second of march nineteen fifty six, which put him at fifty five years old. His place of birth was New York City, USA. I think this could be our man, Tingley said, staring at a receipt. This is from Halford's. Receipt for a car battery and a tar lever. You said there was a tar lever in the rucksack, right? Grace nodded. Odd things for a tourist to buy. Not as odd as six thermometers, paint stripper and chlorine, the D.I. said, looking at some of the other receipts. Were you any good at chemistry at school? No, not much. I thought you did a CRBN course a few years back. CRBM was training for chemical, radiological, biological and nuclear incidents. Yeah, I did, but I need to go online to check what could be made with this lot. Mercury is used sometimes in bomb-making. Grace turned to the hotel manager. How's your chemistry knowledge? Mosley shook his head. Oh, only very rudimentary, I'm afraid. Stink bombs at school were about my limit. Tingley was frowning at another receipt. A baby monitor from Mother Care? Grace stared at the receipt then realised what the broken plastic fragments he had seen up above the chandelier were. Had Drayton Wheeler been listening to the banqueting room from up above? Then the D.I. said urgently, Look at this, Chief. It was a receipt from an internet cafe, Cafe Connected, dated yesterday, Monday. Grace looked at it. It was for one hour's connection, coffee, mineral water and carrot cake. Ten pounds. Do you know this place? Yes, Tingley said, top of Trafalgar Street. Grace's mind was whirring, thinking about the threatening email that had been sent last night. The two detectives looked at each other. Shall I send someone over there? Tingley asked. Grace shook his head. No, you and I are going there. 
I want to find out for myself. Tingley walked through into the bathroom. On the shelf above the sink was a row of plastic medication tubs. Grace followed him. There were six of them, each labelled with a New York pharmacy prescription band. Grace read them all. This guy was some sort of junkie, Tingley commented. Grace shook his head. No. No, he was ill. How ill? Grace stared at one label in particular. It looks to me like he had cancer. I recognise this. My father died of bowel cancer and was taking this medication too. He thought for a moment. That rude guy, the producer, do you have his phone number? The detective inspector fished out his notebook and flicked through several pages. Yes, I have his mobile number here. Grace keyed it in. He got Larry Brooker's voicemail and left a message for him to call back urgently. Chapter 98 Larry Brooker called back just as they pulled up outside Café Connected. "'Does the name Drayton Wheeler mean anything to you, Mr. Brooker?' Grace asked him, then immediately put his phone on loudspeaker. "'Drayton Wheeler,' the American said. "'Ah, uh, right. Well, yes.' Grace could detect the unease in the American's voice. "'He's just an asshole, trying to make a claim on our story. That kind of thing happens every time you make a high-profile movie. There's always some creep comes crawling out of the woodwork claiming it was their idea and you stole it. Might he have had a genuine grievance against you or your production? Grace asked, glancing at Tingley. Oh, sure. He was threatening to sue us. No big deal. I told him to contact our lawyers. Then, sounding distinctly edgy, suddenly he asked, Has he been in contact with you or something? We think he might be the man lying under the chandelier. There was a long silence. You serious? I won't know for certain until we've formally identified him. Is there anything I can do from my end? Not at the moment. If we make positive identification, then we'll need to interview you tomorrow. Of course. Have you been able to do some filming outdoors tonight? The weather seems to be holding, just. We are. Your officers here are being very cooperative. We'll be shooting until around midnight. Good. Grace then rang Andrew Gully to ask him if, to his knowledge, a Drayton Wheeler or Jerry Baxter had ever sent any obsessive or threatening messages to Gaia. Gully was certain he'd never heard either name. Grace ended the call and they went into the cafe, which was almost empty. A heavily pierced woman in her twenties, in jeans and a baggy blouse, stood behind the bar counter, working in an espresso machine. There was a lounge seating area to the left and an archway beyond the bar through to what looked like a larger area at the rear. On the right was a row of ten workstations, each with a computer terminal. Two were occupied, one by a ponytailed man in his twenties, the other by two teenage girls, one standing looking over the other's shoulder, both of them giggling. Grace looked up at the ceiling and noticed a CCTV camera covering the row of terminals. They walked up to the bar. The woman finished making the coffee, gave them a cursory nod, acknowledging their presence, then took the coffee across to the ponytailed man. When she returned, Grace showed her his warrant card. Detective Superintendent Grace from Sussex CID Major Crime Branch and Detective Inspector Tingley from Brighton CID. She looked a tad bewildered. Yeah? Uh, how can I help you? Grace held out a cellophane evidence bag containing Drayton Wheeler's passport, which was open at the page showing his photograph. Do you recognise this man? She studied it carefully for some moments, then shook her head. No, I'm sorry, no, I don't. He hasn't been in here. Not while I've been here, I'm sure. We believe he was here yesterday evening and paid for one hour's internet access. Ah, oh, right. I wasn't here last night. Well, who was here? The owner and his wife, but they're off today. Can you contact them? She looked at her watch. They've gone to a George Michael concert in London. I shouldn't think they'll hear the phone, but they'll be here all day tomorrow. I can try if you like. We'll come back tomorrow, Grace said. Jason Tingley pointed up at the CCTV camera. Is that working? Yeah, I think so. How long is the footage kept before it gets wiped? Oh, I'm not certain. I believe it's a week. Do you know how to replay footage on it? Grace asked. No. No, I wouldn't dare touch it. 
OK. What time do you open tomorrow? Ten. Right. Now, this is really important, Grace said. Can you please ask the owners, or leave a message for them, to make absolutely sure all footage from yesterday is retained? Yeah. Yes, of course, she said. Grace gave her his card. Then they left. As they climbed back into the car, Jason Tingley said, We have a motive. The cafe-connected receipt put Drayton Wheeler in a place where he could have sent that email last night. In my view, we could start making some assumptions. I hate that word, Jason, he said with a wry smile. As I've often said, in my experience, assumptions are the mother and father of all cock-ups. I prefer to stick with hypotheses. The D.I. grinned. OK, hypotheses. Drayton Wheeler believes he's been screwed by Larry Brooker or his company, so he decides to hit back by sabotaging the production, by killing the leading lady. Why didn't he just sue? Grace replied. Presumably it was money he was after. Tingley tapped the side of his head. Dealing with a crazy. Grace was thinking about the vials of medication in the bathroom. Was this some kind of desperate act by a dying man? But with what aim? Did you ever hear that expression... The more I do this job, the less I know, he asked. Tingley smiled. No, but I understand it. Grace nodded. Please, God, it was Drayton Wheeler who sent that email last night, and that he's the guy under the chandelier. That would be a rather tragic but very elegant solution. Beware of assumptions, didn't you say, Chief? The D.I. remarked with a cheeky grin. Roy Grace, deep in thought, did not respond. He was thinking hard what he needed to do to step up the security for Gaia and her son, regardless of cost, until they could be sure that the threat to her was over. And he had a nagging doubt. Some of it stacked up, but not all of it. Not enough. Chapter 99 It was late when he finally got home to Cleo. She was lying half asleep in bed, with an old Miss Marple episode playing on the television. Murder at the Vicarage, he recognised after a few moments. How are you feeling? He kissed her forehead. I'm OK, but Bump's training for the Olympics. She guided his hand to her stomach, and he could feel their baby zapping around as if on a trampoline. He smiled, proudly and lovingly. It was such an amazing sensation. Their child, his and hers, alive inside her. He lay beside her for some minutes, just holding her tightly and feeling the baby's exertions. Then he kissed her. God, I love you so much, he said. I love you too, she said. But it's no good you coming to bed on an empty stomach. I don't want to lie here listening to it rumble all night. She kissed him. There's a Marks and Sparks fish pie on the worktop. Give it a few minutes in the microwave. It says how many on the pack. And there are some peas in a saucepan. Just bring them to the boil. You spoil me. You're worth spoiling. So, did you save the world tonight? Probably. That's what I love about you, Detective Superintendent Grace. Your modesty. He kissed her again. Yeah, it sort of comes naturally. Oh, yes. By the way, Humphrey refused to go out. He needs to do his business if we don't want a prezi on the carpet in the morning. Oh, I'll take him for a walk. Do you still want the telly on? You can turn it off, please. I'm going to try to sleep, if I can convince Bump. Don't forget about that Gaia documentary I recorded. Oh, I had forgotten. Thanks for reminding me. He went downstairs, clipped the lead on Humphrey's collar with some difficulty, while the overjoyed creature kept jumping up and down, licking his face. Then he took a plastic bag from under the kitchen sink, crammed it into his pocket, and led the dog out of the front door. Humphrey squatted the moment they were in the cobbled courtyard. Wait! Grace hissed. The dog took no notice, defecating firmly and proudly as a neighbour wheeled his bicycle past. Oh, you're going to pick that up, the man mumbled. Grace scooped it up, dearly tempted to push it through the rude cyclist's letterbox. Then he threaded his way with Humphrey through the narrow streets of the North Lane district of Brighton, heading for his favourite part of the city, the seafront itself and the promenade beneath the arches. He deposited the bag in a designated bin, relieved that at least now the dog had performed, he'd be able to let it off the lead. As he walked, he was deep in thought, thinking about the email. Was the man under the chandelier the sender? 
He read it again on his blackberry. I still cannot believe how you cut me dead. I thought your whole point in coming to England was to see me. I know you love me, really. You're going to be sorry you did that, very sorry. You made me look a fool. You made people laugh at me. I'm going to give you the chance to apologize. You're soon going to be telling the whole world how much you love me. I will kill you if you don't. It chimed, but it didn't fit. I thought your whole point in coming to England was to see me. That didn't make sense in the context. You made people laugh at me. I'm going to give you the chance to apologize. You are soon going to be telling the whole world how much you love me. I will kill you if you don't. Drayton Wheelie's actions were just not consistent with that. These weren't the words of a man who believed his story or his script had been ripped off, unless he was a totally confused crazy. Also, from what he knew, an American would have spelt apologize with a Z, not an S. Was sacrificing his life to save Gaia's child some kind of desperate gesture to make Gaia love him? It was a dark night, but the rain was still holding off. There were dozens of people out and about. He walked in the shadow of the palace pier, so preoccupied he barely even clocked it as the place where he and Sandy, some twenty years ago, had had their first kiss. He called Humphrey, clipped his lead back on, then, still deep in thought, he headed home. Chapter 100 Twenty minutes later, Roy Grace put the fish pie into the microwave, switched on the hob, and placed the saucepan of peas on top. Then he took his policy book out of his briefcase and sat down on the sofa to update it. Humphrey entered into a life-or-death tussle with a squeaky stuffed elephant on the floor. It was 12.30 a.m., and he felt wired. He picked up the Sky remote and clicked through the saved programs until he saw the one Cleo had recorded for him on Gaia, and clicked on it. Squeak, 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 grrr. Humphrey's tussle continued. He scooped his food onto a plate, put it on a tray with a napkin and cutlery and a glass of Spanish Alberino from the fridge, and sat back down. For the next twenty minutes as he ate, tuning out the dog, Gaia's life unfolded in front of him. From the modest house where she lived as a child on Brighton's Whitehawk housing estate, to her first success at the age of fifteen on a television talent show, to her move to Los Angeles in her late teens, where she started off waiting tables, followed by an affair with a record producer who picked her up in a noodle bar on Sunset and gave her her big break, cutting her first single with the same session musicians that had been behind both Madonna and Whitney Houston's early recordings. There were periodic close-ups of Gaia saying how important it was for everyone to treat the planet with respect. "'I love you, love me,' was one of her catchphrases for that message. There followed vignettes of concerts she'd performed around the globe. Grace grinned at one in Munich, where she appeared in German national costume of a dirndl holding an accordion and knocking back beer from a gigantic stein. Then another in Freiburg, capital of the Black Forest, where she was kitted out in Lederhosen. Then, suddenly in a costume switch, she stormed on stage, in front of an enraptured audience, in a cloud of swirling dry ice, jumping right, then left, holding a hunting rifle, wearing a man's tweed suit. A bright yellow ochre suit, with a loud check pattern. Grace's tray crashed to the floor as he grabbed the remote and froze the image. He ignored the upended plate in his spilled wine glass as he stared, transfixed at the screen. He wound it back some seconds, then let it play, and then froze it again. It was exactly the same fabric that had been found in the chicken farm, the same fabric that had been found at the fishing lake. He was certain, beyond certain, Gaia was wearing it on stage in front of him on the Bavarian leg of her German tour last autumn. He froze the image again, reached for his phone and dialed Andrew Gully. Inspector Grace, he answered. How can I help you? I apologise for calling so late, but this could be important. No problem, Inspector. Do you have any news for me? Well, this may sound a strange request, Grace said. I gather Gaia often auctions off the clothes she wears at concerts, and gives the money raised to green causes. Is that correct? Ah, she's very committed. I need to know about a yellow tweed suit that she wore at a concert in Bavaria last autumn. 
In a wry tone displaying rare humour, Gully said, "'You're not going weird on me, are you, Inspector?' I'm not going weird on you, I can assure you. I need to know about that suit really urgently. It could be relevant to her safety. Would you by any chance recall if she put it up for auction? You want to describe it to me? Grace gave him the details. I'll come back to you in the morning. No, I need you to come back to me tonight. If you have to wake her up, then apologize to her for me, but it really is urgent. Okay, leave it with me, Inspector. Grace continued to play and replay the scene fixated on the suit. Then he cleared up the mess on the floor and was just pouring himself another glass of wine when Gully called back. Inspector Grace, I just spoke with Gaia. This was a while back, you have to appreciate, but so far as she can remember, that suit was auctioned last fall, October or November. She seemed to think it fetched quite a large sum, more than usual. Thank you, Grace said. Anything else I can help you with tonight? Have you made any progress on the chandelier? I have a crime scene team and a police search team working through the night. I appreciate your increasing the police presence around the hotel tonight, Gully said, but I minded to recommend Gaia flies back to Los Angeles tomorrow. I'm looking into flights. Wouldn't you have an issue with the film schedule? Yeah, but her safety and the kids' safety are more important. Well, I'd appreciate if you waited for our findings tomorrow. I'm not happy with the situation, Gully said. To Grace... He did not sound like a man who was ever happy, but he didn't tell him that. Instead, he replied, Well, then I guess my job is to make sure you are happy. I remain to be convinced. He ended the call, then immediately phoned Glenn Branson to update him about the fabric. Then he replayed the entire scene in the video again. Thirty minutes later, when the documentary had reached Guy's first movie role, he fell asleep on the sofa. Chapter 101 The production did not wrap until almost 1am. Part of the problem causing constant delays to the outdoors filming, Anna Galicia could see, watching among the thinning crowd of onlookers from New Road, was the constant coming and going of police, fire brigade and scientific support vehicles. The scene they were filming was Gaia, or rather Maria Fitzherbert, bewildered and in tears, storming out of the front entrance of the pavilion, having been dumped by her royal lover. Although the crowd were kept too far back to hear what was being said, except for that final call announcing it was a wrap, it was clear that Gaia had been keeping everyone waiting and was in an irritable mood tonight. Big surprise there, bloody bitch. She watched her return to her motorhome. Finally, at 1.20 a.m., someone emerged, a fit-looking female in jeans and a blouson jacket, and it took Anna a moment to realise this was Gaia with cropped hair. She was accompanied by an assistant, and instantly surrounded by her security guards. Much earlier, Anna had watched the boy leave, accompanied by another assistant and two security guards, presumably back to the hotel, to bed. There were rumours going round the crowd that he'd narrowly missed being killed by a falling chandelier. Shame that, she thought. She'd have liked to have seen Guy grieving, although it would have messed up her plans. The convoy of five black Range Rovers swept out of the grounds, and there was a general hive of activity in their wake, lamps being shut down, equipment being moved and stowed in the trucks parked in the grounds. The police cordon broke up, and within ten minutes several white Sussex police vans had arrived and were loading up with officers. Anna, watching keenly, began walking, looking for her opportunity. It came sooner than she'd anticipated. As she reached the entrance to the car park at the rear of the Dome Concert Hall, she saw that the three police officers who had been manning the cordon were walking away. Two people were closing up the catering truck, and four men were occupied in lifting some camera dolly track. No one took any notice of her as she slipped between the trucks, then over to the motorhomes. She paused in the shadows between Judd Halpins and Gaia's and looked around. Neither had lights on inside. She saw a security guard standing nearby smoking a cigarette and talking on his phone or radio, looking away from her. Now! She stepped up to the front door of Gaia's trailer, clutching the key she collected from A.D. Motorhomes in St. Albans earlier in the day, and slipped it into the lock. Then she turned it. Chapter 102 Roy Grace woke up at 2 a.m. in front of the television to see Jack Nicholson on the screen, 
in a hard hat, standing in flat open land in front of the nodding dog arm of an oil derrick. He yawned and hit the off button. Humphrey was fast asleep beside him, the half-destroyed stuffed elephant lying on the floor below him. He hauled himself upstairs, brushed his teeth and fell into bed. But for the next three hours he barely slept a wink, a jumble of disturbed thoughts playing like a video inside his head. Gaia was in all of them. So was the chief constable, Tom Martinson, repeatedly berating him for missing a vital clue. Completely wide awake at 5 a.m., he slipped out of bed, careful not to disturb Cleo, padded through into the bathroom and closed the door. He showered, shaved, and brushed his teeth, then dressed and went downstairs. Humphrey was still curled up on the sofa asleep. He picked up his briefcase and stepped out into the courtyard. It was now almost full daylight and raining lightly. Fifteen minutes later, using his security card, he let himself in through the front door of Sussex House, climbed the stairs, walked through the deserted offices of the major crime branch, and entered his office. He put his briefcase down, went into the kitchenette area, and made himself a strong coffee which he carried back to his office. Then he logged on to the internet and entered a Google search for Gaia and auctions. There were thousands of results, but it didn't take him long, narrowing down the criteria he entered, to find what he was looking for. The auction for the yellow check suit had taken place over two weeks last November. The suit had been sold for £27,200. Although he didn't know much about these things, that struck him as a lot of money. However good the provenance might have been that it really had belonged to Gaia, to pay that amount it needed someone either very rich or seriously fanatical, or both. Chapter 103 On a whiteboard in the conference room of the major crime suite was a blow-up of Drayton Wheeler's passport photograph. The time is 8.30am, Wednesday, June the 15th. This is the 21st briefing of Operation Icon, Roy Grace said to his team, which this morning included D.I. Tingley, Hayden Kelly and Ray Packham from the High Tech Crime Unit. We have developments that are leading me to believe Operation Icon may have links to the real-life Icon who is currently here in Brighton shooting a movie, Gaia. He registered the immediate, highly focused attention he had from every single member of his team. Then he relayed the events of last night, his viewing of the Gaia video, and his search on the internet this morning. He looked at D.C. Reeves. Emma, I found the winning bid amount that was paid for the suit from the eBay site, but it wouldn't give me any details about the bidders. We need to find that out very urgently. I'm tasking you to contact eBay and find out the names of all the people involved in that auction. As soon as you have them, I want them checked against all databases. In particular, we need to find the underbidder who didn't get it. Yes, sir, she said. He turned to Ray Packham. No one could look less like a computer geek than the high-tech crime unit analyst, but his mastery of technology was better than anyone Grace had ever met. You've looked yourself, Ray, and not been able to find it either? No, Chief, but eBay should be able to come up with the information pretty quickly. Good. And you have a result for us on that email sent on Monday night? I do, he said proudly. We've looked at the IP address on it, and I've got some good news. It's a fixed IP registered at the Internet Cafe, Cafe Connected, in Trafalgar Street. It was sent from there at 8.46pm Monday night. You're a genius. I know, Packham said, with a tongue-in-cheek grin. Grace pointed at Drayton Wheeler's passport photograph on the whiteboard. The man's body has not yet been formally identified, but we're satisfied that this is the man crushed to death by the chandelier last night. Grace then listed the receipts found in his hotel room. The Café Connected receipt puts Wheeler in that café on Monday, the day the email was sent. We need to find out what time he was there. Norman, I want you to be there at 10am when it opens. Potty nodded. Yes, Chief. If we can establish Wheeler was there at 8.46pm on Monday, that could be good news. If he wasn't there at that time, we need to know who was. Hopefully you can get a result from the CCTV. Leave it with me. Grace glanced at his notes. Socko, who'd been working through the night, reported their findings to me a short while ago. Mercuric chloride is an acid that apparently can be synthesised very easily from mercury, obtained from thermometers, sulfuric acid from car batteries, and hydrochloric acid found in paint stripper. 
Receipts for all these items were present in Wheeler's room at the Grand. Socko tell me that mercuric chloride is particularly efficient at dissolving aluminium, which is what the shaft supporting the chandelier was made from. Chief, D.S. Guy Bachelor said, I'm having problems connecting the dots between the suit fabric and the chandelier. Join the club, Grace said. The connection is Gaia, and I can't guarantee we can connect the dots, Guy, but I'm treating it as a line of inquiry, OK? The DS nodded. The most urgent thing we need to do at this moment is establish whether or not Drayton Wheeler sent that email, Grace continued. I'm hoping he did, because if he didn't, we have a big problem. Chapter 104 This was not Norman Potting's idea of a café. This was just another instance of how the world was changing in ways he didn't like and didn't understand. Fancy leather sofas and computer terminals. Couldn't people even have a cuppa without needing to be online, for God's sake? He liked traditional greasy spoons, with formica tabletops, plastic chairs, the odour of fried food, a menu chalked up on the wall, and a good, honest mug of strong tea. Why, he wondered, looking up at the menu printed in some barely decipherable fancy lettering, was there no such thing as an ordinary cup of coffee any more? Why did everyone have to dress the menu up in an incomprehensible, bloody, arcane language of its own? Although he did eye the range of cupcakes greedily. "'Can I help you?' said a solidly built goth woman behind the bar, wearing blue dungarees, tattoos running down both her arms, and so many rings through her nostrils he wondered how she managed to breathe or blow her nose. He noticed a tongue stud, too, and her forehead piercings which made him wince. Apart from the two of them, at a few minutes past ten a.m., the place was deserted. Potting produced his warrant card. Oh, yes, Zoe said to expect you. He showed her a copy of the receipt found in Drayton Wheeler's hotel room. We're anxious to establish what time this person was here on Monday. Then he placed a blow-up of Wheeler's passport photo in front of her. Do you remember this man? She studied it for a moment. Yeah, absolutely, I do. He was frankly very rude. American, really quite unpleasant. Can you remember what time he was in here? Was it Monday evening? She studied the photograph again. No. No, I think it was lunchtime. I remember we were very busy and he got angry because he was having problems getting online. We had a server crash. He started shouting abuse at one of my staff. My husband gave him his money back and told him to leave. You're certain? One hundred percent. You have CCTV here? She pointed up at the ceiling-mounted camera. Yeah, we installed it after we had a couple of terminals nicked. You get such a nice class of people in this city. You're telling me. Would you be able to show me the footage between 8.30pm and 9pm on Monday? I'll ask my husband. He knows how to operate it. She turned and shouted through the archway. Craig, I need you. Moments later, a short, thin man appeared with a shaven head, even mortitude and pierced in his wife. Late at night, in a dark alley, it'd have scared the shit out of anyone, Potting thought. But here in daylight, he looked surprisingly meek and spoke with a friendly, rather weedy voice. Potting explained what he needed, and five minutes later was seated with a trendily large teacup with a clumsy handle in a sparse office at the back of the café, staring up at a monitor. The time was displayed digitally in the top right-hand corner of the screen. The image quality wasn't great, but clear enough for his purpose. He could see five of the ten terminals were occupied. Three were young men who looked like students. The fourth was an attractive girl in her early twenties. The fifth was a middle-aged woman wearing a leather baseball cap, a polo neck sweater and a bomber jacket with the collar turned up. By 8.35pm, four of the occupants had left, leaving the woman in the leather baseball cap on her own. Shortly after 8.46, she rose and walked up towards the counter out of shot. Then a couple of minutes later, she came back into frame, leaving the premises. Her, Potting said. Do you remember her? Yes, yes I do, Craig said. We get a lot of oddballs in here. She was definitely one of them. In what sense? Well, sort of just her manner... And she had a very husky voice, you know, like someone who's a, a heavy smoker. And before she started her session, she asked how much we charged, and I told her two pounds for half an hour, or three pounds for an hour. And she said she needed to draw some cash out, 
and asked if there was a, a hole in the war machine anywhere around. I remember telling her the nearest one was just up in Queen's Road, an HSBC. And she went to it? He shrugged. She went out and came back ten minutes later. I remember she paid with a brand new ten pound note, and I thought that must have come straight out of the machine. I need to borrow the disc, Potting said. Do you have any objection? The man hesitated. I can't get a warrant, if you insist. Craig shook his head. No, no, that's fine. Potting took the disc, then hurried up to the top of Trafalgar Street, walking through the archway beneath Brighton Station, then turned left into Queen's Road. He saw the HSBC bank, with two cash machines diagonally across to his left. Chapter 105 Glenn Branson sat at his terminal in MIR-1 with a row of index cards laid out in front of him. On one was written, Torso at Stonery Farm. On another was, Arms and Legs Found in West Sussex Piscatorial Society Lake. On the third, Suit Fabric at Stonery Farm, West Sussex Piscatorial Society Lake, and Gaia German Tour. The fourth was headed Miles Royce, the fifth Drayton Wheeler. It was a method he employed whenever he found himself stuck. Each card related to photographs pinned to the whiteboards above the workstations where the investigation team were working in mostly silent concentration. Every few moments he could hear Norman Potting's irritating voice. The DS always seemed to speak louder than anyone else when he was on the phone, as if assuming the person down the other end of the line was hard of hearing. Then a female voice interrupted Branson. Sir? He looked up to see the tall figure of D.C. Reeves, in a bright red dress and flaxen hair, standing over him, looking excited. "'I have something from eBay that might be significant.' "'What?' "'They've been really helpful. I've got the entire history of the auction for Guy's suit, and all the names of the bidders. It ended up with just two people who between them drove the price up from £700 to the final winning bid of £27,200.' "'Well, that was some bidding war. Incredible.' "'I know.' and the winning bidder was none other than our jigsaw puzzle man, Miles Royce. Royce? Branson said. He frowned. I thought he already had this suit. He bought one. Yes, sir, Emma Reeves agreed. But he didn't own this one, Gaia's personal suit worn by her at a concert. That's what gives it kudos and value to a collector. Yeah, I get it, but shit, you've got to be sad to pay that kind of money. Guy gives it all to charity, apparently. Emma Reeves said. And for the collector, it could be a good investment. Branson shrugged. Even so, you'd have to want something real bad. I think these collectors do, sir. Anyhow, I gave the names of all the other bidders to Annalise Veneer, and she's run checks on them. Remember an incident at the Grand Hotel last week when an overzealous Gaia fan got pushed over by one of her security guards? This fan called the police who attended. Subsequently, it was found that she'd given them a false address. Yep, Branson said. Her name was Anna Garley, Galicia, or something like that, right? Spot on, Galicia. Well, she was the underbidder on this auction for the yellow suit. Branson absorbed this for some moments. A possibility was shaping in his mind. A motive? Had they been looking down the wrong track? Could anger over the suit be behind this murder? Were the yellow cloth fragments of the deposition sites put there deliberately, out of some kind of spite. Norman Potting, who had just ended his call, looked up. You're talking about a female guy you're obsessive? Branson gave him a surly look. Possibly. I just got back a short while ago from that internet place, Cafe Connected. He held up a CD. This is a footage of the person who was online at 8.46pm Monday night, when the threatening email was sent to Gaia. Like an actor playing to an audience, Potting took a deliberate pause before going on. It's a woman. This was greeted by frowns and a brief silence. A woman, Guy Bachelor said. Yep. Is there footage of her walking? Hayden Kelly, sitting just opposite him, asked. I think so, a bit, Potting said. May I see it? Potting handed him the disc. Kelly loaded it immediately. This person, wherever she is, went to an HSBC bank hole in the wall machine in Queen's Road around 8.30pm on Monday to make a cash withdrawal. 
Potting said. There are two ATMs side by side. I've just been on to the bank asking them to let us have details of all the people who made cash withdrawals from these machines between 8.15 and 9pm on Monday to allow for the machine clocks being slightly wrong. I should have it a bit later today. Glenn Branson stood over Hayden Kelly's shoulder and studied the distinct, if poor quality, colour image. You can fast forward through the first few minutes as the others leave the cafe, Hayden, Potting said. The forensic podiatrist did so, then slowed as the clock counter approached 2044. Only the woman in the leather cap was there now. From her body language, it was clear she had a decisive moment around 2046. Shortly after that, she appeared to log off, then stood up and walked towards the counter and out of shot. You see her again shortly, Potting said. Two minutes later, she walked back into frame briefly, then left the premises. Shit! Hayden Kelly exclaimed. What? Branson asked him. I can't be sure. I need to see more footage, the podiatrist said. Sure of what? The gate. Well, what's it telling you? I need to see more of this person walking before I can be certain. The CCTV room at John Street Police Station would be bound to have caught her on camera, Guy Batchelor said. The whole of Queen's Road's covered. Branson turned to Nick Nickel. Nick, take Hayden down there right away. As Nickel stood up, Glenn Branson asked, Does anyone know how to get still photographs of video like this? Ask Martin Bloomfield on an imaging. He'll be able to do it. Thirty minutes later, Branson left the building with two printed and enhanced blow-ups of the woman in the leather cap. One was full length, the other of just her face. He climbed into his alligated, unmarked car and drove out through the green gates of the building, heading towards the seafront and the Grand Hotel. Chapter 106 The pavement outside the Grand was crowded with fans with their mobile phone cameras, and paparazzi with their long lenses, all hopeful of catching a glimpse of the icon. The doorman stood well back against the front entrance, as if defending it, as he studied the photograph Glen Branson held up. Yes, he said. Oh, yes, very definitely. Well, no doubt at all? Glen asked. Part of my job is to remember faces, sir, Colin Bonner said. I've been doing this a long time. Regulars get upset if you don't recognise them. I never forget a face. If you need verification, we're bound to have it on CCTV. I would like to see that, he replied. Not because I don't trust your judgment, but I'd like to take a look for myself. I'll speak to security, sir. Won't keep you a moment. He hurried into the building. Glenn looked at his watch. 11.23 a.m. Gaia was staying here. One of the greatest stars in the world, and Ari had refused to let their kids play with her son. How ship was that? He stared up, wondering which her room was. One of these on the front facade with a sea view for sure. He had to make sure he got her autograph for Sammy and Remy while she was staying here, at least. He stared at the slow-moving traffic, and at people ambling along the promenade on the far side, occasionally being pinged out of the way by an irked rider as they trespassed unwittingly on the cycle path. Early June, and already it looked as if many of them were holiday-makers. Holiday, he thought wistfully. The last holiday he'd had was in Cornwall, with Harry nearly two years ago. It had rained for a solid fortnight. That hadn't done their fading relationship much good. Right, sir, they're just setting it up for you now. Branson turned. Great, thank you. No, sir, it's my pleasure, absolutely my pleasure. Roy Grace had just arrived back from two awkward meetings. The first with ACC Peter Rigg, who wanted to know how, despite the tight security that Grace had been requested to plan, someone had managed to hide directly above where the filming was taking place and had been a fraction of a second away from killing Gaia's son. The second had been with the chief constable, who had been a little more understanding but unhappy nonetheless. But Rigg had not tried to hide his fury. Sitting in front of him, Roy Grace felt as if he were back in the presence of his former boss, the acerbic Alison Vosper, who delighted in putting him on the spot at any opportunity. When he attempted to explain the difficulties of securing a site to which the general public had daily access, the ACC snorted in derision. "'My dear fellow,' he said pompously, 
You are tasked with the overall responsibility for Gaia's safety while she is a guest in our city, and so far you've given a less than impressive performance. You knew there was a threat to her life. Did it not occur to you to check the roof spaces? As something utterly elementary? It did, sir, and they were checked. The police checked thoroughly initially, and it's been down to the pavilion's own security since then. I'm a homicide investigator, not a security analyst or expert. Well, thank God you're not. I'd hate to be in a situation where my life or the safety of my family was dependent on any plan you produced to protect them. What's up, Manny? Were you sleepwalking or something? It's all over the bloody news. You've seen the front page of the Argus? Gaia's son escapes death by inches. The ACC's criticism wasn't fair, Grace knew. If they'd had an unlimited budget, no one would have got into that damned roof space, but the truth was, with the battle he'd had to get even very limited resources for Gaia's security, there were inevitably going to be gaps. It wasn't unreasonable to expect that the pavilion would have been capable of protecting itself. And Rig was very definitely being unreasonable at this moment. But he wasn't about to tell him that. The police force was a hierarchical system, in many ways, it was like the military. You respected rank senior to yourself and obeyed them without question, whatever you really thought. There were gaps in the security that should not have been there, Roy Grace conceded. It looks like we were lucky. But I don't like that word lucky, the assistant chief constable said. Being lucky was better than the alternative, Grace thought, but did not say. Chapter 107 Shortly after 4pm, the steady concentration of the 17 people currently packed around the three large workstations in MIR-1 was broken by a loud curse from Norman Potting. Several people looked up. Then the steady putter of keyboards resumed. A mobile phone rang playing green sleeves, and Nick Nickel answered it quickly. Bella crunched on a Malteser. She had been tasked with contacting all the bidders on this and previous eBay auctions of Gaia memorabilia, in the hope one of them might know the elusive Anna Galicia personally. Meanwhile, down in the high-tech crime unit, Ray Packham was trying to navigate a path through a complex trail of encrypted email accounts. If they'd hoped to find her quickly, by following the trail back from PayPal, they were going to have to be very patient. It was going to take days, and possibly weeks, if ever. Potting cursed again. Then he said, "'Bloody banks! Can you bloody believe it?' "'Believe what, Norman?' Glen Branson asked, secretly pleased that Potting was struggling. Badly, though he wanted this case solved, he really hoped it wouldn't be Potting who made the breakthrough. Potting turned to face him. "'We're reasonably certain that Anna Galicia went to one of the two HSBC hole-in-the-wall machines in Queen's Road at around 8.30pm on Monday.' The CCTV room has images of her approaching the machine and then leaving it around that time. The banker telling me there were seven withdrawals from those two machines between 8.15 and 9 p.m. that night, and all of them were mail accounts. Maybe her card didn't work in those machines, Branson said. We've all had that happen. Don't they have CCTV running? A lot of them have a camera that looks outwards, so you can see the faces of everyone using the machines. Well, I've asked for that, Potting said. It's going to take them an hour or so. They're going to email me the image sequence they have, along with all the names and addresses of the people who use the machine. So we'll see then if she appears. Have you got a list of all the other cash machines at easy walking distance from those two? Bella asked him. Glenn watched her face. She looked more attractive every time he looked at her, and it really stung him to see this interaction between her and Potting. It was almost like she was feeding him a pre-re-rehearsed prompt to big him up. I have, Potting said, grinning smugly as ever. There's a Santander bank, a Barclays and a Halifax. I'm waiting for information back from all of them. Roy Grace entered the room, turning his head to see who was here. Then he turned to Glenn. How are we doing? Apart from the doorman of the Grand confirming the Anna Galicia we're looking for is the same person involved in the incident with Guy's bodyguards last week. Nothing else so far, boss. What's happening at the pavilion? The chandelier's been removed into police storage, Grace reported, much to the outrage of the curator. The search team have found a baby monitor transmitter underneath a table in the banqueting room. It's a mother care make, consistent with the receipt in Wheeler's hotel room, and consistent with the broken receiver up in the roof space above the chandelier. 
I've given permission to the producers to re-enter the building and film in the banqueting room tonight. They're planning to shoot indoors without the chandelier. The producer just told me that they'll be able to add it in afterwards through some computer-generated technique. Grace looked at his watch, worried. So we can't be certain that email was not sent by Wheeler, but it's looking unlikely. Is that about the right assessment? The timings don't work for Wheeler, Branson said. Timings were very much on Grace's mind at the moment. Within the next hour, Guy would be leaving the security of her hotel suite and going to the pavilion. On his advice, she'd remained in her suite all day, and her son was staying in the suite this evening. Grace had arranged for his goddaughter Jay Summers to come over for a couple of hours to play. He knew Guy was safe all the time she was in the hotel, but he was worried about the pavilion. Had Rig been too harsh on him, or did the ACC have a valid point? Had it been a visit from a member of the royal family or a senior politician, they'd have searched the building with a fine-toothed comb and sealed off all areas such as cellars and roof spaces where a potential perpetrator could hide either themselves or a bomb, but as the film company required unrestricted daily access, and it remained open to the public, security was always going to be an issue. Had he been too complacent? Well, that wasn't going to happen again tonight. During the past two hours the building had been searched with the same rigour as if a political conference was being staged there. But even so, it was impossible to protect someone totally against a lone fanatic. He was still mindful of the chilling words of the IRA after they blew up the Grand Hotel back in 1984 in a failed attempt to murder the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. They sent a message saying, Today we were unlucky, but remember, we only have to be lucky once. You will have to be lucky always. He was not going to let Gaia be lucky. Luck was damn well not going to come into this equation. Quality police work, that was all, and everyone was briefed. Chapter 108 Much of the central area of the city was under constant CCTV surveillance, with cameras capable of zooming in to a tight close-up from a distance of several hundred yards. The nerve centre of the operation was the CCTV room on the fifth floor of Brighton's John Street Police Station. It was a large space, with blue carpet and dark blue chairs. There were three separate workstations, each comprising a bank of monitors, keyboards, computer terminals and telephones. Civilian controllers sat behind two of the workstations. One of them, wearing a headset, was busily engaged in a police operation, tracking a drug dealer's movements. But the other, John Pumphrey, a fresh-faced man in his late thirties, with neat brown hair wearing a lightweight black jacket, was occupied with helping Hayden Kelly navigate through the system in his search for sightings of Anna Galicia. The forensic podiatrist, cradling a tepid Starbucks coffee, had cramp in his right thigh. He had been seated at this console since shortly before midday, with the exception of one quick break to grab a sandwich and this coffee, and it was now coming up to 5 p.m. A kaleidoscope of images of parts of the city of Brighton and Hove and other Sussex locations changed constantly on the multiple screens. People walking, buses moving, a sudden zoom shot onto a man standing by a wheelie bin. Kelly had spotted Anna Galicia on six different cameras so far during Monday evening. In the first, she was seen walking in the direction of Cafe Connected. In the second, she was heading towards the location of the HSBC cash machines in Queen's Road. In the third, fourth and fifth images, she was walking around the outside of the pavilion grounds, threading her way through the crowds of onlookers. In the sixth, she was walking towards the Old Steiner at 11.24pm. Although there was extensive camera coverage around that area, she did not reappear. John Pumphrey told Kelly that her disappearance from vision indicated she'd probably taken a bus or jumped into a taxi and gone home for the night. They were now scrolling through the images in the area around the pavilion grounds from yesterday, fast-forwarding through the whole day on each of the different cameras in turn, in the hope of seeing her again. Kelly glanced at his watch, mindful that he needed to be back at Sussex House for the 6.30pm briefing. It was almost 5pm. He already had more than enough for his purposes, and he was excited about what he had to report. Then something caught his eye. He frowned. John, I'll go back a few seconds. The controller moved his stick, and the image began reversing. Stop, 
Kelly commanded. The time on the screen displayed as 1 p.m. yesterday, Tuesday. The image froze. What street is this? Kelly asked. This new road. Okay. Zoom in on that guy, please. The image of a balding man in a business suit filled the screen. He stepped out of the front door of an office building, hesitated, held a hand out as if to check if it was still raining. Now, go slow forward, please. Kelly watched with growing excitement as the man walked out of frame. Then he said, Keep it running. You can fast forward. I think he'll be back. The forensic podiatrist was right. Ten minutes later, the man returned holding a small paper bag. He shot a glance at a bicycle chained to a lamppost, then went back into the office building. I need a copy of that, please, he said to the controller. A few minutes later, when Pumphrey handed it to him, he loaded it straight into his laptop, then ran the software he'd developed for gate analysis on it. After he had taken off the measurements and calculations, he made a comparison with the figures computed from the footage of Anna Galicia walking. And now he could barely contain his excitement. Chapter 109 Norman Potting sat at his workstation in MIR-1, puzzled. He now had images emailed to him from all the hole-in-the-wall machines within a short walking distance of Café Connected. HSBC, Barclays, Halifax and Santander Banks had responded quickly and efficiently. He scrolled through them, looking in turn at four female and sixteen male faces, and something was not making sense. All twenty people had made cash withdrawals from these machines, within his parameter of 8.15 and 9.00 p.m. Monday evening. Despite the poor image quality, one woman bore a reasonable resemblance to Anna Galicia. She had apparently attempted a transaction from an HSBC machine on Queen's Road at 8.31 p.m., but there was no withdrawal showing under her name. One explanation, the bank had told him, was that her card had been declined, but they were still a bit mystified why no record showed up at all. Another suggestion was that she was using a card that had been stolen, but not yet reported missing. A withdrawal was made one minute later, at 8.32 p.m., in a man's name. The detective sergeant was on the verge of deciding he'd drawn a blank with this particular line of inquiry, when for the second time this afternoon the normal studious quiet of the major incident room was broken. This time there was an exuberant whoop from Hayden Kelly, who entered with such speed and force that the door swung back and struck the wall behind it with a bang loud enough to make sure everyone looked up with a start. I cracked it! He shouted across the room at Roy Grace, beaming like an exuberant kid and brandishing two CD cases in the air. What? What have you cracked? Anna Galicia? Grace asked. The forensic podiatrist moved Grace's keyboard aside and set his laptop down on the worktop. He flipped open the lid and tapped in his code. Moments later, Grace was staring at a screen that was split vertically. On the left-hand side, he saw what looked like CCTV footage of the woman he recognised from earlier, Anna Galicia, walking along a street in Brighton. On the right-hand side of the screen was a balding man in a business suit. Along the top were several columns of spinning numbers and algebraic symbols that seemed to be calibrating and recalibrating as each person walked. Hayden Kelly pointed to the left screen. See our mysterious Anaglicia? Grace nodded. There's a good reason why no one's been able to find her. Which is? Kelly pointed at the right-hand screen, at the balding man in the business suit. Because that is her. Grace looked at the forensic podiatrist's face for an instant in case he was joking, but he appeared deadly serious. How the hell do you know? Gauge analysis. See all those computations on the screen. I can do the analysis visually to a pretty high degree of accuracy because I've done it for so long, but those calculations done by the algorithm I developed add certainty. There's a very minor variation because a woman is on high heels and the man is wearing conventional male shoes, but they're the same person. No question. Beyond doubt? I'll bet my life on it. Chapter 110 Roy Grace stared at the screen, his eyes switching from the woman to the man to the woman again, feeling a sudden chill deep in the pit of his stomach. Glenn, 
he said. Come and see this. Branson stepped over, looked at the screen and exclaimed, That looks like our friend Eric Whiteley. Whiteley? Grace said, the name ringing a strong bell and trying to place it. Yeah, the weirdo accountant me and Bella interviewed. That's the outside front door of his office. Who's taken it? Norman Potting looked up. I've got something interesting here about Eric Whiteley, assuming it's the same one, Glenn. In what context? Could just be a strange coincidence, but I've got the name Eric Whiteley just come in on an email from HSBC. Potting said. I've got a list of all people who made cash withdrawals at Hole in the Wall Machines close to Cafe Connected on Monday night. According to the bank, he drew £50 out of one of their machines in Queen's Road at 8.32pm. Well, do they have his photograph? Well, this is a strange thing. They haven't. Potting pointed at his own screen. This is the person who appears to have withdrawn the money, Anna Galicia. The bank thinks it's possible she's stolen his card. Dem Branson was shaking his head. No. No, she hasn't stolen Eric Whiteley's card. She is Eric Whiteley. Grace looked at his watch. 5.20 p.m. He radioed the control room and asked for the on-duty Ops 1 controller. Moments later, he was through to Inspector Andy Kill, a highly competent man he liked working with. He explained the situation as quickly as he could and asked for uniformed and plainclothes officers to go to Whiteley's office with luck catching him before he left for the day and arrest him. He told Kill to warn them the man could be violent. When he ended the call, he instructed Guy Batchelor and Emma Reeves to take an unmarked car to Whiteley's home address and sit close by in case Whiteley showed up. Next he told Nick Nickel to get a search warrant for both Whiteley's home and his office signed by a magistrate and then to head directly to Whiteley's house. Next, he spoke to the Ops 1 controller again and asked for a unit from the local support team, the public order unit, which specialised in executing warrants and wore full protective clothing, including visors for the purpose, a pulser and search officers to stand by near to Whiteley's house, but out of sight, until Nickel arrived with a search warrant, then to go straight in, accompanied by D.S. Batchelor and D.C. Reeves. Again, he cautioned the man might be violent. Less than five minutes later, Andy Kill radioed Roy Grace back with news from two response officers who were now on site at the offices of accountants Feline Bradley Hamilton. Eric Whiteley had not turned up for work today. His office hadn't heard from him, and he had not responded to their calls. Shit, Roy Grace thought. Shit, shit, shit! The deep chill inside him was rapidly turning into the white heat of panic. The innocuous ones. So often it was the meek, mild-looking guys who turned out to be monsters. The UK's worst-ever serial killer, Harold Shippen, a bearded, bespectacled, kindly-looking family doctor who just happened to have a penchant for killing his patients and dispatched 218 of them, and possibly many more. He stared at Whiteley's image on the screen. One thing he knew for sure. Someone who was capable of killing once was well capable of killing again. And again. His mind was spinning. Whiteley had not showed up for work all day. He turned to Glenn Branson. Glenn, you spoke to Eric Whiteley's boss a few days ago, didn't you? Yes, Chief. Do I remember right that he said the man was a bit of a, an oddball, but a very reliable employee? Yeah. Said he was a loner, but yes, totally reliable. So him not showing up for work all day without contacting the office or having an outside appointment in his diary is out of character? Yeah, it would seem so. But we do know that he occasionally works away from the office at the premises of clients. Grace was liking this less and less. Hopefully the man was sick, in bed. But in his bones he didn't think so. He called Guy Batchelor. How are you doing? A blast of expletives came back down the phone, followed by, That sodding bus lane! Sorry, Roy, but we're sitting in gridlock from Rodine all the way through to Peacehaven. OK, well, let me know when you're on site. Grace immediately radioed the Ops 1 controller again. And did you have a unit in the Peacehaven area? I'll check. Send the nearest one straight to Eric Whiteley's house. I need to establish if he's at home. Top priority. Leave it with me. Grace was suddenly craving a cigarette. But he didn't carry any on him these days, and he didn't have time to find someone to bum one from, and even less time to go outside and smoke it. 
Please, God, let Whiteley be at home. And if he wasn't? He was thinking of Gaia. She seemed to be a sweet and fragile person behind her tough public persona. He liked her. He was utterly determined to do all he possibly could to protect her and her son. After the incident with the chandelier, the consequences of any similar occurrences were not worth thinking about, neither morally nor career-wise. He glanced at the serials, the log of all incidents in Sussex that was updated constantly. So far it was a quiet afternoon, which was good because that meant most of the officers on duty would be available if needed. He was thinking ahead. Clearly Andrew Gully had not managed to convince Gaia to leave town, as the production's call sheet, which he'd requested and was lying in front of him, required her in make-up at 4 p.m. and on set at 6 p.m. Andrew Kill got back to him. Roy, I've got a neighbourhood policing team car at Whiteley's house now. They're not getting any response from the doorbell or knocking, and they can't see or hear any sign of movement inside the house. Grace was tempted to instruct them to break in. If Whiteley was unconscious or dead, it would change the whole dynamics. But the fact the man had not turned up for work wasn't sufficient grounds. They needed the warrant. Twenty anxious minutes later, Nick Nickel called him to say he had the warrant signed by a magistrate who lived close to Whiteley's house in Peacehaven, and he was standing by two streets away, with D.S. Guy Bachelor D.C. Emma Reeves and six members of the local support team. The Pulsar and four specialist search unit officers were minutes away. "'Send the LST in,' Grace instructed urgently. "'Now!' Chapter 111 Eric Whiteley's house, 117 Tate Avenue, was near the top of a hill, in a network of streets filled with post-war houses and bungalows, all fairly tightly packed together. It was a quiet area, with the cliff-top walk above the sea a quarter of a mile to the south, and the vast expanse of farmland and open grassland of the South Downs just two streets away to the north. Number 117 had a rather sad look about it, Guy Batchelor thought. It was a modest, drab 1950s, two-storey brick-and-wood structure, with an integral garage and fronted by a tidy but unloved garden. A sign on the garage doors in large red letters on a white background proclaimed, Don't even think about parking here. He waited on the pavement with D.C.'s Nickel and Reeves as the six officers from the local support team went down the drive, two peeling off and hurrying down the side alley past the dustbins to cover the rear of the property. All six were in blue jumpsuits, with body armour and military-style helmets with the visors down. One carried the cylindrical battering ram, another two carried the hydraulic jam spreader and its power supply which was used for forcing apart the steel-reinforced door frames that drug dealers were increasingly fitting to slow down entry of any police raid. A fourth officer, the sergeant in charge of this section, carried the search warrant. Shouting, Police! Open up! Police! The first officer banged on the door, rang the doorbell and banged hard on the door again. He waited some moments, then turned, looking for a signal from his sergeant, who nodded. Immediately he swung the battering ram at the door. It burst open on the second strike, and three LST officers rushed in, bellowing, Police! Police! while the sergeant held back, in case their intended target tried to do a runner out of the garage door. Guy Batchelor, Emma Reeves, and Nick Nichols stayed outside, until they got the all clear, confirming that the rooms had all been checked, and there was no threat. Then they entered. And stopped in their tracks, in astonishment. Nothing about the exterior of the house had given them any hint of the quite astonishing room they had stepped into. There was a marble floor that would have looked more at home in an Italian palazzo than an urban annex of Brighton and Hove. The walls were ceiling-to-floor mirrors, decorated with Aztec art and posters of Gaia. Bachelors stared at a signed monochrome of the icon in a black negligee, one of her most famous images but it was ripped through several times with what must have been a knife-blade, so the parts had peeled away and were hanging down. In angry red letters across it was daubed, Bitch! He looked uneasily at Emma Reeves. She pointed to the left, above a white leather armchair, at another huge framed poster in which Guy was wearing a tank top and leather jeans, captioned Gaia Revelations Tour. Across it was daubed in the same red paint, 
Love me or die, bitch. Above the fireplace, clearly in pride of place, was a blow-up of the icon's lips, nose and eyes in green monochrome, captioned, Gaia up close and personal. It was also personally signed. It, too, was slashed to ribbons in parts, and painted across, again in red, was the word cow. One of the specialist search unit officers, gloved and wearing black, was opening drawers in a chest on the far side of the room. Bachelor stared at each of the posters, at the violent rips, at the red paint, feeling deep, growing unease. He glanced out of the window. It was a grey, blustery afternoon, and he could see a neighbour's washing flapping in the wind, in front of a breeze-block garage. Something flapped in his belly. He'd been in a lot of bad situations in his career, but he was experiencing something new to him at this moment. It was an almost palpable sense of evil, and it was spooking him. A shadow moved, making him jump. It was a small Burmese cat, back arched, eyeing him suspiciously. "'Take a look up here!' another search unit officer called down to them from upstairs. Bachelor, followed by Emma Reeves and Nick Nickel, charged up the stairs, and, following the direction he was signalling, entered a room that felt like a cross between a museum and a shrine, and in which there had been a recent explosion of anger. Shop window dummies lay on their sides on the floor, wearing dresses covered in clear plastic and daubed in red paint. More autograph posters on the walls were ripped and daubed. CDs, tickets to Gaia concerts, bottles of Gaia's mineral water, a smashed martini glass and a fly-fishing rod snapped in two were among the other detritus that lay on the floor streaked like blood in red paint. Some items remained in their glass display cabinets, but many of these were barely visible behind the furious red words all over the glass. Bitch! Cow! Die! Love me! I'll teach you! Fuck you! D.C. Reeves was looking around wide-eyed. What an incredible collection! You a guy of fun? Nick Nickel asked. She nodded vigorously. Sir? They all turned. It was one of the search unit officers, Brett Wallace, and his face was ashen. These officers he knew saw everything, and it took quite a bit to shock any of them. But this officer was definitely shocked at this moment. This house has just become a crime scene. We're going to have to lock it down and not disturb anything else. Well, what have you found? Bachelor asked. I'll show you, Wallace said. They went back downstairs and followed him into the kitchen, a spotless room with dated furniture and appliances. Two other search unit officers were standing in there, both looking uncharacteristically uncomfortable. Wallace pointed at an open door, and Bachelor, followed by the other two, walked across to it. Beyond was a tiny pantry, mostly filled with a chest freezer, the lid of which was raised. A few supermarket ready meals lay on the floor, along with several packets of frozen sausages and three picnic freezer blocks. Take a look inside, Wallace said, indicating for him to go in. Warily, Guy Bachelor took a couple of steps forward and peered down. Instantly he stepped back a pace in shock. Oh, shit, he said. Chapter 112 Where the fuck is she? Larry Brooker glared at Barnaby Katz, the line producer, his voice tight with fury. They were standing by the doorway inside the banqueting room of the pavilion. Thirty actors, including all the rest of their stars, Judd Halpin, Hugh Bonneville, Joseph Fiennes and Emily Watson, were seated around the table waiting and looking increasingly impatient as they grew hotter and sweatier in their costumes and wigs. All the film lights were on, bathing everyone at the table in a surreal glow and roasting them at the same time. The table had been temporarily botched back together. Above it was a small but gaping hole in the dome where the chandelier had been hanging just twenty-four hours ago. Katz raised his arms in a shrug of helplessness. His hairline appeared to have receded a couple of inches in the past few days of constant stress. I knocked on her trailer door twenty minutes ago, and someone shouted she'd be out in a few moments. He adjusted his headset, then spoke urgently into it. Joe, any sign of Gaia? Brooker checked his watch. Not 
20 minutes ago, Barnaby. That was 30 minutes ago. Prima donnas. God, I hate them. Goddamn actresses. 30 fucking minutes she's kept us. He turned to the director, Jack Jordan. You know what 30 minutes costs us, don't you, Jack? Jordan gave a benign shrug, long used to being messed around by out-of-control egos on both sides of the lens. With his mane of white hair flowing from beneath his baseball cap, the veteran filmmaker looked as ever like an ancient soothsayer, and, true to that persona, was keeping his calm. He needed to. This was the most important scene in the movie, and with every single one of the stars featuring the most expensive, the money shot. Brooker banged his fists together. This is ridiculous! Has someone pissed her off today, or what? He glared at Jordan. Have you had another argument with her over her lines? Darling, I haven't had a peep out of her since yesterday. She was as good as gold last time we spoke. Just give her a few more minutes. She has to be patient for her heavy makeup, and her wig is damned uncomfortable. It tickles her face, poor love. Poor love? Brooker thought cynically. Guy was getting paid fifteen million bucks for just seven weeks' work. He could put up with his face being tickled for seven weeks for that kind of dough, he thought. Goddamn ridiculous wig, Brooker said. Can hardly see her face. Makes her look like a sheep in a corset. I'm paying all this goddamn money to have Gaia, and we could have had anyone inside that dress and hair. He looked at his watch again. Five minutes. If she's not on set in five minutes, I'm gonna... I'm gonna... He hesitated, wary of making a fool of himself and of upsetting the icon. The truth was, when you worked on a small independent production with an actress as big as Gaia, you had to tread carefully. Irritate her, and she might start to slow down even more, and run you days, if not weeks, over schedule, with all its crippling consequences. There'd already been a couple of occasions during this past week when Gaia, turning suddenly imperious, made Brooker realise that, without ever saying as much, she knew very well that there was only one reason he'd managed to get this movie into production. That all of them were only here making this movie for that same one reason, which was that she, Gaia, had said yes. Chapter 113 it took Guy Batchelor a moment to pluck up the courage to step forward again and look back into the chest freezer. The cold air swirling around him felt part of the same ice that was coursing his veins. A human head lay on the bottom, face up, between several packs of frozen peas, beans and broccoli, like some hideous ornament. A man's face. The flesh was grey, flecked with frost, and the hair was coated with frost, as if he was wearing a white beanie. The eyes were shrunken like tiny marbles. Despite the discoloration and the patches obscured by frost, he recognised the face instantly from the photographs he had seen. Miles Royce, winner of the auction for Guy's yellow tweed suit. As he turned away and stepped back into the kitchen, Brett Wallace said, Is that the bit you're missing from unknown Berwick mail? Yes, I'd say it is, Bachelor replied. One of the other search unit officers, who was busily peering beneath a dishwasher with a torch, looked up. Brett's mum said he was always good at jigsaw puzzles as a kid. The DS smiled, then pulled out his phone and called the SIO. Grace listened intently to the news from Guy Batchelor, trying to think clearly through the panic engulfing him, trying to make some fast decisions. The chief constable and the assistant chief constable needed to be informed— before they found themselves in the embarrassing situation of hearing about the discovery of Royce's head on the news. But before he did that, Grace had one absolute priority. He rang the U.S. cell phone number of Guy as head of security. "'Andrew Gully,' he answered almost instantly, as if expecting a call. "'It's Roy Grace.' "'Inspector Grace, I—' uh... The James Cagney whine sounded uneasy. We have an emergency situation, Mr. Gully. I have a copy of the production call sheet and see your client shooting at the pavilion this evening. I'm extremely concerned for her safety. I have reason to believe there's a person out there intent on harming her. He's already killed at least once. We know what he looks like and we know his disguise and I think we have a good chance of catching him very quickly. But I don't want to take any risks with your client. So what I'd like to do, with your support, is remove her from the set and keep her and her son indoors in her suite, under guard for the next 24 hours. Is that possible? 
Hey, Inspector, you and I are on the same page, but I can't help you. I got fired this morning. Fired? Yeah, I'm flying back to L.A. tomorrow. Gaia? Gaia fired you? In the middle of this situation? Yeah, well, the thing is, I told my client I was insisting on her leaving England right away, today, and flying back to the States, and to hell with the consequences. She wouldn't have it. So we had a kind of a, a Mexican standoff. She told me if I didn't change my attitude, I'd be fired. And I told her, Ms. Lafayette, I'm not risking your life, nor your son's life. You crazy or something? The hell were the consequences. There was a brief silence, then Gotti went on. I tell you, Inspector, she was getting paid peanuts for this film compared to what she earns performing, so what the hell? Let them sue, I told her. Better to be sued than dead. But she wouldn't have it. I told her I was not letting her go on set, so... She fired me. Want me to try speaking to her? Gaia Lafayette does what Gaia Lafayette wants, Inspector. She doesn't listen to anybody. I'm going to talk to her right now, Grace said. Good luck. You're going to need it. He ended the call with Gully and immediately phoned the Ops 1 controller Andy Kill, glad that he was still on duty. We found Miles Royce's head informed him, and the suspects at large with, I believe, real intent to harm Gaia. I'm circulating images of Eric Whiteley in his Anna Galicia persona. I'm printing copies for all officers on duty and PCSOs, and I want every available officer and PCSO we have deployed to the pavilion right away. I want to make it an island site. I could draft in some specials as well, Gill said helpfully. Anyone you can get, Grace replied, until we've got this maniac locked up. I'm upgrading this to a critical incident, Kill said. Graham Barrington's duty, gold and Nick Sloan silver. Grace thanked him and looked at his watch. 6.15 p.m. According to her schedule on the call sheet, Guy had been required in her trailer for makeup and wardrobe at 4 p.m., two hours before she was due on set. He turned to the forensic podiatrist. Hayden, I want you to go back to the CCTV room. I'll get anyone who's available to help you there. I need you to watch the cameras on the streets around the pavilion for any sign of Eric Whiteley or Anna Galicia. Sure, uh, now? Yes, right away. We have to find him, and fast. He looked around. Bella, I want you to blue light him down there, then meet me at the front of the pavilion, OK? Go. Bella Moy and Hayden Kelly both stood up hurriedly and headed towards the door. Grace addressed the rest of the team. We all know what Whiteley looks like in both guises. I want as many as possible of us going down there looking out for him. I can't be sure he's going to turn up, but I'd be surprised if he doesn't, and we can't take the risk of missing him. He checked the calls log on his phone, found the numbers corresponding to the time he rang Larry Brooker last night, and the time the producer returned the call and rang it again. Brooker? He did not sound in a sunny mood. It's Detective Superintendent Grace, Mr. Brooker. This is not a good moment. Brooker said. We're about to start shooting a major scene. Can I call you back later? No, Grace said emphatically. Is Gaia on set? She goddamn well isn't. We're waiting for her. Mr. Brooker, I need a big favor from you. We believe her life may be in real and present danger. I want to take her under police guard back to her hotel room and keep her there until the threat is over. Is there any filming you could do tonight without involving her? Detective Grace, she's already delayed us enough. You have to get real. Stars get threats from crazies regularly. She's got her own goddamn security. We got the pavilion security, the film unit security. We got the whole of your police force. This location is more secure than Fort Knox. A mouse isn't getting in here without ID. This is the safest place in Brighton right now. So, in which case, how come the chandelier came crashing down yesterday? Oh, everyone's tightened up since then. We've battened down the hatches. The whole place has been searched. She'll be totally safe on set. If we can ever get out of her goddamn trailer. Grace hung up, exasperated. What's happened, Chief? Glenn Branson asked. Sorry, thought you'd been told. They found Miles Royce's head. Branson looked at him. They have? Where? In Eric Whiteley's freezer. Oh, shit. Yes, and I have a bad feeling his next intended trophy is Gaia's. Judging by the state of his house, he's lost it. He ripped all his Gaia memorabilia to shreds, daubed his walls in anti-Gaia hate slogans and disappeared. Where do you think he might be? 
Branson asked. I talked to a psychologist this afternoon who's written extensively on stalkers and celebrity obsessives, a Dr. Tara Lester. She said these obsessive fans frequently build themselves an imaginary relationship with a celeb. They know the celeb is just waiting for that right moment to show reciprocation. That the celeb is secretly as much in love with them as they are with the celeb. When they get rejected by the celeb, sometimes they can flip. I think we're dealing with such a situation now. I think he's going to position himself near her, either at her hotel or the pavilion. Branson nodded. Forget this evening's briefing. You and I are going down there ourselves right now. Chapter 114 Guy has left her trailer. She's on her way. Barnaby Katz announced at last to Larry Brooker and Jack Jordan. Then he listened on his earpiece for a moment to the voice of the third assistant director who was accompanying her before speaking to the producer and director again. Joe's with her, and there's two police officers escorting her to the door. Tell them to switch their sirens on and shift it, Brooker said impatiently. The black Range Rover, followed by a marked police car, drove the three hundred yards across the lawns to the front of the pavilion. The police officers hurried out of their car and stood a few feet away as one of her minders held the rear door open and the icon slowly emerged, carefully ducking her head so as not to knock her massive hair against the door frame or snag any of the multiple layers of her dress and high collar on anything. There was a ragged cheer from the crowd of general public assembled beyond the wall in New Road and a whole battery of flashes strobed in the grey early evening light as Gaia stepped down onto the drive. She walked slowly, seemingly a little uncertainly, following the A.D. into the building, then right along the corridor towards the banqueting room. Into a sea of faces. A distinct sense of relief spread through the room. Several of the actors at the banqueting table turned to look at her. A makeup artist was working her way around their chairs, dabbing shiny noses and foreheads, and one of the hairdressers was making a minor adjustment to Hugh Bonneville's wig. Suddenly, the entire assembly of actors burst into spontaneous applause. Oh, shit, Brooker thought. Oh, shit, she is not going to be happy with this. It wasn't the applause of a warm greeting, nor the applause of a fine performance. It was a sarcastic demonstration by her thirty fellow actors that they had not been amused to be kept waiting. Then, to his amazement, Gaius smiled and curtsied, first to the cast of the table, then to the director of photography and his camera crew, then to the sound crew, to the continuity girl, to the director and to the producer, and to each grip and spark present. She curtsied as if her career depended on it. She curtsied, smiling and proud, totally misreading the situation, as if relishing being the centre of attention, the centre of adulation that was not there. Brooker frowned. Her behaviour was totally out of character. There was also something else very strange about her. Chapter 115 Roy Grace wondered why, whenever Glenn Branson got behind the wheel of a car, he drove it as if he had just hop-wired it, although he now had a legitimate reason. Glenn was weaving through the thinning rush hour on blues and twos, and Grace spent much of the journey fearing for his life, or the life of anyone who stepped into their path. To distract himself, he phoned and updated first the chief constable, via his staff officer, and then ACC rig. At 6.30pm, just seven minutes after leaving Sussex House, they tore into the pavilion grounds and pulled up behind a black Range Rover. Grace was a little relieved to see that already the police presence here was markedly increased from yesterday. As they walked up to the front entrance, two uniformed security guards, each wearing earpieces, blocked their path. "'Sorry, gentlemen,' said one of them. "'No one's allowed in. They're about to start shooting.' Grace fished out his warrant card and held it up. The same guard shook his head. "'Sir, you don't understand. They're about to do a take. There has to be absolute silence. I can't let you in until they finish this scene.' "'We'll be quiet,' Grace said. "'This is an emergency.' "'I'm afraid they've already lost almost an hour tonight. "'Madam's been in a particularly tricky mood, if you get my drift,' one guard said. "'He had a nicotine-stained moustache, a stocky but bolt-upright posture, "'and exuded the officious, no-nonsense air of a former army sergeant-major. 
She's damn lucky to still be alive if you get mine, Grace nearly retorted. I'm sorry, we need to go in the building. Phones off? No, we're not turning our phones or radios off. Then I'm afraid you can't go in until the end of the scene, gentlemen. How long will that be? Well, depends how many takes Madam requires to get her lines right. Both officers noted the sarcasm in his voice. Grace decided not to push the point, turned and walked a few steps away, followed by the DS. Sodding Jobsworth, Glenn Branson said. I'd love to see some of the filming. I'd like to see the finished result, knowing that we kept Geyer alive, Grace replied grimly. There were a good two hundred members of the public lined up along the wall, watching. He saw Glenn warily scanning their faces. Was Eric Whiteley among them? A man who was prepared to pay more than twenty-seven thousand pounds for a suit worn once by his idol. A loner, with nothing in his life but his doomed to be unrequited and unreciprocated passion for an icon. A loner who had been spurned by her, probably humiliatingly for him, in the front entrance of the Grand Hotel. Was he so desperate for anything belonging to his idol that he had killed and butchered his rival bidder for that suit? What was next on Whiteley's agenda after destroying his entire collection of Gaia memorabilia? Destroying the icon herself? Which would, of course, instantly make him almost as famous. Chapter 116 Along with Larry Brooker, Several of the cast and crew were staring uneasily at Gaia. Jack Jordan frowned, wondering whether his star was on drugs. She was definitely looking very odd this evening, he thought. Her hair was obscuring much of her face. Her makeup was far too heavy, and her voice sounded strange, as if she'd aged overnight. Nor did she appear to have remembered anything from their rehearsals over the weekend. Had it been the shock of her son nearly being killed yesterday? Would it have been more sensible to have given her a couple of days off to recover? Too late for that now. Patiently, he repeated the line for her, putting the emphasis where he wanted her to put it. This is not how a queen expects to be treated, my dear Prinny. I have never in my life been so humiliated. He paused. Okay. Much more emphatic. In these last few takes, you're almost mumbling... You're saying this loudly to everyone, plain to your audience, all the king's friends and associates. You must really project. What you're doing is, is trying to humiliate him publicly. Gaia nodded. He turned to the banqueting table, to King George. Judd, immediately you respond with, You never were a damned queen. You were just a posh tramp. He turned back to Gaia. That's your cue to burst into tears and run, wailing from the room. We all clear? Judd Halpin and Gaia both nodded in turn. The first assistant director, headset on, strode across the floor and called out. Right, first positions, everybody! The camera operator announced. Rolling! The clapper boy jumped in front of the camera lens with the digital clapperboard. Scene one, three, four, take three. There was a sharp crack and he moved clear. Jack Jordan called out. Action! Gaia, she said, addressing first the king, then everyone at the table, before turning dramatically around and addressing Jack Jordan. You never were a queen. You were always just a posh tramp, just a poser. You made people believe you loved them just for your ego, didn't you? Well, you're not special, see? Anyone can do what you do. Look at each one of you in this room. Faces froze. There were looks of astonishment, bewilderment. Jack Jordan took a step towards her. Guile, love, do you want to take a few minutes break? You see? She was screeching now. You can't tell. You really can't tell. So you don't need her any more. Anyone would do. She turned and ran, stumbling from the room. Jordan turned in bewilderment to Larry Brooker, then to the line producer. That... that's not her, Barnaby Cat said. That's not Gaia. Brooker was shaking his head. Has she goddamn flipped? That's not her. That wasn't her, Cat said again. Shit, I'm telling you, that was not Gaia. 
He sprinted for the corridor and ran down it into the hallway where there was a door to the public toilets. Brooker and Jack Jordan followed closely behind him. Not Gaia, Brooker called out. No! Then who the hell was it? Brooker said. Is this her idea of a, a goddamn practical joke or something? Where's she gone? Katz pushed open the door to the ladies and peered in. Then the men's room. Then he hurried across to the front entrance and out to the two guards. Did you guys see anyone come out about a minute ago? Both men shook their heads. No one's been in or out in the past fifteen minutes on your instruction, sir. You didn't see Gaia or, or someone resembling her? No one. They looked adamant. He squeezed past them, followed by Brooker and Jordan. A few yards away, he saw Roy Grace standing beside a tall black man in a sharp suit. Neither of you saw Gaia just now? he asked. Gaia? Grace said. He did not like any of their strange, baffled expressions. Or someone dressed as her? Katz asked. She ran out of the banqueting room and goddamn vanished, Brooker said. Well, no one's come out of this entrance since we've been here, Glen Branson said. Not for at least the last seven or eight minutes. Roy Grace stared at Brooker. Would you mind telling me what's going on? What do you mean you can't find Gaia? I would if I goddamn knew. Gaia came on set looking very strange and acting completely out of character, Jack Jordan said. Then she went totally off script, spouting a whole load of nonsense, and ran out of the room. It wasn't her, the line producer said. I'm certain. Everything's secure. The whole building, one of the security guards said. All the keys have been removed from the locks, one of the measures we were advised to take by your colleagues. We did that as soon as the public had left. If she was in the building five minutes ago, she's still there, I can assure you. If you're saying it wasn't Gaia, Grace said to the line producer, then where is Gaia? He shrugged. I don't know. Maybe still in her trailer? Grace felt his earlier panic returning, gripping and twisting his insides. Still in her trailer? Jordan and Katz went back into the building. Want me to go and check? Katz said to Grace. No, I'm going. He turned to Branson. Glenn, get the building surrounded. Put someone on every exit. No one leaves, OK? Not even the damn curator until I say so. No one leaves the grounds either. I want a total lockdown. And right now. Right, Chief. Grace ran along the drive then, across the lawns, then stopped by the two police officers standing guard near the front of Guy's motorhome. Two of Guy's own security guards were chatting a little further back, one smoking a cigarillo. Has anyone gone in or come out of this since you've been here? He asked the two officers. Both shook their heads. Well, not since Guy left to go on set, sir, said one. Grace went up to the door and rapped hard on it. He waited a moment, then rapped again. Then he pulled it open, calling out a cautious, Hello? Hello? Silence greeted him. He climbed up the steps and entered, and felt as if a fishhook had suddenly and viciously snagged him in the gullet. For an instant, the entire interior of the motorhome seemed to swivel on its axis, its walls shrinking in, then expanding again. His ears popped in terror at what he saw. Oh, Jesus, he said. Oh, sweet Jesus! Chapter 117 Grace shouted at the two officers on guard outside the mobile home. In here! Quick! Then he dashed over to the three bodies on the floor, each bound head to foot and gagged with a mixture of twine and grey duct tape. The eyes of all three were moving, thank God, he thought. One he recognised as one of Guy's assistants, but neither of the other two was Gaia. I'm a police officer, you're right, he asked each of them, in turn, and got frightened but positive nods back. Carefully removing the tape from their mouths, he established these other two were the hairdresser and the makeup artist. He turned to the two officers behind him. Call for three ambulances, then try to free them, but be careful, that tape's bloody painful. Then he went through to the rear, pushing through a curtained-off section, checking that a shower on one side and a toilet on the other were both empty, and then opened a door into what appeared to be the master bedroom, which smelt of Gaia's perfume, but was empty. A few clothes were strewn on the unused bed. 
He looked around carefully, pulling open cupboard doors, then went down on his knees and peered under the bed, just in case, but to no avail. Gaia wasn't in this motorhome. He radioed Ops 1, and moments later was through once more to Inspector Andy Kill. He gave him a quick summary. So we can't be sure of the time she was abducted, can we, Roy? Kill asked. Well, any time, between 4pm and two minutes ago. Oh, over three hours, she could be anywhere. I don't think there's much value in roadblocks. They could be too far away by now. Well, I think the perp's in the pavilion with her, Grace said. I agree, no point in roadblocks. Is Hotel 900 or Oscar Sierra 99 available? Hotel 900 and Oscar Sierra 99 were the call signs of the two helicopters of the Southeast Air Support Unit. Yes? Well, get one up and over the pavilion, in case he's up on the roof somewhere. There are lots of spaces up there. They can also see if he tries to leave. I'll have it overhead within ten minutes, tops. Please, God, let her be alive, Grace prayed silently. His mind was spinning, trying to get traction. He'd worked on child abductions and on kidnap cases, and was a qualified hostage negotiator. From his experience, he knew how badly the odds were stacked against them. In child abductions, 44% of the victims died within the first hour. 73% were dead within three hours. Just 1% survived more than one day. And 40% were dead before they were even reported missing. Those figures applied to children, but if the psychologist Dr. Lester was right, inside Eric Whiteley's warped mind, now that guy was no longer his lover, he might well be viewing her as a child who needed to be taught a lesson. Every single second mattered right now. We need a PNC broadcast as well, Andy, just in case. Do we know Whiteley's vehicle? He's got a Nissan Micra, but it's still in the garage. It's possible he rented something bigger. He wouldn't be able to conceal a person in a Micra very easily. He was staring at a small sign just by the rear window of the bedroom. Emergency exit. He had to walk round the far side of the bed to reach it, and then he saw the handle in a raised, unlocked position, as if the door had recently been opened, and not properly closed from the outside. He ended the call with Kill, pushed the door open and looked out and around the rear of the vehicle. Two other smaller motorhomes were parked directly behind, blocking the view of this exit from anyone more than a few yards away. No windows overlooked them. This seemed the likely route that Whiteley would have taken her, but they would have had to come into open view within ten yards or so, surely. Then looking down, he noticed the jagged, uneven, dark rectangle in the grass, as if it had been made with a very thin trail of weed killer. He knelt down, and the rectangle wobbled beneath him, just a fraction. He clambered back into the vehicle, checked that the two officers were making progress on freeing the victims, then rummaged in the kitchen drawers and took out a heavy-duty knife and a metal spatula. Then he got down on his hands and knees behind the motorhome and, using the two implements as a lever, prized open an ancient heavy metal cover, the top of it turfed, which he lifted aside. He could see steep stone steps leading down into the darkness. He'd often heard rumours of secret passages under the pavilion, and wondered if this was one of them. He went back into the motorhome, and asked if either of the officers had a torch on them. One produced a small, sturdy-looking one, and handed it to him. He switched it on, went out again, then began to descend the steps, breathing in dank air. After about twenty feet, he found himself in a tunnel just high enough to stand in. It had faded whitewashed walls, and a whitewashed brick floor, and stretched away into the distance toward the main building of the pavilion. Lag pipes, copper tubes, and bare power cables, clipped to the top of the walls on both sides, appeared to run its full length, and every few yards there were unlit lights mounted on the walls. He began walking along the tunnel as quickly as he could, being careful not to trip on the uneven floor, shadows jigging ahead of him from the throw of the beam, his nerves jigging inside him. He passed an old wooden door lying on its side, then a large dusty pane of glass, and a short distance further along, a busted wicker chair. Two tiny pinpricks of red momentarily froze in the darkness, then vanished. A rat. He passed an orange and white traffic cone, incongruously placed on the floor, then reached an old grimy white door, with a shiny new chrome handle on it. He hesitated for a moment, and glanced down at his phone. There was no signal, 
which meant no chance of calling back up if he needed it. If Whiteley came at him, he'd have to cope on his own. He gripped the handle, switched the torch off, not wanting to make himself a target just in case. Then he jerked the door open and snapped on the beam again. It shone on a fire hose attached to a brick wall. He stepped forward and swung the beam down another corridor, much wider and higher, angled off to the right, with some dim lights on further along it. All the cables and piping were bunched together in this section, running along the ceiling. The brick floor was uneven and unpainted, repaired in places with ugly concrete patches. He passed a row of plastic chemical drums, then saw a decrepit green door sagging on its hinges, with a yellow and black danger high voltage sign on it to his left. A broken cobweb across the top left corner of the door showed it had been opened recently. Bracing himself, and stepping aside as he did so, he pulled it open. The hinges shrieked, the bottom scraping noisily on the bricks. Then he stabbed the beam inside. It lit up a wall of fuses and electrical switch gear, and pipework lagged in asbestos, but otherwise it was bare. He walked on, and saw a pool of light ahead of him now. Then he heard voices, and froze. They sounded directly above him. Then footsteps, clumping down steps. Now his nerves were really jangling. He took several deep breaths, firmly gripped the torch, the only weapon he had, and eased himself forward, keeping as flat against the wall as he could. He saw a shadow growing larger. Then suddenly the ex-Sergeant Major security guard loomed into view. The old soldier jumped with shock when he saw him, shouted something and dropped his torch, which hit the ground with a loud crack and went out. Blimey! You gave me a fright, sir. Well, that makes two of us, Grace said. What's happening? Has anyone found anything here? The guard knelt down, bending his stiff frame with some difficulty, and picked up his torch. Nothing, sir. Not so far. But it's a bloody big place to search, and you have to know your way around to do it. So many corridors. It was designed as a sort of double skin, so that staff could move all around the ground floors without going into any of the main rooms unless needed. I've been here seven years, and even I keep finding new spaces all the time. It'd be easy for someone who knows it well to avoid being seen. What's up there? Grace pointed to the steps he'd just come down. It takes you up to the main hallway, just inside the front entrance, and the toilets. I'm certain Guy's abductor must have brought her along here some time in the past couple of hours. Where could he have taken her from here? Well, he couldn't go any further along this passage. If you shine your beam along there, you'll see. He pointed along the continuation of the tunnel, and it was bricked off a short distance along. He'd either have to have taken her back the way he came, or up these stairs. Grace suddenly recalled the smell of fresh chocolate the abandoned crunchy wrapper with a trace of lipstick on it. Anna Galicia's lipstick? Follow me, will you? Grace said, and sprinted up the stairs, through the open half-gate, then across the hall to the half-concealed door on the far side, where he'd been taken by the curator yesterday. He pulled it open, then began to lope up the spiral stairs. Somewhere behind him, he heard the panting voice of the elderly security guard. Don't touch the handrail, sir! It's dangerously rickety. He reached the top and entered the old abandoned apartment beneath the dome, with its unpleasant musty smell and dust sheets over the uneven angular shapes. But he didn't even notice the smell, or the dust sheets, or the crunchy wrapper still lying on the ground. He was staring transfixed at the bizarre and horrific tableau facing him. It could have been two actors rehearsing a scene in a play, except neither of them was acting. They were both standing on a dangerously rotten trapdoor, and one had a noose around her neck. Chapter 118 Gaia, in jeans and a sweat-darkened white T-shirt, her face glistening with the perspiration of fear, stood on tiptoe, a noose of razor wire around her neck pulled tight and looped around the pulley system high above the trapdoor. Blood trickled down parts of her neck where the wire had dug into her skin. A small strip of duct tape lay curled on the floor. The skin around her mouth looked red and raw, probably from that bit of tape that had been ripped away, Grace thought, feeling fury at what he saw, tinged with relief that she was still at this moment alive. 
Her hands were tied behind her back. Inches from her sparkly trainers was a sign on the trapdoor that read in bold letters, Danger! Steep drop below! Do not stand on door! Her eyes, filled with stark terror, locked onto his. He tried to flash back reassurance. His heart went out to her. She looked so vulnerable and helpless. Crouched beside her was an apparition, caked in makeup, dressed in female regency clothing, and wearing a huge lopsided wig, staring at him with a strangely triumphant smile. One hand was on each of the two rusty bolts that secured the trapdoor from opening downwards, and taking them both with it, plunging through the hatch, down the forty-foot drop straight to the storeroom above the kitchens. On the floor beside this creature was a vicious-looking open-bladed hunting knife and a mobile phone. There was a sudden sharp crack, like a gunshot. Gaia yammered in terror. The apparition's eyes darted momentarily down. Grace realised what it was. The trapdoor was starting to give way. His mind was racing, spinning, trying to get traction and figure what to do. The two of them were about ten feet in front of him. Three fast paces, he assessed. The bolts could be slid long before he even got close. He couldn't take the risk, not at this moment. There was another crack. This time the trapdoor visibly sagged a fraction, tightening the razor wire even more. The door was going to cave in at any moment. Detective Superintendent Roy Grace! The apparition smiled, speaking through gleaming white teeth in a seductive, gravelly voice that mimicked Gaia's. I recognize you from the Argus. How nice of you to join our little private party. Gaia was pleading with her eyes for him to do something. His heart was hammering so hard he could feel pulsing in his ears. Eric Whiteley, he said, or shall I call you Anna Galicia? He heard footsteps behind him, then heavy panting. Get rid of your fat friend with the tash, hon. He's so ugly. The apparition continued in her Gaia voice. I'll talk to you, but I'm not talking to any bullying thug. Grace hesitated. The creature slid the bolts back a good half inch. The panic in Gaia's eyes deepened into wild terror. There was another, smaller crack, and the apparition jolted, but seemed not to care. Get rid of your fat friend, or the bitch and I go. You have five seconds, Detective Superintendent. He tightened his grip on the bolts. Grace turned and said urgently to the security guard, Do what she said. The guard gave him a look, as if questioning his sanity. Get out of here! Go! Grace yelled at him. It had the desired effect. The security guard turned in shock and lumbered out of the room. Grace turned back to the transvestite, thinking fast. He was trying to remember all he'd been told by the indexer Annalise Veneer, who'd had researchers delving back as far as they could into Whiteley's past, as well as all the insights he'd had from the psychologist Dr. Tara Lester. But the first stage was to get a rapport going, to try to bond with Whiteley, and at the same time to make his plan B. "'Tell me what you'd like me to call you,' he said. "'Anna Galicia or Eric Whiteley?' He looked up at the wire above Gaia for an instant. "'Oh, very funny!' Whiteley snapped back. It came out as a male snarl. I'm not afraid to kill her. You've killed before, haven't you, Anna? Shall we stick with Anna? Anna will be very happy with that. Now she sounded like Gaia again. A chill wave swept through Grace. It felt as if he were dealing with two totally different people in one. And how about Eric? Will he be happy? Eric will do what Anna tells him. Whiteley said in his Anna voice. You killed Miles Royce, didn't you? Why did you kill him? Because he was richer than me. He kept outbidding me on things I really wanted. I couldn't let that go on. I invited him round to see my collection, and then I killed him. I collected him. He was a nice trophy to have. Eric approved. Grace was conscious of Gaia, desperately staring at him, but at this moment he didn't want to break eye contact with Whiteley. He needed to try to find some common ground, some way to start to bond with him, and he knew he didn't have much time, maybe only seconds. There was another splintering crack. 
You better be quick, Detective Superintendent. We're going down, Whiteley said again in Anna's seductive guy voice. Whiteley had been clever. The wire had been wound several times around the winch in large loops. Then he'd bent it several times just above Guy's head to take up the slack and force her onto her toes. There was about six feet of slack in those loops. If the hatch collapsed, Guy would fall that distance, and even if her neck wasn't broken instantly, or her head severed completely by the wire, it would be impossible to reach her. It would be equally impossible to haul her weight up by that single strand of sharp wire. Suddenly he heard the whacka 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 thrashing of a helicopter roaring overhead. He saw Whiteley's eyes dart apprehensively towards one of the dusty oval windows and realised to his dismay he'd missed a split-second chance of jumping him while he was distracted. The sound faded away. "'I don't think a helicopter's going to do you much good in here, Detective Superintendent Grace, do you?' Anna said, then looked up at Gaia. "'Don't get your hopes up. Know what I'm saying? About someone coming to save you? It's not going to happen.' Then he raised his right hand, pressed his thumb, middle finger, and ring finger together, and raised the other two fingers in the air. Secret fox! He winked at her. She stared back at him, icily and terrified. Grace's phone rang. He ignored it. Eric says you can answer it, Anna said sweetly. It carried on ringing. Eric says you can answer it, Anna repeated. Grace continued to ignore it. He wanted to keep both his hands free. It stopped ringing. It might have been an important call, Anna Galicia said. You are a, a very important man, aren't you? Aren't you important too, Anna? He replied. Eric thinks so. Grace shot another quick glance at Gaia. Her eyes were still locked on him. He wondered what the security guard was going to do. But short of putting a sniper on the roof to take a shot through the window of Whiteley, he didn't have the time. There wasn't anything he could think of. Down below, he heard the wail of sirens, followed by a series of deep honks, then more sirens. It sounded like fire engines on their way. But that wasn't going to help. There wasn't time to get any backup. The shadow of a seagull flitted past one of the windows behind Whiteley and was gone. Whiteley looked up at the icon. How's it feeling, Gaia? Is it nice to be with your number one fan? Is it nice to be adored, hey? She tried to respond, but only a gurgling croak came out. Did you ever think what you'd be if it wasn't for me and all the others, hey? Why don't you give her some slack or take the noose off so she can answer you? Grace said calmly. <laughs> Very funny, Detective Superintendent, Anna retorted. "'What is it you want from Gaia, Anna?' Grace was poised, ready, like a coiled spring, listening, waiting for the next crack. He didn't know if his plan would save her, but at this moment he was totally out of alternatives, except to try negotiation with the man, with only minutes, maybe only seconds, left to do it. After some moment's silence, Whiteley responded, staring directly back at him. "'I want her to say sorry.' Grace felt a tiny ping of hope. Sorry for what, Anna? Whiteley looked up at her. You know, don't you, Gaia? Then he looked back at Grace. Take the noose off, Grace said firmly but pleasantly. Let us speak to you. Suddenly, in a very masculine voice, Whiteley snapped at him, baring his teeth in an animal snarl. Anna won't take the noose off. Stop bullying her. Grace stared back at him. Bullying, did you say? Whiteley looked up at Gaia again. Anna spoke. All you had to do in the lobby of the Grand Hotel was smile and say hello. Instead, you humiliated me. You snubbed me in front of everyone. You made me look a fool. You made me a, 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 a ubu, didn't you? Useless, boring, ugly. You pretend to love everyone, but you're just a greedy bully, really, aren't you, Gaia? So how does this feel now, huh? I bet you wish you'd be nicer to me in the Grand, don't you? Just give her a chance to talk to you, Anna. Whiteley snapped his head round and glared at Grace. Anna's not talking to you, he said in his Eric Whiteley voice. Then he turned back to Gaia, and it was Anna speaking again. 
You see, guy, you're not as special as you think. Anyone can be you if they have enough makeup on. They all thought I was you. I could have done the rest of the film and they'd never have known. You're not very special at all, really. You're just lucky and very cruel and very ungrateful. Grace was looking at the wire again and trying very subtly to signal to Gaia. He looked pointedly down at the trapdoor, at the warning sign, then jerked his eyes over to the right. She clocked him in a fleeting puzzled glance before his eyes went back to Whiteley. You know what they say, don't you? Anna Galicia's voice asked her. Be careful how you treat people on the way up, because you never know who you're going to need when you're on the way down. Whiteley lifted a hand from a bolt and pointed at the trapdoor. On the way down, get it? Anna's voice suddenly cackled with laughter. Get it? He repeated to Gaia. How will that feel for you in your last few seconds, dying with your number one fan? But we won't tell anyone, will we? Again he raised his hand and formed his fingers into the symbol. Secret Fox! Anna, Grace said. I have an idea. If you give Guy your phone, she could call anyone you wanted and tell them whatever you would like her to say. She could apologize to the newspapers, the radio, television, her Twitter followers, her Facebook fans. She could tell the whole world that you really are her number one fan. But all she had been doing was testing you. Because she has so many impostors claiming to be her number one fan, she had to make sure you were the real one, and she is sure now. No one else would be willing to die with her. That is real love, Anna, and she knows that now. You can film her telling you that with the camera. Put it on YouTube. He saw the sudden change of expression in Whiteley's eyes, like a cloud moving away from the sun. They shone briefly, and he smiled, like a child who'd just been given a new toy. For an instant. Grace caught Guy's eye again, moved his eyes to the right. She frowned. She didn't get his plan. Then Whiteley's face turned to hostility again. You're lying, Detective Superintendent. This is all bullshit. You're lying. Ask her, Grace said. Go on. Stop fooling me. There was another crack. He saw the alarm on Whiteley's face. This was the moment. Grace raised his voice, deliberately in anger. I'm not fooling you. You're not ugly, boring, or useless. That's what they called you at school, isn't it? Ubu? Whiteley froze for an instant. He looked panic-stricken. In Anna's voice, he said, That's... Th th that's what they called Eric. How do you know? How, how do you know that? I found out, okay? Someone told me. Give Gaia the phone. Let her start telling the world that you are none of these things. She'll tell her fan club that you truly are her number one fan. You'll be a hero. Wouldn't it be nicer to be a living number one fan than a dead one? Anna doesn't think so. I've just asked her, Whiteley said in his male snarl. The phone, Grace jabbed a finger at it. Give her the phone. Whiteley's snarl turned to a whine. You're bullying me. Give her the sodding phone. Grace bellowed at the top of his voice. It threw Whiteley for an instant. He turned almost like an automaton, reached out for the phone and picked it up. Then he froze, confused, his arm momentarily suspended in mid-air as Grace launched himself forward. Grace took one step, then sprang off his right foot in a long jump stance and landed with both feet exactly where he'd aimed, in the centre of the trapdoor, inches from Gaia. He heard a loud crack and felt the wood splintering instantly beneath him, his legs plunging through. But he barely noticed. Barely heard Whiteley's yelp of surprise, he was totally focused on positioning his hands on the floor either side of the trapdoor, directly beneath Gaia, so his shoulders would take her weight. For an instant, he was aware of hands grabbing his right leg, sliding down it, and a dead weight that was pulling him down, with Gaia's feet pushing down on his shoulders. He scrabbled desperately with his fingers to keep a grip on the floor, oblivious to the splinters ripping into his skin and under his nails, just concentrating in these few split seconds on stopping himself, and equally importantly Gaia, plunging through the open hatch. His arms were being pulled out of their sockets. He could feel the weight of her feet on his shoulders even more heavily now, 
She was pushing him down. He was going. His hands were stinging like hell, and he was struggling to keep a grip. He was being pulled down by his right leg, his hands dragging across the wooden floorboards. He heard Whiteley screaming. The weight was pulling him further down, down, too much for him to hold back. Then he felt hands sliding down his ankle, heard Whiteley screaming pitifully for help again. Then, suddenly, like a hooked fish that has freed itself from a line, he felt his right shoe come off, and the weight was instantly gone. He kicked out, but was just kicking air. His feet dangling over the forty-foot drop, he was acutely aware that only his hands, which were still sliding agonizingly across the wood towards the rim of the hatch, were holding him, and Guy's weight on his shoulders was pushing him down. He kicked out, desperately trying to find something for his feet to grip on, in case by some miracle there was a ladder beneath him. Guy's feet kicked wildly, stamping on him as she scrabbled for grip on his shoulders, pushing him down further, his hands slipping, slipping, his feet flailing in the air. His arms and shoulders were in agony. He tried desperately to pull himself up, but the more he pulled, the more Gaia pushed down with her full weight. His arms were starting to give way, and he didn't know how much longer he was going to be able to hold on. Can't fall! Can't fall! Can't fall! The words played in his brain like a mantra. Can't fall! Can't fall! Can't fall! He thought suddenly of Cleo of their unborn baby, of all the new life that lay in front of him. He was not going to die, not going to. Gaia! he yelled. You're going to kill us both. Get off me. Get on the floor. There's enough slack in the white. Trust me. His hand slipped further, agonizingly across the boards. Further. She pushed even harder on his shoulders. She was clearly in total hysterical panic, beyond any ability to hear him. He was going. He could not hold on any more. His fingertips were sliding over the raised edge of the rim. And then suddenly, her weight lifted off him. It was gone completely. But he still could not hold his own body up. His fingers were slipping, slipping. He did not have the physical strength in them, nor the grip to hold on any more. Somehow he had to haul himself back up through the hatch. But he couldn't. His arms were spent. He didn't have the energy. For an instant he thought it would be easier to fall, simpler, just let go. Then he saw Cleo's face again, saw the bump, their baby, their life. But his fingers slipped further, his body hung for them like a lead dead weight. He felt his fingertips right on the edge, they were losing their grasp, his legs bicycling in the air below him in the hope again of finding something miraculously to save him. Slipping! Oh, shit, no, 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 this was crazy, this was not how I was going to end. He fought back with every ounce of strength he had, but he slipped further. And then suddenly an iron clamp closed around both his wrists. The next instant he was hanging, swinging from his arms. Moments later he was being pulled, very slowly and very firmly upwards. He smelt the sour breath of a heavy smoker, looked up, saw a nicotine-stained moustache, and heard the voice of the security guard. Don't worry, sir, he wheezed. I've got you. Moments later, he felt a second pair of hands gripping him securely under the arms, and nearby he heard a woman sobbing hysterically. Chapter 119 Seconds later, Roy Grace's feet touched the floor, safely away from the hatch. He barely noticed he was missing a shoe. His hands were raw and bleeding, and he had splinters up inside his nails that hurt like hell, but he barely noticed that either at this moment. His sole concern was for Gaia. She was kneeling, supported by a male and a female police officer who were gently working free the noose around her bleeding neck. She was sobbing and shaking. "'Do you want to sit down, sir?' the guard with the moustache asked. The other held on to him with a steadying hand. "'I'm fine, I'm fine. Is Guy all right?' he called out. "'Is she all right?' The woman officer said, "'Yes, she's OK, she's in shock. I've radioed for an ambulance.' "'Shall we get an ambulance for you too, sir?' one of the guards asked. Grace shook his head, still getting his breath back. Then he saw the state of his hands. I think I need tweezers, he said distantly, staring at Guy again, trying to make sense of these last few moments. 
He stared at the four-foot-wide rectangular hole where the trapdoor had dropped down. You've got a nasty gash in your face. He put a hand up and it came away, covered in blood. You came in good time, guys. Thank you for, uh, for getting me out of there. I used to be a bit of a weightlifter in my army day, sir. You were nothing compared to the weights I used to do. Well, thanks a lot. Take it as a compliment, sir. Grace gave a wry smile, then crossed over to Gaia. Their eyes connected, and for an instant her sobbing ceased. You okay? he asked. Through her tear-stained face, she managed a weak smile. Yes, yes, I'm just a, a little wired. Grace grinned. Moments later he heard footsteps, and Glenn Branson charged into the room, then stopped and stared, open-mouthed at Grace, then Gaia, then Grace again. What happened? You all right? Everyone all right, Chief? The helicopter clattered past overhead, making conversation momentarily impossible, as the din of its engine and blades echoed around the bare walls and bare floor. We're okay, Grace said. Branson looked around wildly. Where's Whiteley? They said he was up here. Grace dropped down on his knees and crawled towards the edge of the hatch. Careful, sir, one of the guards said. Grace carried on to the edge and looked down. Then he backed away and turned to the DS. He's in the kitchen. Kitchen? What? What? What's like? Who's with him? What's he doing there? I tell you what he's not doing. He's not cooking dinner. Ignoring his bleeding face and increasingly painful hands, Grace hurried down the spiral stairs with Branson close behind. When they reached the bottom, they ran along the corridor into the banqueting room, where there was a bizarre mix of men and women in elegant Regency clothing mingled with the film crew who were mostly in jeans, trainers and T-shirts. Larry Brooker called out, Detective Grace, can you tell us what's... Grace ignored him, pushing the door open and running into the first of the kitchen rooms. It was a small bare space with beige walls and brown linoleum, on which stood a stainless steel trolley that reminded him of a mortuary gurney. He looked up, but there was no hatch above, just a low ceiling. Followed by Branson, he pushed open a sludge-coloured door and went into the next room, which was similar but smaller. There was a faint smell of human excrement. He crossed over and opened another door, which was slightly ajar. Both men recoiled at the sight. Jesus! Branson said. There was a strong stench of fresh human excrement. Grace stared levelly ahead. At the man who'd nearly killed Gaia, and had come close to killing him too. He shot a quick glance up at the smashed ceiling fifteen feet above, which Whiteley had crashed through, and saw the garb with a moustache forty feet above that peering curiously down. Then, holding his breath for some moments against the smell, he looked ahead again at the bizarre sight in the centre of the room. The wig had gone, and was lying a short distance away. A balding, middle-aged head, with grey hair, protruded from the neck of the elegant Regency dress. Whiteley appeared to have hit the floor feet first, then collapsed back against the stainless steel sink which was supporting him, giving the illusion he was sitting upright of his own accord. The scarlet dress lay pooled all around him, as if carefully arranged so as not to get creased. Two pale-coloured sticks, each about eighteen inches long, rose up through rips in the dress below his midriff like a pair of ski-poles, except they had blood and small strips of sinew and skin on them. Grace realised with horror what they were. The lower sections of the man's legs driven up through his knees by the impact. The stench of excrement was even worse now. He walked over and looked at Whiteley's make-up caked face. The man was blinking. Non-stop, three or four blinks a second, as if some wiring loop inside his head had short-circuited. Tiny moans were coming from his mouth, which was opening and closing slowly, gormlessly like a goldfish. Grace took hold of Whiteley's wrist and found a pulse. He didn't bother to time it, but could tell it was dangerously low. "'He's still alive, Jess. Call for an ambulance.' Branson, staring bug-eyed at the stricken man, pulled out his phone. Chapter 120 "'Would she have done the same for you?' Cleo asked. Well, "'That's not the issue, isn't it? "'It was my job to protect her. 
You're a trained hostage and suicide negotiator. You told me once, Roy, that part of what you were instructed was never to put your own life in danger. Well, you just did, didn't you? Again. It was a warm Friday evening, a glorious summer night, and to celebrate Cleo's last day at work before maternity leave, they'd booked a table at a country restaurant they liked called the Ginger Fox, a short drive out of Brighton. Cleo liked to remind him that with the birth of the baby increasingly imminent, each quiet dinner out together might be their last for a very long time. Roy never took much persuading. There were few things he enjoyed more in life than sitting in a restaurant with Cleo, with some good food and a decent glass of wine. He ran the shower, removed his tie with difficulty, as his hands were so painful, and had several deep splinters still embedded in them. He took off his suit jacket and trousers, then sat on the edge of the bed to pull off his socks. He was hot and sweaty, and felt drained after what seemed like a very long week, and an even longer past two days. Two press conferences in the past twenty-four hours, a referral to the Independent Police Complaints Authority, because he had been directly involved in the serious injury of a suspect, an inquiry by professional standards as to why he hadn't brought up the issue of the information Kevin Spinella kept obtaining much sooner than he had, plus he had all the paperwork dealing with Operation Icon to go through, and as a bit of icing on the cake, there were major issues with the playing fields that the police rugby team, which he managed, would be using when the season started. On top of everything else, he'd had to travel up to London today, as he'd been called as a witness earlier than he'd expected in the Carl Venner trial. Except, having got all the way to the Old Bailey, he was told he now would not be needed until next Tuesday. A shower, followed by a blast out into the countryside in Cleo's Audi TT with the roof down, a cold beer and a few glasses of wine, and he'd feel a lot better. He might even treat himself to a cigarette. One big advantage of Cleo's pregnancy was there were no drink-driving issues, no arguments about who would drive home. "'It's not a question of training, my darling,' he replied. "'There was a scandalous hoo-ha a few years back when two PCSOs in another county didn't jump into a lake to try to save a drowning boy because their training forbade them. Well, that's pretty rare.' I don't think I've met a single police officer in Sussex who would have held back from jumping in. It's not about training. It's, it's something any human being would do. You can't just stand by and watch someone die. She kissed him. You know, I've never been a worrier. She gave a small laugh. Not until I met you. You sure it's not part of the package? All the stuff we've read. We both know that pregnancy messes with a mother's hormones. Worry is one aspect of the protective mothering instinct. You don't have to worry about me. It's not the baby, Roy. It's you. Every time you walk out the front door, I wonder if you'll be coming back, or whether it'll be two of your colleagues knocking on the door instead. Cleo, darling! Did Sandy have to put up with all this? The same fears? The reminder of Sandy stung. The mention of her name invariably set off a small pang of sadness and loss, despite the good mental place that he was in, and all he now had. He shrugged. Well, she never said anything, not about danger. Her gripe was always my unpredictable hours. I'm sorry that I worry. I can't help it. I love you. But just look at all the crazy stuff you've done in the past year. You've been in a burning building, over a cliff and a car. Well, not exactly. The car went over a cliff, Roy. Yeah, OK, but I wasn't in it. You were in it ten seconds before it went over. He smiled. True. He stood up and pulled his boxer shorts down. You dived into Shoreham Harbour in front of a ship. It was strange, he thought. He felt perfectly comfortable standing naked in front of Cleo. But Sandy had an almost Victorian prudery about nudity. Except in bed, where she could be wild, she always had something wrapped around her, and would insist that he put something on, even if it was just a walk from the bedroom to the bathroom. And she had a thing about the toilet as well, an obsessive privacy. He once, way back, had joked to a friend that in all the years he and Sandy had lived together as man and wife, so far as he knew, she had not yet been to the toilet. "'I didn't have any choice with Gaia,' he said. "'If I hadn't done what I did, she'd be dead or maimed. My career would have been over.' but that wasn't the reason I did it. The police force isn't the only job in the world, Roy. If you ever got demoted or got the sack, I wouldn't love you any the less. OK? And if someone died because I'd been a coward? The question hung in the air. 
History is full of dead heroes, Roy. I'm not ready for you to be history. He blew her a kiss and stepped into the bathroom, then checked his face in the mirror. The gash on his left cheek had required three stitches, but it looked to be healing all right. As he turned on the taps, his mobile phone lying on the bed pinged twice with text messages. Could you see if there's anything urgent? he called out. She picked up the phone. The first message was from Jason Tingley. Do you need me tomorrow, or can I play golf? The second was from a number that meant nothing to her. She opened it. Hey, Mr. Paul Newman eyes. I want to thank you properly sometime for saving my life. Kiss, 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 kiss. Roy Grace adjusted the shower temperature, then, before stepping into it, called, Anything important? Jason Tingley wants to play golf tomorrow, and Gaia wants to have sex with you. He grinned and closed the shower door behind him. Five minutes later, as he came back into the bedroom, with a towel wrapped around him, Cleo paraded the loose turquoise dress she had chosen. She looked stunning. What do you think? This or my black one? Or the beige one you like? He couldn't remember either the black or the beige ones. Well, this looks great. Which shoes? Which ones were you thinking of? Well, I can't wear anything with heels, so I'm not going to be able to compete with Gaia, am I? Her tone was unusually sarcastic. Hey, come on. He picked up the phone and looked at the text, then smiled proudly. Not every cop got a text from one of the world's greatest stars and a row of kisses. So would you? She said. Would I what? Go to bed with her, if you had the chance. She was staring at him strangely. Don't be ridiculous. Absolutely not. Hey, come on, let's not go there. He picked up the Alfa Romeo brochure that was lying on his bedside table and flicked through it for distraction, to avoid having to look back at her. He stopped on the Julietta page and stared at the car with longing. Cleo looked over his shoulder. Go with your heart, she said. You love that car, right? He shrugged. Yeah. So? You've nearly died, and don't know how many times in your career, and you've still got a third of it to go. You're probably not going to make old bones, so go on, treat yourself while you can. Enjoy. I'm tempted, he said. It'll suit you. And hey, Mr. Paul Newman eyes, Guy'll think you're so cool. Chapter 121 Over the course of the following week, to Roy Grace's relief, press coverage about his rescue of Guy began to move from the front page and dwindled, although the jibes from his friends and colleagues continued. He gradually reduced the Operation Icon team numbers until by the following Friday's morning meeting there was just himself, Glenn Branson, Norman Potting, Bella Moy, Nick Nickel, and a handful of others. They had a lot of work to do still, collecting statements, preparing for the inquests and to the deaths of Drayton Wheeler and Miles Royce. Meanwhile, they awaited the daily medical bulletins on Eric Whiteley, who remained on life support in the ICU at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, under police guard. He hadn't been able to resist showing the text from Guy around to his colleagues, and he was now the butt of a number of saucy but good-humoured jokes about her. So, how's your new lovebird today, Chief? Norman Potting asked. She's been back on set all week, I gather. Thank you, Norman. She's tough. I bet she is he said with a dirty chuckle. Leave it alone, will you, Norman? Glen Branson snapped at him. Grace had been noticing a certain tension between Branson and Potting recently, but his mate had refused to be drawn on it. On the couple of occasions he had tried to bring the subject up while they were having a drink after work. Another thing he had noticed a few times was a sly exchange of glances between Potting and Bella. There couldn't be anything going on between them, could there? To him, Potting was just about the most physically unappealing man he'd ever encountered. Surely Bella could do better than him. On the other hand, nor could he see the appeal a Brighton copper might have to one of the world's greatest and sexiest rock and movie stars. But he was getting a constant stream of increasingly flirty texts from Gaia. It didn't seem to matter how neutral and guarded his replies were, the innuendo from her was increasing daily. Of course he was flattered, and they were too much of an ego boost to delete— but they changed nothing in his love for Cleo. He had thought several times about that question she'd asked him last week in their bedroom. Would he go to bed with Gaia if he had the chance? And his answer was no. An emphatic no. 
On the following morning, he drove to his house to check on its condition. Sometimes his now long-stay lodger, Glen Branson, kept it neat and tidy. Other times it looked like it had a herd of hyenas rampaging through it. Also, he could never quite trust his friend to remember to feed his venerable goldfish, Marlon. He pulled up outside shortly after ten, nodded at his neighbour across the street, Noreen Grinstead, the local gossip, a hawk-eyed jumpy woman in her seventies, who was forever outside the front of her house washing something. Right now she was hosing down her spotless silver Nissan car. He did not want to have to talk to her about the recent events and was equally happy not to get drawn into a tedious conversation with her about the lives of everyone in the street, which sometimes happened. He had moved on from this place, which Sandy, years back, had fallen so in love with. He was now house-hunting with Cleo, and they were taking advantage of this free weekend to look at a number of houses in the city and in the surrounding countryside. He walked up the path and let himself in through the front door. Hi, matey, he called out as a warning that he was here, not wanting to disturb Glenn if he had some bird back here, which he was always secretly hoping Glenn would have to get him over his marriage from hell. But there was no reply. He knew that on his weekends off, Glenn liked to sleep in and then go to the gym or cycling, which he had recently taken up in the afternoon. He stooped and picked a bunch of mail off the mat, sifting through it as he walked through into the kitchen, which Sandy had once made so modern and high-tech, but which now looks sadly dated. Hi, Marlon. How are you doing? He said, peering into the bowl, pleased to see there was still plenty of food in the hopper. The fish, as surly as his namesake, ignored him as usual, slowly gliding to the surface and gulping down yet another tiny globule of his food. Not in a chatty mood today. That makes a change, right? Marlon did a single circuit of his bowl, and for a moment their eyes met. Then the fish rose to the surface and gulped another globule. It's okay, old chap. You're not hurting my feelings. I have got a much sexier admirer than you. Would you be jealous if I told you who? The fish did not look remotely jealous. Grace turned away and dumped the small pile of lettuce, takeaway pizza and Chinese menus, and a blue and white flyer from the local Conservative MP, Mike Weatherly. Then he sifted quickly through the letters. One was a brown envelope that contained a council tax demand, and one was from the estate agent's Mission Mackay, whose board was outside the house. He opened it, and there was a written report on the recent viewings. Just as he started reading it, his phone rang. Roy Grace, he answered. Oh, uh, Mr. Grace, it's Darren Wilmore from Mission Mackay. Oh, hi, he said. I'm just reading your letter this minute. Right, well, I've got a bit of a development I thought you might like to hear about. Far away? We had a viewing recently, a mother and a son. We did think she seemed quite interested at the time. They're living overseas at the moment, but want to move to Brighton. I believe she has some past connection here. OK, sounds interesting. Well, it's looking encouraging. She wants to have a second viewing. That's brilliant news, Grace thought, wondering how he was going to break it to Glenn. I thought you'd be pleased. Oh, I am, Roy Grace said. The timing couldn't be better. Chapter 122 Roy Grace was pretty happy with how the Carl Vedder trial was going. The ghastly, fat, snuff movie king and paedophile, with a penchant for brightling watches, had done himself no favours. And for the first time in a very long while, to his great relief, Grace had spent an entire week as the duty senior investigating officer without a single major crime incident happening in the city of Brighton and Hove, which meant he was available day and night to take Cleo to hospital the moment labour began. The King's Lover was in its final week of location, shooting in and around Brighton, before moving up to Pinewood Studios, and miraculously was only four days behind schedule. The text from Gaia, to Grace's relief, but at the same time slight disappointment, had stopped although he'd paid a couple of visits to the set and been greeted by Guy on each occasion as somewhat more than her new best friend. Eric Whiteley was still on life support in the ICU, tying up valuable resources in what Grace considered a pointless but requisite around-the-clock police guard. It was a Monday afternoon in late June, as he was about to leave for home, when his phone rang. He heard an American accent. Detective Grace? This is Detective Myman from the Los Angeles Police Threat Management Unit. We have kind of a number of loose ends to tie up relating to Gaia Lafayette, and in particular, the deceased Drayton Wheeler. Well, you're telling me I'm working on it right now. 
It would speed up the process if it were possible for one of your team to come over here. Wouldn't need them for more than a couple of days. The issue we have right now is our budgets, Grace said. That's not a problem. The LAPD would be happy to pick up the tab for the airfare and would take care of whoever came over. Can you suggest you might be the best person on your team? Yourself, perhaps? Grace thought hard. Because of the consultant obstetrician's concerns, Cleo was booked into the maternity ward of the Royal Sussex County Hospital the following Monday to have the baby by caesarean section. With the risk that she might need to go in earlier, there was no way he could go. But a break might do Glenn some good, what with him seeming particularly miserable at the moment. He told Myman he'd get back to him later in the day. As he hung up, his phone pinged with a text. "'Hey, Mr. Paul Newman Eyes, I have some free time on Thursday evening. Leaving town at the weekend. Can I invite you to my suite for a goodbye drink? Kiss, 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 kiss.' Thursday was his boy's poker night, a tradition that had been going on for years, and except when work intervened he tried never to miss a game. Perhaps he could fit in a very quick drink with her before joining the boys. He'd do that and then go on to the game. Chapter 123 On the Friday night, despite being exhausted from all that had happened in recent weeks, combined with the Carl Venner trial, Roy Grace barely slept at all. Whenever he was not wide awake, tossing around, shaking lumps out of his pillows, Cleo was, with Bump going totally berserk inside her. Somehow, miraculously, around 7 a.m., he fell into a deep sleep and did not wake until 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. Despite still feeling groggy, he pulled on his shorts, T-shirt and trainers and went for his favourite run down on the seafront by the Palace Pier then along to the Deep Sea Anglers Club by Shoreham Harbour and back, a circuit just short of five miles. When he got back, he slipped out of his clothes and went gratefully into the bathroom. One of the many things he loved about Cleo was her taste in showers. A rain showerhead, a face on jet and sideways jets, if he wanted them on as well. He was luxuriating them when suddenly the bathroom door opened so violently he thought it was coming off its hinges. Cleo stood there in a baggy shirt-waster, clutching a copy of the Argus, with a face like thunder. He switched the taps off and stepped out, water running down his body. So! Poker on Thursday was good, was it? She was brandishing the paper like a weapon. Uh, I sort of broke even, I told you. Sounds like you edited one bit out, Roy. Oh? Oh? Oh, yes, actually. Take a look at this. Perhaps it will help jog your memory. His heart sank as he saw the front page splash. Top cop and Gaia. Is it love? Beneath was a photograph of Roy Grace and Gaia, clearly taken with a long lens, standing side by side, looking out of the window of her grand hotel suite. Hey, I, I can explain. Can you? She said. Never in all their time together had he seen her so angry. She stormed out. He grabbed a towel and was just starting to dry himself when she marched back in with an open copy of the Saturday Mirror. The headline ran across the top of the page. Guyer and Brighton Cops Secret Love Tryst. Beneath was a similar long-lens photograph to the one in the Argus. But in this one, Guy was giving Roy Grace a kiss on the cheek. He read the first paragraph of the story. Rock legend Gaia, in Brighton to shoot her latest movie, The King's Lover, has been repaying the city's top homicide cop, Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, for successfully foiling an attempt on her life by secret love trysts with him in her hotel suite. The couple are pictured above, about to enjoy a romantic candlelit dinner. This is unbelievable. You're right, she said. It is. I just can't believe you'd do this, Roy. Darling, listen, this is bullshit, complete and out of bullshit. I can explain. Great. I'm all ears. Explain. Then, suddenly, she gripped her abdomen and screamed out in pain, all the colour draining from her face. Roy! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Chapter 124 The obituary in the Argus read, Grace, Noah Jack, on July the 2nd, died tragically shortly after birth. 
Much-loved son of Roy and Cleo. Private funeral for family only. Chapter 125 Roy Grace had tears in his eyes as he watched Cleo cradling their son in her bed in the maternity ward of the Royal Sussex County Hospital. The baby's pink face was all scrunched up. His eyes were closed. His lips formed a tiny rosebud. Thin tufts of wavy fair hair lay across his head. He was dressed in a pale blue v-neck cotton top, embroidered with a mouse wearing striped shorts. It was incredible, he thought, unable to take his eyes off him. His son. Their child. He breathed in the sweet smells of freshly washed skin and baby powder. Looked at Cleo, tresses of her hair lying across the shoulders of her nightdress, her face filled with so much love and care. Then his phone rang. As he answered it, he stepped away from the bed and went out into the corridor. It was Glenn Branson. I'm so sorry, maid. We're all gutted. Gutted? What's happened? Well, you know, I, I thought the baby was doing fine. Then we saw it in the Argus this morning. I, I don't know what to say. How's Cleo? Uh, hang, on, hang on a sec. Saw what in the Argus? There was a moment of awkward silence. Well, the old bit, right? Obituary? Yes. Who's died? There was another silence. Your baby, right? Noah Jack Grace. What? Are you serious? I've got on my desk right in front of me. Everyone's in tears, yeah? Glenn, there's been a mistake. We had a horrendous couple of days. Noah was born with breathing difficulties. Wet lung syndrome, they called it. They weren't sure if he was going to make it. Yeah, yeah, you told me, but, you know, you said he was getting stronger. He was all intubated and worn up in an incubator at first. Neither of us was allowed to touch him, but he's fine now. Cleo's holding him. Hopefully we can take him home soon. So who the hell screwed up with the obituary? Glenn asked. I can't believe this. You're sure? I've got it in front of me in black and white. Shit! I'm going straight down to the shop to get one. I don't think anyone's screwed up. Obituaries don't get put in by mistake, Grace said grimly. Inside he was shaking. Chapter 126 Freedom for Amos Smallbone, among other things, meant being able to enjoy some of life's simple pleasures. One of them had always been sitting at a table under the arches on the seafront, right by the beach, staring out at the sea and the palace pier and the passing tossy. By night this area was rich pickings for the network of drug dealers he once controlled, but on a fine summer morning it was mostly tourists promenading along, enjoying the views, the beach, the bars, cafes, shops, and other seaside attractions. And there were few things he enjoyed more than his first coffee of the day with the Argus newspaper, especially when an endless procession of skimpily dressed girls were strutting past at eye level. With his cigarette in his mouth, smoke curling up between his eyes, he flicked through the pages, aware he still had years to catch up on in this town. He saw an interview with the chief constable talking about cuts he was having to make and read the piece with little sympathy. There was talk of a new hospital. A bunch of drug dealers and Crawley, a couple of whom he knew, had been arrested in a raid the police had been working on for ten months. His eyes widened a little and he read this story carefully. Could be a business opportunity had opened up there. Then he reached one of the pages that always interested him the most. Your announcements. He went straight to the deaths and scanned down the column. He never, ever missed this column, because he liked to know who he'd outlived and who he didn't have to worry about any more. But today there was a very special entry. She liked Gabwick Airport. It was much more convenient for Brighton and Heathrow, and EasyJet had direct flights to Munich. Holding hands with her ten-year-old son, after security she walked into the duty-free shopping area, Immediately the boy dragged her into Dixon's, where she brought him an upgrade for his latest computer gaming machine, which made him happy. The one good thing that had happened in the past decade was her careful investing of her windfall inheritance from her aunt, enabling her to escape from her relationship with the increasingly insane control freak Hans Jürgen. She was now a wealthy woman. Well, wealth was all relative, 
but she had enough to buy the house, if she decided, and to buy things for her son, without having to consider the cost. Emerging from Dixon's, she made straight for the W. H. Smith News and Bookstore. Just want to get some papers, in case they don't have them on the plane. Then in German she asked her son if he'd like something to read on the flight to Munich. Möchte etwas zum Lesen? He shrugged indifferently, engrossed in the instructions on the game upgrade. Straight away she grabbed a copy of the Argus from the rack and flicked it open, scanning the pages eagerly. Chapter 127 On the Wednesday morning, Roy Grace drove Cleo and Noah home. Cleo sat in the back of his unmarked Ford Focus, while Noah strapped in the baby seat he had fitted temporarily into the vehicle. There were few moments when he could remember feeling the sense of the richness of human life that he was experiencing at this moment. He had a lump in his throat, tears welling in his eyes as he drove around past the pavilion. With all the film trucks gone, it seemed strangely quiet. Cleo's tantrum over Gaia seemed long ago now, and she had totally accepted that nothing had happened beyond his having had a drink with the icon. He looked in the rearview mirror and saw her smiling at him. She blew him a kiss. He mouthed one back. The obituary in the Argus remained a mystery for the moment. Apparently it had been delivered by a taxi driver who had not yet been traced. The instructions inside an envelope printed on a local funeral director's headed paper which turned out to have been forged. Of course, he had his prime suspect, although it beggared belief that if it was him, Smallbone could be so stupid, or perhaps so brazen. Noah made a gurgling sound, as if he too was excited at going home for the first time in his life. The sound made Grace think of the enormity of the task that lay ahead of them, bringing up their child and protecting him in a world that was as dark and dangerous as it always had been, and probably always would be. He remembered something he had been told long ago by the then chief constable who had invited him in for a talk during those first terrible weeks after Sandy had gone missing. The chief had been a surprisingly spiritual man. He said something Roy had never forgotten, and the words he often returned to strengthened him at tough moments. The light can only shine in darkness. This was an audio production of Not Dead Yet by Peter James, read by William Gaminara. Published by Macmillan Digital Audio.